started. Welcome everyone to Vancouver. And today I'm gonna be hosting the workshop on new frontiers in visual language reasoning, compositionality, prompts, and causality. Uh, my name is Vicente, you can call me Vicente. Um, I'm a professor at Rice University. And the co-organizers for this workshop, um, unfortunately most of them couldn't be here on time because of visa issues. Uh, a lot of the work uh, that went into putting together a schedule and submitting a proposal for this workshop actually goes to Zilian Chen, who's a professor at Jinan University in China. Um, Co-organizers of this workshop also include Wang Rung Wang, who's a postdoc at University of Oxford, and then Hao Wan, who's a professor at Rutgers University, Alan Yuil, who's a professor at Johns Hopkins, Tian Lu Wan, who's a research scientist at Meta AI, um, Xiaodan Lian, who's a professor at Sun Yat-sen University, Lian Lin, who's a professor at um, also Sun Yat-sen University. And uh, we're very excited about you um, joining us today. Um, so vision and language, vision and language reasoning, and why uh, do we need these two? And what has been the role of prompting in the past couple of years? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that before giving the head start to our first speaker. Um, so vision and language is a problem that I'm pretty familiar with. I've been working for a couple of years and, um, you know, like the world you can, can be described with, um, you know, taking pictures of the world, or you also can describe it with words. Right. And so uncovering the connections between doing these two has been a quest for many years already. And we have made a lot of advances. Um, Whereas in the past, we typically had a machine learning model where given an image, it would predict the type of object. Um, it required collecting a training set um, by labeling a, labeling a lot of examples, right? So if you wanted to detect different types of apples, so you would go on, collect images of apples, annotate them with very specialized labels and then train your machine learning algorithm. It was a very laborious task to build these data sets, uh, but we made a lot of progress uh, 10 year, more than 10 years ago. ImageNet you know, was this project of like encyclopedic project of creating this huge database of everything that can be named. You know, we managed to collect 20,000 objects and that has a lot, of brought up, a lot of success in deep learning, training supervised machine learning models on these type of data sets. And uh, yeah, so, you know, like in a task, which is like the ImageNet large scale visual recognition task, where the goal is to label an image with, with one out of a thousand categories, right? We're able to obtain an impressive 57% accuracy, right? Like, so out of a thousand labels, what are the odds that you pick the correct one is 0.1%, but the machine learning models in 2012 managed to achieve 50, 57%, the deep learning models, right? And that has been improving over the past couple of years. So in 2022, just last year, there was also a convolutional neural network just like AlexNet in 2012, 10 years ago, that um, manages to go from 57 to 88%, right? If I'm pausing a little bit, it's because I'm admitting people into the Zoom session. <laughs> So excuse me for that. Um, yeah, so we have a couple of people who are attending online. Um, and uh, so you can see the progress has been steady. I mean, but it has, you can say it has slowed down. Maybe the look, if you look at this uh, plot right here, you know, from 2012 to 2016, that's a period of about, you know, four years. And you can see that we went from 57 to 78. And then from 2016 to 2022, Another period, more or less four years, and we go from 78 to 88. So, you know, there's a little bit of a slowdown, but still some progress being made. Um, and that's exciting. This is the deep learning revolution. This is not vision, language, and prompts yet. So vision, language, and prompts, I claim this is like the other revolution that has been happening on top of like the original deep learning revolution, right? So we have a lot of images and text on the internet. 
or in other sources? And how do we leverage them? They're not a structure. They were not uh, written with the purpose of training a machine learning model like ImageNet data type of data sets. How, we, how do we make use of them, right? So image text parallel data, we have been collecting for a while. So in 2010, there was this team at the University of Illinois where they collected a thousand images where they asked people to write sentences for the images, right? So you can do that when you have a thousand images. Um, in 2011, you know, when I was a student also, I collected a data set just from the internet, a million images, right? And that was huge at the time. Uh, if you try to collect them by asking people to write sentences about your images, I mean, you are limited. So there are other, I mean, like the team at the University of Illinois kept collecting larger and larger data sets up to 20,000 images. And eventually Microsoft um, released the Cocoa data set in 2014, 2015, around that time, which has like 80,000 images. So these are still manually annotated, very high quality. And that was the standard at the time. It led to a lot of work on image captioning, like neural image captioning was booming around 2015, right? And these data sets of image text parallel data kept growing. So Google released a 3 million image text data set around 2018. And so these are images also collected from the web. These are not images that somebody was asked to write captions for, but these are like captions that were found in the wild on the internet. And then they quickly release another 12 million data sets, similar. And right now we have even bigger data sets, right? So Lion 400 million or the web data set that we use to train the clip model, right? Those are like four in the order of 400 million images. And these are data sets that are being used to train image text uh, models that can associate the right caption to the right image or, you know, text to image models that can, given an in a sentence, produce an image using diffusion models or other types of models, right? So it's there's been a lot of progress in image text parallel data and the data sets keep growing. We're talking now about perhaps even billions of training samples of images paired with text. Um, so now the way to solve the image net these days, the way people are trying to solve image net is not by just training a neural network on the image net data set anymore, but maybe using some of these data sets with information from the internet and trying to write prompts for it. So how far have we got in that domain? So this is where I'm trying to show you here. So now if you train your model, vision language model like that to given a picture and a caption, learn to match them, right? If the caption describes the image, produce yes. If the caption doesn't describe the image, then produce no. If you train it in this way, then we can produce a classifier for free through prompting. So this is what prompting means, right? So a picture of a Shiba Inu dog. And if the, if the model says yes, then you classify it correctly as that category, otherwise not. And you can replace that part in brackets with anything you want. So that's your prompt, right? And this is how you can turn this image text model into a classifier. But people are also coming up with prompts to turn these models into other tasks. Right, like how do I turn it to? You can answer questions about my image or other types of prompts, right? So here is how taking one of these models does on the same benchmark, the ImageNet data set. So you can see here, uh, the clip model in 2021 managed to get 76%. So that was pretty impressive because it was almost matching the accuracy of the best deep learning model trained on the ImageNet data set, which was ResNet, more or less 78%, top one accuracy, and Clip was getting 76%. Yeah, the training data is not the same. You know, we're using a gigantic data set now, but the advantage of something like Clip is that it can do beyond just the classes on the ImageNet data set, right? Whereas the models in blue, these can only solve the categories, the 1,000 categories of the ImageNet data, right? So that's why prompting has been a good thing. And uh, Microsoft has this proprietary model called Florence, which claimed 83% in their paper. And Google had internally another model that 80, 86%, you know? So a lot of, so these, these are good stuff. We're not, we don't need to collect the data set if we have access to one of these models. 
maybe, um, yeah, some of the data set collection we can bypass or we can just reuse these models. But now the problem becomes, how do we reuse them in creative ways? How do we take advantage of them so that we make good use of them, right? So this is why going back to the original idea of worship is like, how do we take these visual, visual language models and go to the next step into reasoning? How do we prove that they are compositional, that they cannot just recognize single concepts in images, but maybe pairs of concepts or concepts that are come in like interacting with each other? How robust are they to distribution shifts? And so this has also to do with like causality, right? Like if I change something in my image, how does that change the prediction of my model? Are the models act doing ca causal reasoning or is there, is there something I need to do on top of these models for them to make them causal? And prompt, I mean, like what, are, what is the best way of prompting these models? There's a lot of work on like training prompts, designing better prompts, having maybe other models design the prompts for you automatically. So these are some of the topics we're gonna be covering in this workshop. So without further discussion, I'm gonna pass this to our first speaker, Han Wan Zhang, who's a professor at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. And he's gonna introduce his talk. Thank you. Yeah. Right, it's not too late. That's the uh, first slide, all right. So uh, uh, we have the color graph like X is the input image, Y is the label. Z is the confounder that is a common cause of X and Y. So normal classifiers like the uh, posterior likelihood, PY given X will be inevitably learning the PZ given X distribution which is the bias that has nothing to do with our interest and second we modify the above Bayesian extension into a virtual interventional world just like the observation of x is fully controlled by us the experimentator right and this is the cutoff of uh, from z to x uh, and how to do that without the physical actual intervention? So a very uh, genius idea is to just to put the PZ instead of the PZ given X. So we only focus on the prior of PZ to let PZ is independent of uh, X. And given this, no, there should be no causal relationship between Z and X due to that if you want to pursue the causality from X, Y, and Z, and Y will be the collider. So what is a collider? It's another story detailing the pros uh, these separation works, right? So uh, due to the time limit, I will omit some of the counterfactual 
reasoning works, which can remove the mediation uh, bias perfectly. But uh, uh, if you are interested in that kind of counterfactual bias, then you can find a lot of our uh, work on mediation analysis in our website. So, and the subject of my talk is to introduce how to apply the causality in computer vision. So let's recap with one of our earliest work in 2020, visual common sense. You can roughly understand that the common sense uh, region feature is that the visual region should accurately correspond to its semantic word. For example, even if the VQA system accurately answers yes, but we know that only human being can be excited, right? It's not a hot dog. And if this person good at skiing, we know that we ski with the legs, but not the in, in our body. So uh, why do we have such hallucination or spurious correlation? That's this, the confounder. When you use the keyboard to predict the mouse, you overlook that the prediction is implicitly affected by the surrounding objects in order to learn that the keyboard can truly cause the existence of the mouse, we need to remove the confounders. So some after this deconfounding, some of the high posterior probability may be decreased and some one will increase. Let's see some examples on the toy experiment on the MS Coco. Uh, here, uh, I like to highlight two examples. The first one is the hair dryer and the sink, right? So before intervention, we can see that the, there is a very high probability that seeing hair dryer is very likely to see the sink. That's maybe in MS Coco, a lot of the hotel bathrooms are captured. So in the hotel rooms, due to the space limit, the hair dryer is, is hanging on the wall up in the bathroom, which is next to the sink. Right, so, but if this causal effect from the dryer to the sink is that strong? No, right, by our common sense, it should be lower. So we need to introduce the causal intervention. And another example is the toilet. When you see the toilet, what is the probability of you seeing a person? And we know that toilet is used by people, right? So the probability should be higher, right? So, and actually after the causal, intervention, it's increased by three times, two times. Right? Let's see the detail breakdown. As you can see that due to privacy in MS Coco, we have very few associations of co-occurrence of people and toilet, right? And the likelihood is quite low, but after causal intervention by introducing globally other objects were aka confounders into this uh, probability calculation and you sum them up, then we can have a much higher probability. So that is the power of causal intervention, right? And here is a lineup, our group's lineup for audience who's interested in other applications, for example, visual dialogue, image captioning, action recognition, and many future learning stuff, we have a lot for you to browse, right? So, but in the big foundation model era, like today, the, those works may not work effectively as before because the large data set itself is a kind of intervention. For example, the reason why uh, there is a, a spurious correlation between hair dryer and sink is virus because MS Coco is virus. Right? So if we enlarge this image set, we see hair dryer in everywhere, even on the moon, then it is considered as deconfounded. So, and that's exactly what foundation model is trying to do. So as an organizer of the past causality and vision workshop uh, since 2021, I think we need to pause for a while to rethink what more benefits causality can bring in computer vision. and. Uh, this talk is just our uh, first probe. Okay, so we start by investigating the missing part of this causal theory. Uh, in particular, why the triangle-like causal graphs 
appears in many uh, works, right? You can see a lot of triangles here and why this is correct. And in many previous works, the triangle shape is usually justified by intuition and domain specific knowledge. So do we have a formal proof in vision community? Can we end this everlasting debate that there's no uh, Z to Y link where it's anti-causal from Y to X or causal X to Y? So to answer these questions, we need to bring some new concepts. Right? Uh, yes, we use group theory to define the most fundamental part in computer vision. Well, uh, the visual features. So we start by redefining what is visual feature in a new perspective by using group theory, group transformations. Don't worry, I will only uh, use some simple and layman's terms to uh, for this kind of new mathematical concept. It's not new in math, but it's new in vision community. Uh, to generate the visual world, there should be some like some hidden genes over there, right? That's a group. Uh, each GI can be understood as an action verb, uh, which is acting on some of the semantic attributes here. For example, the GI is turning something into red and U is the color. So when G acting on the U, it means turning the color from some other colors into red. And right? then we use this acted semantics here to generate a image, pixel level image. This is very similar to any visual generative models from latent features to pixels. Then this is the visual features is to use the Pi to a uh, Phi to extract the visual features X from the pixel level images. And uh, to note that the X should be decomposed. So each XI should correspond to its corresponding semantics. And another property of disentanglement, uh, apart from decomposable, is equivalent. It means uh, if there is the source action turning green acting on the color semantic, the feature should be faithfully encodes the green. In one word, the feature change should abide by the image change. When semantic changes, image changes, followed by the feature changes. Okay. So as we can see that the learning of feature is all about encoding the group, the hidden group actions into the visual features. If we can collect enough images that can form uh, from many group actions, for example, for this particular rotation, actions, we can learn good features if as long as the set is very large, right? So by using group theory, we can have a formal definition of all the changing samples caused by intervention called the group orbit. Given a set of group G, all the samples affected were transformed by the G as this collection is called the orbit of G. So yet only orbit is not enough to describe the entire data set. To represent the entire training set, we need another group action to travel, traverse across the different orbits. Some of you may realize that uh, orbits are differed by something like the class, right? So, and within each orbit, all the orbits share the same group actions. For example, all the faces given the same ID, they share the front view, from side view, from uh, left to right. And uh, if we apply this another ID change group, then we can change from person one to person two. We can change from the basketball to football. Interesting in abstract algebra in math, we already have a classification definition by using the group language. Given a subgroup D, which is a subset, actually it's uh, not exactly defined as a subset in the 
set theory, but you can understand it's a subset of the entire G. A nice property of this subgroup is that it naturally partition the entire G into K disjoint subsets. And they all share the same subgroup, okay? And the only difference between the subset is another group element called the quotient group or the factor group or just G over D, which has K group elements. And you can, if you have ever played the heart of the stone, then the C can be understood as a turn something to a shape or just a, a polymorph magic. Okay, so thanks to the group theory, we have the new perspective of the supervised learning data. The reason why we can label a data set into different classes is due to the law of orbit partitioning. Orbit and classes are essentially the same thing. So if you define what is the shared attributes for the subgroup, and at the same time, you have already defined the classes. So the shared attributes of the subgroup and which are the common cause of X and the class Y, right? So here is the sketch of the proof of why the causal graph is like this triangle. Uh, first, we have the G, right? And the G has its, when you define a subgroup, uh, D, and you, at the same time, you have the quotient group, aka the class uh, G over D. And then, uh, for example, there is a class O, the template of a dog there, and then you can generate a sample by specifying the attributes, right? It's golden fur. So we can generate a sample golden retriever. And then uh, because for each group element, you should have an inverse counterpart, right? So you can inverse this attributes and then the classification can be understood at the orbit search, right? So if this thing without this attributes is a dog. Okay, more specifically, the Z to X is a observed effect of this data set. And then X to Y and Z to Y are uh, the, uh, class feature extraction and the context removal. So here for context removal, we need marginalization by integral out of this context. After the context removal, we can extract the class features and we use a classifier to do the class orbit searching or matching. And thanks to this better explanation of this confounder, confounder Z here, now we have a explicit and very clear definition of who are the confounders, right? So we can do more powerful things. The first thing is to improve debiasing. <coughs> Most debiasing methods is based on the reweighted ERM. In particular, it is essentially the two operations weights right here, right? So, however, we don't have a label of the confounder C. So it's very hard to evaluate PZ and PXD. So how to achieve that? So most existing methods based on reweighting are trying to use the complement of this principle one, which is quite trivial, but it is true. So a dog is always a dog, no matter where it is, where it, uh, how it looks, right? So the complement of principle one is if a feature is not invariant to the context, then it must uh, not be a class, but a context, right? So how to uh, measure the not environment, right? Not, not invariant. We measure it by mistakes, wrong predictions, right? So more wrong predictions means the classifier captures the context. For example, for digit one and zero binary classification, if most are training digit one, are in red and most digit zero are in green, then the digit one classifier is easily biased to the red color. Our training digit one in green is easily predicted as zero, which is wrong. So when PY given X is 
very high, but it's wrong, then it is more likely a very rare context. So, which means that if the PZ is a fixed prior, then the PX state should be very small, then the weight should be very large, right? So in mains, we should pay more attention to rare samples, okay? So the learning from failure is very famous uh, SOTA methods in this traditional debiasing method, but it has some pro problems. For example, uh, if you visualize what kind of the context it captures, you may find that it's not actually context. It's actually the foreground because the PY given Z is inevitably entangling the class and context, right? So it's not a very accurate estimations. So we will propose a method to capture or estimate the context more accurately. So by using the just introduced group theory, uh, the uh, class and context partition, right? So we have a principle too, which is also very trivial, but it seems that it's been overlooked by our community. So the context is also invariant to class. So within each orbit, for example, white color is still white, no matter it's a white cat or it's a white car, right? Okay, so the key motivation in that, uh, we consider each orbit or class as environment. And we use invariant risk minimization method to uh, extract the context. So the first term is just a very routine self-supervised learning contrastive loss to learn the features. And the second one is we force them, it's an invariant loss. We force them to share the same feature extraction parameters and the shared parameters should be optimized all at once in any class. Okay, so please think about this example. We are from different culture, different countries, right? So if there's a movie that can touch everyone in this room, so this movie must have some common values, right? And these common values are the invariant so-called context to everyone, right? So this is an intuition of IRM, so no, worry, we will revisit IRM later in other works, okay? So here is a visualization on the buyer's colored amnest to show how well we captured context features. As you can see that the uh, TSNE visualizations of this context features is not clustered by uh, digits, by class, right? Because every cluster has different colors, which means different Digits. So the cluster is clustered by the context of this color amnest digits. So the major context is the color. Right? So we have one, two, three, four, like 10 colors. Within each color, we have some fine grain, narrowness, thickness, and some whiteness, fine grain attributes. Okay. In fact, there's another limitation of reweighting in the causal intervention. Uh, it's called the non-positivity. This is very useful in future learning because when the training samples varies few, then the PX given D could be zero because they're like all swans is white, right? So there's no black V right here. So how to smartly recognize that the dominating white is not a class discriminative feature, but a just a normal context, right? So that's our goal. So due to the time limit, I will skip this and uh, interested ones can read this paper here. <clears throat> All right. So far, the visual recognition we have discussed is supervised, right? So what about their shot and few shot? The key is, at test time to quickly specify what are Z and what are the, the, the classes, who are the uh, contacts and who are the classes. So in order to specify them, you need to first disentangle every features in the house, that is uh, G. And then at test time, you have to quickly specify who are the, the subgroup, 
and who are the quotient groups, right? So we have the two steps, uh, which is a common cliche. The step one is actually um, pre-training, right? And the second one is fine tuning, but I want to highlight that there's two steps. The purpose of pre-training and fine tuning is to disentangle and then the purpose of fine tuning is to define who are the contacts, what are the classes. All right. So in our previous paper, we have right here, we have a, a very rigorous theoretical proof that invariant risk minimization can disentangle features. Actually, we have seen this before in the context disentanglement, right? So let's revisit this here. Suppose you want to disentangle the digit from the context color. And if someone has magically oracle labeled the digits into two color group, the only way to achieve the feature invariance across the color orbits is to decompose the feature into digit dimensions and the color dimension. Then you can find a mask, a linear projector to project uh, to mask off the color features that are not useful towards telling this samples apart, right? So if it is entangled, then there's were not decomposed, then the invariance across the orbits cannot be achieved. That is the principle. And the we have proposed an iterative algorithm to unsupervisedly disentangle all the features. So first, Given any two partition of the data sets, of course, initially it's random partition. So that is, we have two orbits and each partition correspond to a group element. And you can disentangle it by invariance to risk minimization. And then you continue to discover if there's a new partition that can undermine your existing disentanglement metric, AKA the above invariance loss. So if you can maximize it, then congratulations, a new partition has been found. So you can run this iteratively and it will discover more and more uh, group elements. All right, so here I'm not going to show the SOTA here because it's been two years ago and nothing in SOTA as compared to clip like models, right? So, but I like to say that the IID in distribution classification, like uh, when you test something on the image net is not a good test bed for disentanglement because to achieve, we have shown that uh, in the paper that to achieve high classification performance, IID performance, you don't need to disentangle the features, right? So the only way to evaluate disentanglement is OOD task. The rationale is if you want to achieve OOD, you have to learn invariance. If the feature is not disentangled, then you cannot seek the invariance, right? I just mentioned clip, right? So let's go to step two. Uh, so let's talk about the vision language foundation models. How do we continue our how do we survive our causality journey in this era? Today's visual language models have already disentangled features. Well, because it has a lot of human level interventions, right? We have hundreds of millions of annotations. It, but is this disentangled enough? Uh, not really. I will show uh, something later. But we have to confess that the trend is inevitable. We have to embrace the clip like base models, right? So indeed, they offer us a very intuitive way for visual recognition without training a classifier. Thanks to its large vocabulary, uh, the recognition can simulate the training target. So all we need is to calculate the similarity between image and text. In this case, the sentence, this is a, uh, with doc should be most similar to this image. And how does this relate to the causal graph? Here it is. Uh, as we assume that the clip is disentangled, so all the features in the image, uh, uh, they should encode all the G. 
the class is once the class is given, the G over H is given, then at the same time, simultaneously, the context H is given as well. So the H is the prompt, right? So when there are several training images, we can infer that maximize the similarity by tuning the three embeddings here. And I think my colleague Zui in this afternoon will share his works about prompt tuning. Right? And, but unfortunately uh, overfitting. Right? So um, as you can see that this baseline, the zero shot, right? The predefined prompt. So more training data and uh, more training epochs and more training data may lead to even worse performances as compared to this simple, this is a, uh, right? So why? So uh, as we have mentioned, we assume that the clip is tangled everything. Therefore G is given. And when the class is predefined, like the class vocabulary is given, so, the G over H is fixed. So H should be derived, right? So the goal of prompt tuning is trying to represent the H in a optimized text embeddings, W1 star to W3 star. As you can see that a good H should um, help the similarity matching focusing on the class discriminative regions. And this is a, is a very general term. So it may only contain general background, right? So cells can only guide the similarity localizing on the very general foreground. But as we know, the perfect age should be much more specified. For example, as this is a fine grain car make classification, right? So the background context should have some common car parts. So the goal of opportunity is trying to widen the H not to uh, sh shrink the H. But unfortunately um, due to insufficient training data, the confounding bias we have discussed, the H may be even smaller. For example, it may misconsider the class as a background. That is the H is shrink, right? So here are some illustrations for some low end cards like the, so now tell it is usually for car rentals, right? So the rental logo is wrongly associated, but for some fun cars like the Audi convertible, it is usually as capturing some fancy sight scenes, right? Like this woods right here. Okay, so how to make sure that the prompt tuning is only increasing, but not shrinking, right? So the fine-tuned prompt should be a combination, a sum of zero-shot zero original subgroup plus some new discovered elements. So we propose to not uh, to only update the prompt gradient aligned to this original. This is uh, so this is the opposite direction, which will shrink the size. But this new orthogonal ones means some new dimensions, because if it's orthogonal, then it's some zero, one times one, zero, right? So it's a new dimension. So by this way, we can guarantee that the H is expanding. Right? So we can prevent bias. Okay, the last piece, right? So it's in the previous assumption, we assume that clip is decomposed, disentangled, but empirically, uh, in Empirically, it is, and thanks to the millions of image text supervisions. However, we find that it is not equivalent, equivalent enough. So uh, uh, image feature may not feasibly represent the uh, image. So let's diagnose with the Soter clip here, the fiber. Given the query, equivalent similarity should be decreasing when the house in the image is moving slightly from the right to the left. However, in the fiber, it is insensitive to this right and left uh, difference. So the ranking here is a mess. So why? Because the cleave is essentially contrastive learning based, right? So it only maps similar image text pairs, similar and different 
image text pairs dissimilar, but how dissimilar, right? So it's not being told, right? So there should be some gradual change of this similarity. So let's redraw this equiver equivalent map into this image text context, right? So uh, equivalent means the text change here should be faithfully corresponding to the image change. So the top edge should equal to the bottom edge subject to a constant scatter. And how do we measure the edge difference? We use the similarity difference right here. So the S12 minus S11 should equal to S22 minus S21. And due to the constant scatter, so these two uh, minors should be equal subject to a constant. And we consider this as a new regularization terms and it improves the clip. And another thing that the new paper published in last year called the cycle clip, it's just a special case uh, in equivalence finding, right? And here is our benchmark to better evaluate equivalence, which is overlooked in our community. We present a benchmark. It's constructed by some video natural change and some synthetic changes. So please try it out here. Okay. And in a similar vein, previous contrastive based supervised self supervised contrastive based learning cannot guarantee equivalence, right? So therefore we use the generative diffusion objective to guarantee the equivalence. I will skip this detail just to show you that, uh, please look at this interpolation of the some uh, certain parts of this features at a very, uh, when the T time steps is very small. So it will capture some low level details like the skin texture, color, temperature right here. And if you move to some other sub parts of the feature, dimensions, we can capture some fine grain attributes like the hair style, glasses, matrix patterns. And if you move on coarse grained, if you move on very large change, right? Like the posture, clothes, room layouts, etc. All right, so here the summary, I hope it's in time. So uh, we have introduced a group theoretic definition of feature disentanglement, which is the most fundamental definition in computer vision, right? So, and we can derive this, uh, we can derive the triangle causality here by using this disentanglement. And then the triangle causality can help us to achieve invariance. And invariance is the only thing to achieve all the generalizations. And self-supervised disentanglement plus the test time definition of context and class, we can achieve zero shot few shot right? And I like to share some future work. The first, we need to embrace the big gift like the clip and modify it to make it more equivalent. And then uh, most importantly, to my best knowledge, existing vision language uh, models like the bleep too, or palm E, or maybe GPT-4 uh, are still based on the image text pairs trainings, right? So that is the visual learning still cannot benefit from the chain of thought ability from the large language models. So by then, if we can symbolize them by uh, each symbol means a disentangled group, right? So if we can symbolize the visual features and connect it to the LLM, then Maybe in the future, we can essentially achieve the pros causal ladders, right? So I hope I can share our progress in the next workshop next year. Thank you. We have two minutes for questions. Yes, if you have questions, you can come to the microphone or just, just stand up in a small room and ask your question. If people online have questions, also feel free to enter them 
on the chat or Rocket Chat or any of the platforms we're supporting today. So maybe let me get started with a question myself. Sure. Uh, so when you say symbolize it, what are you thinking exactly? I mean, uh, beyond uh, what you mentioned, uh, you know, what, what are, are the other sources, sources that you could, like, is, are you thinking about knowledge bases perhaps too? Uh, no, actually my current uh, blueprint is that to, uh, to use something like the VQA to quantize all the disentangled features. So we can transform every visual feature into uh, a series of symbols and that's a language the visual language and then when we connect this into the uh, multimedia html web text then we can treat this visual features as some python code or others symbols and then we can benefit the chain of thoughts capabilities from the language models so therefore, maybe so right now the stable diffusion is only able to generate some uh, text related images. But in my idea, I think the 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 key multimodal capability of big models is to uh, generate some images that can support uh, that has never been present in the text. For example, we can let the model to write a CVPR paper, right? So the in many CPR papers, the figures is a kind of a complement of the text, right? Yeah. All right. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, you mentioned that uh, you want the uh, video model to benefit your product and share thought uh not cut on this. Uh, but I want to know what's the application of this uh, method. Because in the YouTube, I, I think most of the questions you can just divide the answer uh, by looking at the image. It's mm -hmm. not like some mathematical problems, you know, in that requires the like, action of a mm -hmm. uh, So I wonder what's the application of the. I think one of the application is like, what, what is, is that? that? To, to maybe solve some physical. Yeah. Mass questions based on a given figure. Yeah, yeah that's uh, that's why I'm uh, because now when you do a uh, most of this kind of like uh, knowledge on the like reading, uh, not really for uh, what you uh, know, that's uh, channel I think uh, you can just. Under, so if we can achieve the symbolization of any visual features, you can consider the visual features are just a, a Java code, a piece of code. Then any applications now GPT-4 can support, it will be totally multimodalized. Yeah. All right, so if you have more questions, you can email me, right? Uh, yeah, is there any other question? Otherwise, yeah, we can. Do we have the next speaker? We have, we have the next speaker, or, yeah. So I think. Uh, but if there is, I, I mean, we have uh, three more minutes. Any last question? Please <coughs> do it now. Let me check online. I don't have any questions in any of the platforms. All right, we'll move on to, the, to our next speaker. Okay, All right. Great. Should I share my, hello? Should I share my screen? Uh, yeah. Uh, so our next speaker is gonna be Elias Barenboim from Columbia University. And he's here and I'm going to, hi Elias, are you, are you with us? Is it Elias or Elias? How do you pronounce it? Elias, Elias. Uh, we can, I, I cannot hear you. Could you say that again? Oh, one second, one second. You cannot hear me? No, I can hear you now. It was on my end. Oh, OK. Sounds good. All yes, right. today is Elias. Hello. Thanks. Uh, give me a second. Uh, can, yeah. the, can people hear him? Or not? Let me, let me try again. OK. Uh, 
Could you could you Hello? Again? Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, could could you say something again so I can try Hello. this? Hello. Hello. La, la, la. Uh -huh. Yes. Give me a can second. you hear me? Uh-huh. Uh, no worries. All right. Yes. Trying to achieve. All right. So now the audience can hear you, not just me. Okay. Right. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. Let me put this in full screen and I I will get started. Give me a okay. second. Mm -hmm. View. <clears throat> All right, we can see your screen now. Can you see full screen? uh it's almost full screen so let me just say it that way so but yeah you can start okay. your presentation people can see you now and they can hear, hear you very well all right welcome okay Elias. yeah thank you yeah good morning everyone first of all thank you the organizers uh, including Hal Zilang uh, Vicente uh, for this wonderful workshop it's very nice to talk in here today also, I'm not sure if he is in the audience. Hi to Alan, who may be there. Uh, hope you can grab a coffee. Um, uh, it's unfortunate I couldn't be uh, there in person today, but I'm in the middle of the forest here in Brazil. Uh, hope the internet will wor work well. I'm a professor at uh, the computer science department at Columbia. Um, I'm not uh, originally in computer vision. Uh, possibly I'll have a very different and hopefully complementary talk uh, in perspective from the folks in the room. Uh, today we'll be talking about on the cause and foundations of AI um, and making comments about uh, explainability and decision making. Um, let me start. Uh, the outline of this the talk, I'll start from the beginning. I think it's important. Uh, start defining what is a causal model or a structural called a model, then I introduced three different results that are somewhat interwined. Um, the first structural causal model, then I will introduce something called the pro-causal hierarchy or the PCH. Um, important result uh, coming from this book called The Book of Why by Yuda Pro and Dana McKenzie. Um, and also results that I'll talk here is, there's a reference there below, uh, as a chapter in order of pro called on pros hierarchy and the foundations of causal inference uh, and the link is there um, and then I will talk about another result called the causal hierarchy the theorem of the CHT this will be the first part of the talk then I will try uh, to discuss a little bit about supervised and supervised and reinforcement learning and how it fits the PCH or the pro causal hierarchy and uh, and then I'll discuss more broadly what is causal inference and, and what are cross-layer inferences um, and discuss uh, on the design of AI with these causal capabilities, um, including uh, modern methods in ML uh, for, the, for the deep learning and reinforcement learning. Um, the goal here, it's kind of um, kind of uh, food for thought and kind of shake things a little bit up, uh, introducing the ideas, principles, and tasks. I'll not be solving a problem uh, and connecting with the last mile that hopefully we are trying to do in the lab. Hopefully you can talk about that and also get your help with that. Now, <clears throat> without further ado, what is a causal model? Uh, we'll take a, we'd like to take a process-based approach for causality. Uh, and the idea is kind of borrowed from physics, chemistry, and other scientific disciplines. And what is the idea of the pro a process? A process or what is the idea of causal system is a collection of causal processes or mechanisms. Here, for example, in the left side, um, do we have random variables that is related to whether a person is taking or not taking a drug and whether they have headache. And then we also have uh, a mechanism, this f of d and f of h, h that, is a, that, that is assigning the values 
uh, or, or how people are deciding to, for example, f of, to take or not take the drug. For example, f of d is a function of the age of the person, depending if it's younger or older, and you can have different granularities. Uh, the person will be more or less likely to take the drug. Uh, in other words, age does affect the propensity of someone taking the drug. And you also have this variable u sub d, that is the u of unobserved. This is all unobserved variables in the world. Uh, uh, could be a huge number that is also affecting the decision of taking or not taking the drug. And we also have the me mechanism F sub H, that is the one that is, let's say, biology, that is a function, or it is listening to whether the person took or not, uh, didn't take the drug, uh, the age and the U sub H, that is all these variables in the world that is deciding whether the person has or, uh, or doesn't a uh, headache. Now, this is the real process on the top side here. And we also have the graphical representation for that. They are quote unquote just. Um, and, and here you can see that there is an arrow uh, from, I just put X, Y, Z here for age, drug, and headache. Then there is an arrow, for example, from age and drug or Z and X, Y, because both drug and age participate in the mechanism of headache. Uh, and and so on. Note here that this is some type of there is some type of coarsening between what's going on in the upper side and the lower side of this left side of this slide, uh, since the, this causal graph or causal diagram do not do not carry over from the guy on the top. What are the mechanisms that are making this assignment? There's an important thing about some type of relaxation. Some I'll come back to that about physics, but uh, of other settings, scientific settings that we do need the precise mechanism about how things work. Now, if you collect data from the process in this, this slide, uh, if simple enough, you're able to get the observational distribution P of Z, X, and Y. Uh, again, this is called observational because we're just observing the system unfold in time, um, very related to classification. Now, in the right side of the slide, you have something important here. That is the, 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 the left side is passive, the right side is active, as if you've done in the system and did the intervention that is one of the important features of causality, had we gone uh, in, uh, in this population and not allowed the subjects to take or not take the drug, and you just um, uh, uh, put this drug is equal to yes, to have one kind of ground in that, now everyone in the population will take the drug, then this is what we call the intervention as operator overwriting the original mechanism in the left, the F of F sub D by a constant yes. Now, they also have a graphical representation for that that is in the right, uh, in which no longer there is an arrow from Z to X, age participating here, uh, uh, age of affecting how people are taking the drug, but now is the constant yes. Usually you don't show it explicitly, but I'm showing, showing here uh, uh, for the sake of illustration. Now, the, the, if, you, if you do that and the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration does that, and if you do that with the population and sample long enough, this gives us access to the interventional distribution P of ZY given the do X is equal to yes. Then this is the intervention, the effect of the intervention do X on the other variables in the system. Z and Y in this case. Now, the, I'm talking about drug headache and A and, and so on. This is ki kind of uh, just for the sake of a little bit more concreteness, but drug could be any decision in the world. Uh, headache could be any kind of outcome. And uh, Z that is just one could be a features, could be a high dimensional million, million, million dimension uh, vector there. Um, in practice, Again, I'm putting this kind of gray here. We don't have access to the, the folks, on the, the mechanisms on the top, uh, but just in the bottom possibly. And usually also we, we do have access to the data that is coming from the left, that is coming from seeing or from passively observing the system, but we don't have access to the, the data on the right side that is as, as if you have, have done the intervention itself. Um, but for a very special case, such as the FDA in the process of the drug discovery, or in the case maybe I'll come back to that in reinforcement learning in kind of more toy-ish 
type of settings that you have a simulator and you can do whatever you want in the simulator. Now, I would like to generalize uh, the comments or the, the example that I just gave, not comments, example. And mm -hmm. uh, what is a structural causal model? That's cause, structural causal model SCM is a tuple with these four components that I already said. The set, more generally, the set V is this V1, V2, and so on, is a set of endogenous variables, such as headache, drug that we discussed before. Uh, the set U, U1, U2, and so on, are the set of the exogenous variables, exo from outside, the endo from inside. Those are the set, settings of the unobserved variables, as we discussed, the U sub D and, uh, and the U sub H before. I'm not note here a common that people is already asking how what this means and how do you get those variables. I'm not at this stage. I'm not even talking about that. I'm just trying to defi define a new, a new class of generative models. <clears throat> now you also have a collection of functions uh, f1, f2, fn are functions over v, the set v for each vi. Then you have for each vi. We have a, a mechanism f of i that is assigning the values from the, or is a mapping from the PAI and the UI to the VI, where the PAI is a subset of the endogenous variables or the observable, uh, and the UI is a, a subset of the, of the exogenous variables. And also, so far, by the way, these first three bullets here of three components of the tuple, those are nothing more than a generalization of Newtonian physics, if you wish, uh, then assuming that everything is deterministic. In reality, that's kind of uh, more complicated than that. And if you want to account for quantum as well, um, then you have a probability distribution over the exogenous uh, conditions or the exogenous variables, then you have this P of U there. Um, there's axiomatic characterization for there in this reference. For us, what is important is these results as a problem as a theorem saying that the SCM, assuming a SCM M, this implies the PCH, the pro-causal hierarchy. They are learning to speak. It. And uh, this is also called the ladder of causation uh, uh, in the book of Y that I mentioned. Uh, but uh, at least in the field, they usually call this the pro-causal hierarchy or the PCH. Let me just elaborate a little bit on that. Um, PCH is a hierarchy. They have three levels. The first level is related to the associations. Uh, or, or the P of Y given X is some kind of symbolic uh, way of writing a sentence in this layer or in this level uh, is very related to the activity of seeing or observing what would seeing the variable X is equal to the little X at level X, let's say, change my belief in the variable Y. Or what does the symptom tell us about the disease? This is very related in, our, in ML uh, to the beloved, beloved tasks that we have of supervising and unsupervised learning. Uh, we are trying to get X could be a set of features that could or, or pixels, and we are trying to guess what is the, the variable Y, or what is the label. And you usually could play our arg max, you can put a loss function on top of that, and so on, right? This is our, um, I don't know, ML101. Um, and it's quite hard, I should say. Let me give context. This is why it takes a few decades to us to operate, because this X can be really high dimension. Then how to do that at scale and efficient, somewhat efficiently is really non-trivial. Now, different formalisms appear to solve this task, task throughout the years, Bayesian networks, decision trees, SVMs, deep networks, and so on. Then and different types of algorithms used to train models of this class. Now, this is not all. You have also the, the second layer that is the interventional layer put in some kind of muscles there. Um, the sim symbolic way of writing a sentence in this language, in this layer is P of Y given do X comma C, do related to the activity of doing, uh, what if I do X, uh, what if I uh, take the aspirin, will my headache be cured? Valid question. The, the counterpart for that in machine learning is related to the reinforcement learning. The, name, the kind of models that you can have for reinforcement learning is the cause-based cause net, causal Bayesian network, um, MDP, a POMDP, and so a Markov decision process, a POMDP, OMDP, and so on. Now, it's, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I'm not, let me not get into the subtlety. Um, you have the third layer that is related to counterfactuals, uh, the kind of sentence that you write that is P of Y sub X given X prime and Y prime. 
It's very related to the activity of imagination, retrospection, introspection. Uh, gives the name of the book by you, this bo prose book, uh, the book of why, why type of questions, and what if I had acted differently, or why something happened in the way that they did, what would be the alternatives, or the alternative worlds, uh, or was there, particularly, was it the aspirin that stopped my headache? Um, the, there's no, no, no precise counterpart for that in the ML world, um, at least not formally. There are many claims we made, but not formally doesn't really, uh, don't have it yet. Um, the, the structural SCM, the structural causal model gives semantics to this class of models. Um, now, what, what, how do I like to think about the PCH? I also think about uh, moving beyond the traditional ML in which you're trying to do some type of cross layer inferences. What do I mean by that? I mean by that, the previous slide that I said left and right, that we're talking about headache, uh, drug and the headache, the left side has the data that is association that is related to seeing people taking or not taking the drug. And the right side, we're talking about the effect of the intervention that is related to the doing. Then the cross layer inference is that if the data that you got depends it's all about the data collection and the assumptions about it, then if you get data input data, that is from seeing and you're trying to the output or the type of claim that you are trying to, to make or the query to answer is about the doing. Now I would say most of the available data today, 99 for Elias numbers, 99% of the data today is coming from layer one. That is mostly, mo, mo, let me read this. Most of the available data today is observationally, observational and passively collected. And most of the inference that we have today are about causal effects, the effects of new policies, new treatments or decisions, or it could be layer three, but let's focus on two here. Then the question, the type of inference that we are trying to, to, to do here is about how to use data collected from observations that is layer one to answer questions about uh, interventions that is layer two. A variation of that. What about if you have data from layer one and layer two? even if you have the capability of doing interventions, how to make statements about these counterfactual worlds or different possible realities. That's layer three. Now, I like this slide uh, a lot. I learned with time to add this one. That is why is the, the cause of problem non-trivial? People, <laughs> some people may believe that it's quite trivial. Um, and the challenge here is that the SCMs are almost, are, are almost never observed. Let me elaborate a little bit. Um, assuming that you have this SCM down in yellow and, uh, and we have a function that is assigning value to X and another instantiated function F of X and another to variable Y, and you have these boundary conditions over the P of U, X, and U, I. Um, <clears throat> now, I should mention, except is SCMs are, are almost never observed except for, and then you get the, the kind of hard uh, sciences here that in physics, chemistry, bio, some, somewhat in biology, depending, people, people are looking for this f of x and f of y, and sometimes the piece that uh, if, you have, if you have the, the wave function, if you're talking about quantum, they are trying to get exactly the data generating mechanism. Now, except for in these cases, um, uh, they are not, it's almost never observed, um, but regardless, the SCM, as we already have the result, induces these three layers that are the PCH. Layer one, layer two, and layer, the, the interventional layer and the counterfactual layer. Um, in practice, this is what we have, not observed. I just put some kind of occlusion there, some barrier there. And the inference that I just described is about we are getting data from the left here. That is an implication of the SCM, the P of Y sub X, or sorry, Y comma X. And we are trying to make an inference Y given do X. Then under what conditions can you do that? Um, also have this unobserved phenomenon on the top and you're trying to make something about the partially observed uh, phenomenon, or phenomena or implications of that on the bottom. Because you also don't observe maybe, as I just said, the do, and you're trying to jump from the P of Y sub X and do this leap to the do. Um, I, 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 will skip, I will skip for the sake of, uh, um, the, the, the details here, because in class I say half an hour in this picture, but I like a lot the allegory of the Plato's cave. It's a very good metaphor for what's going on here. Uh, in some way, the guys on the bottoms, that is the PCH, is some type of shadows or some type of superficial view of the reality, and there is the whole reality out there that you're trying to make inferences about. 
the food for thought here, happy to discuss it more offline. Let me go a little bit more to the technical, a little bit more technical side. Um, then again, we are trying to do this cross layer inferences and I would like to mention uh, or articulate a little bit our possibility result uh, task that we just agreed. I try, we are trying to infer the causal quantity or the interventional distribution P of Y do X uh, that is layer two from the observational data layer one theorem the effect of X and Y is not identifiable from the observed data. And the, how do you prove that? And I'll go fast here, uh, you can get these slides. There exists two, two collection of mechanisms or different natures capable of generating the same observed behavior, behavior P of X and Y, while disagreeing with respect to the causal quantity or the query Q that this P of Y do X. Now to witness, this is a baby example here, we have these two models, two natures, M1 and M2, um, and the which includes the P of U, that is P of U is equal to half here, just have a fair point. And if you do the algebra, the P of X and Y that they're generating is half in both. This is just XOR, by the way, and this is just one always. And um, But if you compute the P of Y given to X in the first model, in other words, you go there and replace this equation of X fixed from one, you have not, sorry, not X that is zero plus U and U is the fair coin half, then half of the time this probability of Y will be is equal to one, while in the second model, the probability of Y is equal to one will be always equal to one. Then this is just a baby proof to us to start getting the intuition about what is the challenge uh, about uh, related to how to move across the inference. You can prove a, res a result a little bit stronger than, than the, the, the baby example that I gave. Uh, this is the paper by that I mentioned in the beginning that is a collaboration with my uh, ex-student, uh, now Professor Juan Correa and uh, Professor Thomas Eichard from Stanford uh, and also his stu student Dolliger, Ibelin. Um, and the result is the follow. You can prove that in general using some measured theory, uh, with respect to the Lebesgue measure over uh, SCMs, in reality, what we call suitable, suitable encoding of L3 equivalent, layer three equivalence classes of SCMs, the subset in which any of the PCH collapses measures zero. Let me just uh, say in words, um, informally, uh, for almost any SCM or almost any possible environment that the agent may be deployed, the PCH doesn't collapse. In other words, the layers of the hierarchy remains distinct. I think this is a good illustration. This is the way that I like to think about the hierarchy. There's a layer one, layer two, and three. Non-collapse means that we will never get this thing about L1, L2, they match. In other words, there is something that is in layer two that is not in layer one. There is something that is in layer three that is not in layer two. Now, a corollary that follows from that is to answer questions at layer I, for example, layer two, about, yeah, one needs knowledge at layer I or higher. If you want to make, yeah, I statement layer three, you need knowledge from layer three or higher. But what about if you have layer one data? That's the, the challenge here. Or more broadly, after all, how, how are causal inference possible? Or are they possible? Now they are. And you need to introduce some way of encoding assumptions about these class generative models. Recall that it was completely opaque, this thing there before, now it's a little bit less. Uh, then we would like to constrain in some way the forms of the SCM and we encode that to the form of the structural constraints uh, or which, which could be not necessarily, but could be articulated in the form of graphical models. Then you have this, uh, these constraints could be for each of the layers, layer one, layer two, or layer three. Uh, I would like just to make a, a quick note about constraints of the types of layer one, that is the base net, that is layer one, versus a causal base net that is layer two. Uh, the sentence that I like that we have in the paper is that not all graphical models are created. Recall our task is to infer something from layer two, the y do x from layer one, the x, y, from the previous theorem, what was shown that it is impossible to, to link the layers one and two in generality in some kind of, uh, um, um, yeah, in, uh, yeah, in generality. Now, what if a base net is compatible with the data is available? Get this base net in which you have X pointing to Y. 
Now, if you want to answer the question about P of Y do X in this base next G1, the graph one, uh, the answer will be here, P of Y given X, because there is nothing else between X and Y. That is all the correlation that we have between X and Y is going from this arrow from X to Y. Then the effect of X, Y is the same of observing uh, the variations of Y when X is naturally moving. But what about this other base net in which you have the arrow flipped, uh, which is equivalent to the language of base nets? They are bo both I maps for the same set of distributions. I maps for the folks that they, they, they encode the same independence constraints as the, the, the distribution on the top. Now, what would be if you are trying to compute the Y do X uh, in this case in G, G2? What would be the answer? It turns out that the answer in this, this case it would be P of Y. Because if you do the intervention in the variable y, the x, the arrow is going the direction from y to x, that there is no effect in y in reality. Right? This means no effect. Y do x is equal to y means no effect. Then note here that these two guys are completely different. Y x in general, they, it's not equal to p of y, unless the two, the two folks x and y are completely disconnected. Then the, the important uh, answer comment here that there is no information about the SCM, the underlying SCM in the BN as such as to allow inference. Now, which means that while there are some type of constraints that are layer one constraints, we will need L2 or L3 constraints in order to do this inference that is the one that we are intended here. Now we could try to get a uh, rule in reality, uh, first step there, and as we do in the paper, we'll do the L2 type of constraints. I'll not fully define that here, just show a picture about what we're trying to do. The positive cross layers inference we're trying to do from L2 graphical models or CBM. Um, here is um, some type of um, model theoretic interpretation of what we're trying to do. Here is the space of all structural models. This is a step, of the, the, and each dot in this space that I'm not showing, there are uh, infinitely many in reality, uh, is one fully instantiated SCM, collection of functions and P of U. Here, the area in blue is encoding the models compatible with G, that is L2. The, 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 this space here in, in, in uh, yellow are the models inducing P of V. Each dot in this space here is capable of inducing the, the P of V that we saw. And you have this guy in green that is their intersection that is the models with the same Y do X. Now what I'm trying to say for more formally, for any two SCMs that encode these unobserved natures, such as in physics, N1 and N2, nature one and nature two, such that if they agree, they have the same graph G. G of nature one is equal to the G of nature two that is equal to the G that we have they generate the same distribution that we have as input. That's our data. P1 of V is equal to P of V. Then this is the green area, P Y do X, P1 Y do X is equal to P2 Y do X. Then this is what we're trying to achieve. Then we are trying, I usually say that this is a kind of don't care statement that I don't care about what are the idiosyncrasies or what are the details of the SCM, just with the knowledge that we have encoded in G, I can jump from the yellow to the green, from the observations uh, layer one to the interventions layer two. Now, let me summarize what we discussed. That is kind of the, te the tension here, the tension between a reality versus our model and the data that we have from that. We started from a well-defined world, semantically speaking, in which the SCM, that is this pair of functions F and border conditions uh, P of U, uh, boundary conditions P of U implies the PCH was our first, first result, which means that different aspects of the underlying uh, nature and types of behavior. This is encoded what the PCH means. The observing, intervening, and imagining. We acknowledge the collection of mechanisms are there, but inferences are limited given that the SCM is almost never observable. Formally, formally shown through the CHT, the causal hierarchy theorem, that I show about the, the measure, how the measure and the collapse measure happens uh, or has measure zero. We move towards scenarios in which partial, partial knowledge of the SCM is available, such as in a causal graph, I talk in general. 
Now, causal inference theory help us to determine uh, whether the target inference is valid. Uh, in the example that we just discussed, uh, the inference is from layer one to layer two, namely, uh, we are trying to get now not the pair F P of U, but the pair G P of V, and we are trying to say the right hand side there that if you can get the P of Y do X. What are you trying, question here, El Elias, what are you trying to protect against? This is a, <clears throat> this is the contrast. Note here that we have the same gray, uh, uh, blue and yellow, but now we are trying to protect, protect against the being this intersection space that we have the blue and yellow. Maybe there are some models that are in the green and some other models, hopefully the colors are working, there are some models in the green and some models about uh, that is in red, which means that now I, 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 I'm, I'm not allowed not to care because given that I don't know what is the precise model, what is the precise M, and from the G, from the causal model that is the set of assumptions, there are some of them equally well that fits equally well in the green and the red that gives potentially drastically different answer. We cannot commit about making a statement about layer two. There is no way of jumping. Then this is what we're trying to detect or understand or characterize. <clears throat> then this is the, the, the idea here. And most of the causal inference and we spend maybe a semester trying to personalize this picture and refine them of it. But essentially this one's a good summary. Now <clears throat> I would like to, to, to move and, and mention something that I promised that is how does reinforcement learning fit into this picture? I would say I spent probably three minutes here. I spent almost four hours at ICML a couple of years ago uh, discussing what I will tell you here. That is the, uh, uh, and this is the link, CRL, causeRL, CRL.causeoi.net. Now, this was our picture that we had before and the STM, the collection of mechanisms uh, and boundary conditions I imply are inducing this PCH, the causal hierarchy that I'm showing here. What about RL? RL is here, focus in the middle. Um, and, um, it's, and typically speaking, uh, in general, RL cannot move across the layers. In other words, if you have, it, it, almost always true, there are exceptions, there are people in the last few years, two, three, trying to do something different. But what I mean by that is like, like if you are, if you have data from the agent that is in, that is coming from layer one, the agent is just observing the, the 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 robot, or the agent is just observing the world unfold that is coming from layer one. Almost never the agent can get this layer one data and make a statement about layer two. And what limitation fundamental number one, limitation two, the the agent that collected data layer two because the robot or the system went there and did the intervention and collected this data, almost never, and is, uh, we discussed the, P, the CHT, cannot get this data that is layer two and make a statement about layer three. In other words, it cannot provide explanations that are causal and answer why questions and what would happen had it acted differently. Then typical RL is circumscribed or is focused or, 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 or yeah, in, in layer uh, two. Constraint to layer two. Now, how, how do you move out of that? And uh, what should you do? A proposal there, crl.causeoi.net, is about, oops, uh, is about, um, this is a typical picture that we have in RL, sorry. This is a typical picture that we have the agent in the left side. Um, that is an agent that is nothing more than a collection of parameters about the environment theta. There's the environment in the side the agent perceives the environment. This is a textbook kind of picture for the last 30 years, how we think RL. The, the agent perceives the environment, updates the parameters in some way. There are computations, some type of art max over the, the action space, decides an action, optimize, decides the actions, commit and get the reward. And this is what RL does. Now, oblivious to the causal mechanism. What's the proposal there that I discussed in the tutorial? And there are maybe a few dozen papers now on that. The, we would like the agent to take into account the model, the cause assumptions that we're discussing here, both from learning and from the, the, the tutor or the demonstrator. Then the, the agent should have a causal model, for example, a causal diagram of equivalent in the left and uh, acknowledge the SCM in the right. 
Um, but then those are the, the two key observations that allows us to play cause RL. Uh, the environment and the agent uh, will be tied to the spare SCMM and causal graph G. And we also define actions a little bit more broadly. We will call this the interactions and we'll follow the PCH, which means the actions just not be an intervention, but now the actions can be give me more observations. Let me try to do experiments here, or let me imagine these potential realities, the alternative realities of the environment that you have, or the other agents, if you're in the multi-agent type of setting, what the multi-agent, uh, the other agents could be doing, some sort of theory of mind, or causal theory of mind, if you wish. And this is the upgrade in a kind of textbook, a cartoon way uh, of what we want. Now, what this will allow uh, us to do, there are new types of child. When you just do this move, uh, there's a, I consider a move fundamental and simple move. Uh, there are new challenges and opportunities here. Um, the first one, the task, what we call general, and this is the references in blue, I'll not read them. Um, the, the generalized policy learning, I'll call the causal agency, learns through different modalities, including by observing and intervening in the environment which constitute the generalization of something called the do calculus or pearls do calculus and the combination of do calculus, offline learning and type of own policy learning. Uh, more, more details in the, in the papers. Um, uh, other tasks that the agent could show when and where to intervene. Agency now contemplates not to intervene in the system. There is an axiom that interventions are always good. We prove in this paper starting in the RIPS 18, not always good. Uh, if it does, if it does decide to intervene, still it learns how to surgically change the environment uh, so as to bring only intended changes about, protecting against the side effects. <clears throat> Counterfactual decision making, also a sequence of papers here, including this year, sorry, last year in the clear, um, starting from the RIPS 15, that was in reality when I started thinking about cause RL. Uh, agency. Uh, is now, now is capable of analyzing itself, its own biases, goals, and intentions while protecting against unobserved confounders and adversaries who may be trying to exploit its natural inclinations and predispositions. Causal imitation learning. Uh, C is now capable of knowing when cloning the behavior of other agents will allow it to speed up its training or when it will lead to possibly lack of convergence uh, in other words, it is possible even with infinite data uh, to, to be see behavioral cloning uh, not to converge. When the two agents, one agent is copying the other, the agent that has a different model of, it, of the environment. Uh, it's also, the agent, all agents see also knows how to leverage parametric constraints about the environment, there's a type of that, to learn faster, some kind of causal uh, RRL. Inverse reinforcement learning. This is a very recent paper I would suggest in the, the iClear this, this year, ICLR. The, this is the discussion that we have there in Africa. Uh, generalizing, generalizability of causal knowledge across changing conditions. Agent C is capable of generalizing causal knowledge due out of a distribution generalization, acquiring one set into another with a minimal amount of experimentation by leveraging the causal invariances in the system. And the last one that I'll cite here, at least for now, structural learning from combining observations and experiments. C combines observations from other agents with ex experiments uh, conducted by her herself to learn an equivalence class of underlying causal models. I cited very many papers. We are almost putting online a paper that is putting all these papers together. And the last, since, as, as I mentioned, 2015, that is seven years now, seven to eight years that we are working in the causal RL. That is an introduction to causal RL uh, with my PhD student, uh, Justin, um, that will be in the job market. And uh, uh, Professor Lee, that was a postdoc and now is in the Saul National University. They are very happy uh, collaboration that we have many years on the CRL, the causal RL. Now I'm going towards the end. Uh, and I would like just to mention brief, briefly, how does the deep learning could fit in this picture? So far, I haven't mentioned that. The, the picture that I'm copying here is the, from the slides number three or four of the very beginning, I don't remember the numbers, that we have the upper four, that we have reality, that is this mechanism, this is physics or chemistry, then you have the second layer that is the model, 
And if they even here have a probability model means the qualitative, that is the causal diagram or graph, and you ask quantitative, that is the probability distributions. But now all, all of these things that are above the line here, the, the horizontal line, this is abstraction. What is real in the conversation is the data that is coming from this distribution. Now we could get try to get a neural net or, or uh, or a base the, the type of neural net and try to learn the hat, the, the empirical distribution, for example, p hat of zx and y. Now, most of the celebrated results that we have, and when you are happy, in general, it's related usually to the convergence uh, or about the relationship between the p hat distribution and the p distribution itself. Under cer certain conditions, regularity, and the size of the data, maybe the distance between this hat and this fellow or our statistics of it will, will become, go, go to zero. And there are different notions of convergence. This will be success in the left side. And it's very related to the prediction, supervised and unsupervised. Now, what we, as I mentioned, what we're trying to do is not about the left. This is not the inferences that we care about, where the, the central limit theorem could be helping us to close the loop from the P hat to the P. You are interested in something about how to connect the left side that is layer one to the right side that is layer two. How do you do that? Then there is empty data set here. And now we like to put the inference about the head distribution of the dude distribution of the P of Y to X. Now, some people could be trying or believing, maybe tempted to believe that you can connect the output of the neural net to the P hat here. But as we just showed that this makes zero sense, there is nothing in the data nor in the deep net that takes into account the structural constraints that you discussed. Then this is the result that we discussed that called the CHT, the causal hierarchy theorem. Then in principle, those are orthogonal things. What is happening in the left side and the deep net and this counterfactual or alternative reality in the right makes zero sense. And you go to the CHT, the causal hierarchy theorem, and you can show that in general. Order. Now, to try to solve this problem, this is the first paper that we have. It's called the, uh, from I, I clear, oh, the, 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 sorry, the NeurIPS 2021. This is a paper with my student, Kevin Chia and Kai Zan Li, and with Professor Yoshua Benjo in the, uh, Montreal, uh, that is called the causal neural connection. Expressiveness, learnability, and inference that is trying to make this point and propose a solution about how to connect the layer one and layer two. There's some kind of refinement of that in the iClear this year as well that we discuss in Africa. Now, this is my second last slide. And by the way, I think I have more four minutes if I'm right. Uh, can I finish just the topics that I didn't, because someone is with their hands up. Uh, do you want to say something? Uh, no, no, we should start the Q&A soon though, but finish your, your slide first, thanks. Okay, thank you, thank, thank you, appreciate it. Topics that I didn't cover many, many, but the ones that I would like to mention, and I'm again, I'm in the middle of the forest, didn't have the chance the, in Brazil. The, 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 there is connections that are very beautiful that is re, uh, uh, recent. And uh, my first work in computer vision, uh, full blown, that is the causal, uh, how, uh, causal transportability for visual recognition. There's a lot of out of distribution problem in computer vision. Um, this is a collaboration of Professor Carl von Bondrick at Columbia and his student Chen Ji Mao, Professor now Mao, that is in McGill, if I'm not wrong, and uh, our students uh, and Kevin as well, that appeared CVPR last year. One of the reasons that I was very happy to get the invitation, I hopefully I would like to hear your feedback and hopefully collaborate in these and other problems that intersect with vision and, and how I learned a lot from the paper. And I think we, we, we solved a problem there or started the understanding in a fundamental way about how these things relate. And the other problem that I understand there's a lot of interest in vision nowadays in the papers that friends and students are sending is about fairness. And then we have this huge paper, more than 200 that will become a book with my postdoc Drago Pleco uh, called Causal Fairness Analysis, uh, in which, we do, which one of the main topics is about how to define discrimination of classifiers and, uh, and how to dis 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 describe even what our bias is. And we use uh, uh, causality to do that and claim that is a claim. And I believe so that is impossible to do without it. Then I would be curious also to get your take is under country under review of the FTML, Foundations and Trends in ML uh, from Michael Jordan 
um, and uh, uh, have together taken a very interesting the intersection of fairness and computer vision as well. Hopefully you can share a paper using, starting to use these foundations that we have there that you built in the last two or three years. Now my conclusions here, uh, causal inference and AI are fundamentally intertwined and novel learning opportunities emerge when this connection is fully understood. Uh, most of the impediments uh, for general AI today are orthogonal to the current eight causal methods available in machine learning, including deep learning and reinforcement learning. And in practice, failure to acknowledge distinct features of causality almost always lead to poor decision making and superficial type of explanation, non causal, excuse me, non causal type of explanations. Um, the goal here, our agenda in my lab, and hopefully we can work together or, or we can help to move towards this goal, is to develop a framework, which, I mean, which means a set of principal algorithms and tools for designing causally sensible AI systems integrating these three types, observational, intervention, and counterfactuals, like in the PCH, modes of data, modes of reasoning and knowledge. And this will lead to a more natural type of human-like explainability and some kind of rational basis for decision-making. Um, my last one, thank you very much for the opportunity and for listening. And also thank you for my lab that is in the left here, uh, students and, collab and collaborators in the, in the right, including Yuda and Joshua, uh, thank you very much and happy to take a question if I'm allowed. Again, thanks. All right, thank you. All right. You cannot hear the clapping, but clapping took place here. All right, Elias. Oh, cool, thanks. Uh, so any questions from the audience for the speaker? We don't have a lot of time for questions for this talk, but yeah, I, I can repeat it. Uh, I think so a lot of these, uh, these works are, are really interesting results, but you need to know the like causal variables in advance. And so I'm curious, so what he's been thinking about the, the cases where like you need to discover what the appropriate causal variables are, for example, from like broad images. Yeah, so the question is like you like you need to know the causal variables in advance for a lot of these problems. So what was the question? Uh, so like, what, what, what have you thought about the case where you need to like discover what these appropriate causal variables are for raw data, for example? Yeah, like how do we discover these causal variables automatically from raw data like images? Like, you know, have you thought about that case? I mean, how do we infer it? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you for the question. And uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's a beautiful uh, question. And it, there is an area that I didn't have a chance of mention, uh, mentioning that's called the causal representation learning by Bernard Cholkoff and students and many folks who just posted a paper, uh, I think it's a good generalization of the literature about how to do the non-parametric discovery of these variables. Um, and, uh, and there is kind of, growing, I think started maybe two or three years ago. And, uh, and we are currently trying to understand under what assumptions this is, is possible. And then there are all kinds of variations uh, of it. It's a kind of zoo, um, but it is possible yeah, and I would say that I can envision that in the next few years we'll do much better, but uh, we start kind of getting a feeling about how to infer these variables. Um, it's almost like, let me see. Yeah, let, let me defer. There is a paper in my group's website that let me leave it like, like, like that. That is uh, a, a work that uh, in our technical report from, I don't know, two weeks ago that we just posted. I forgot the title now, but there is some kind of non parametric causal representation learning. And uh, the only thing that I would say here is like, in the, yeah, how can you enforce some type bias towards having some type of uh, causal diagram constraints on the unobserved space that we're trying to learn from the, from the pipeline. Um, but I will be happy to take the question offline if you want more information and discuss the paper and so on. But thank you for the question. <clears throat> uh yeah, any uh, any other questions? Uh, there is a question on the chat. Uh, could you maybe take a look, Elias, on the chat? It says, uh, thanks for yes, the talk. Yes. You mentioned that there is not anything in ML corresponding to layer three of PCH yet. Do you imagine there will be a new machine learning paradigm that corresponds to layer three in the future? Yes. Hi, how? how good to hear from you. Yes, beautiful question. Uh, yes, totally. I think it will be um, 
Yeah, I, I, I would say, I forgot to mention something that is related to the question. The whole, the whole idea of having the PCH and the, 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 the PCH, the CHT, but the cause hierarchy have the three layers and you formalize one by one is exactly as a classification device is one of the good things about that. Meaning someone tomorrow, and it's already starting to happen, the numbers of papers in this thing is kind of growing uh, faster in the last year or so. There's someone saying claims, I can do counterfactual reasoning now. How do you test that? How do you, some people don't even understand what counterfactual means. Then you can kind of use the CHT and the PCH to see, let's see if there is an equivalence between, formally speaking, an equivalence between what this person is proposing and what means, what is layer three language, that is the counterfactual language. If it's expressive enough, then yeah, maybe it was not through causal diagrams, but it was through another language uh, or algebraically, if you wish, or through the neural net as we did with Joshua and the, the other folks, and it is still okay. Then the questions about how can you understand what each layer is expressing and which kind of inference is allowing, and then you, if you prove this equivalence, you get a thumbs up and say, yes, I'm doing intervention reasoning, I'm doing counterfactual reasoning. Then we already have, in some way, to answer your question, we do have the language, and I think it is a par paradigm shift. I think you're going the right direction in terms of the formalism and foundations. There is a good amount of work about digesting that, understanding that, making this scalable, have applications in vision and other, I think this is highly non-trivial. I'm spending the last few years trying to do that as well. And I think it's kind of fantastic. It's a, a very exciting times uh, to be doing research. <clears throat> Does it make sense that I answered the question? <clears throat> Uh, well, Herr Wang, you're, you're there. I mean, uh, thanks. Uh, yes, that makes sense. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, and I All see right. you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks nice see you too. <laughs> All right. Thanks again for the talk. Um, I will be moving to the next, uh, talk. Thank you, Elias. Uh, thank you guys too. Yeah. Bye. Enjoy the rest of your trip. Bye. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> next we have, uh, uh, Anna Rorba from UC Berkeley. And uh, Anna, uh, you could share your slides. Um, yeah, we're ready. People are looking at you. Hi, hi. Uh, I am in Vancouver, but I tested for COVID yesterday. So yeah, so <laughs> her now... talk was meant to be in person, but in your best interest, she's uh, protecting, I guess, from the hotel. <laughs> yeah, that's that. That sucks, really. That was so unfortunate. Okay, I'm sharing my screen in a moment. All right, I guess we're gonna pivot now to a different topic a little bit, but I feel like the workshop is rather broad. And like when, when I saw your guys' workshop description, I felt, wow, they nailed all the possible buzzwords that they could. That's really like all encompassing. So <laughs> I wanna talk about something. Uh, can you see it? Does it show up? Well, yes, we can yeah. see it and we can hear you clearly. Yeah. Okay, great. I'll talk about something I like to refer to as learning from language and mostly for vision. Um, uh, so let's let's dive in. Um, so in, in my work, uh, I often look at in, in how sort of human interactions, how we interact among uh, each other, how can that uh, propagate to how we interact with AI. So the, the the different things that make our interaction work, right, is communication about what we see. So we sort of like naturally uh, tell each other, hey, look, there is a blue jay sitting on a branch. So you could think about in AI, we oftentimes have all these captioning tasks, dialogue tasks, where we also want to have this kind of communication with AI agents, right, as we do with each other. What makes this work is that we ground things to the common reality. So we as humans, we know what a blue jay refers to. It's a, it's a kind of bird and what a branch is. And again, we have seen lots of literature looking into grounding as a fundamental aspect of communication and also on other visual language learning because if, if things are not properly grounded, we might actually end up learning some, some biased representations or something wrong. But then there's this third element, which I am thinking about more and more lately, which is learning from language. So in this example, a mom might tell uh, the, the kid, did you know that blue jays like eating acorns? And this isn't something that is currently happening, but the little girl might still imagine what, what it looked like, uh, you know, if there would be a blue jay eating an acorn. So that enriches her understanding of the world and how 
these concepts interact. And so next time she will recognize the blue jay and an acorn and she will know that this is what's happening. And so I like to dive in more into this learning from language or sometimes also I refer to this as advisable learning, which is more like how humans learn from, from each other. So this is not really a new concept. We have seen a lot of work in the early days where language was used as a source of knowledge. So for example, in the form of attributes. So, you know, the experts would sit down and kind of painstakingly label things like this bird has a gray blue uh, crest and a black bill and a white gray belly. And then we would learn these zero shot, you know, models which would recognize this bird now based on all these expert uh, sort of crafted attributes. But now we have large scale models and we no longer need to sit down and painstakingly label attributes. We could do many things now much more, more powerfully than before. So this has really unlocked many interesting capabilities for this learning from language uh, phenomenon. Uh, the, the other side of it, which is I think is less explored, is um, what I'd like to say advisable learning, which is more like learning from rules, like do this, don't do that, like humans often do, or correcting some undesired behavior. So for example, if we are trying to recognize the type of bird here, and the model perhaps thinks it's a duck because there is all the water in the, in the, in the image, we might tell the model, well, look at the bird, not at the water, not at the context, for example. And so this is gonna be uh, what I'm gonna cover today. I will talk about learning from language in the, in the, in the case of visual robustness. So I will uh, discuss two recent works where we, on the one hand, guide models attention to the right things away from bias. And then I will talk about how could we could use language to also extend models to unseen domains. And the second part will be about learning from language for visual transfer, sort of a more uh, conventional zero shot story, uh, but their language will be used as a form of external knowledge. All right, so let's start with the first part. Um, so how could we get this human uh, sort of, not human, how do we get the advice to guide the models you know, away from wrong things and to the right things. We could ask a human, but this could be very expensive. So something more general we could do is tap into these large scale models, which could give us a lot of flexibility and lots of capabilities already. So let's examine the very commonly used one, CLIP. So we all know that CLIP is contrastively pre-trained. Then we can then uh, basically take a given data set and create a classifier and just use it in a zero shot manner using these uh, textual prompts with the different class labels. So our idea now is how do we use this kind of language guidance with CLIP to, uh, to, to improve visual robustness. And now let's keep in mind that CLIP is great, uh, especially with high level concepts, but not necessarily with the fine grained concepts. And also it is really powerful and quite um, a strong uh, and robust to distribution shifts. But, but once you fine tuned it, it kind of loses that robustness similarly to how any CNN would. So uh, keeping these uh, things in mind, let's examine uh, two scenarios. The first one, it will be about contextual bias. And the second one, we'll talk about this, this idea of domain extension. So the first case, um, Let's say, uh, let's first look into how, how do these large models compare to CNNs when it comes to, to this uh, contextual bias issue. So we know that they are quite uh, strong and on general purpose tasks. They utilize language that enables many flexible uh, sort of um, features. They can ground things quite strongly as well, but then they fail again on the fine grained uh, class labels because they're not particularly trained to distinguish some fine grained distinctions, right? At the same time, CNNs can be trained and can be quite strong in these fine grained classification tasks. But then what happens is that they might overfit to contextual biases. And let's examine an example of how this could happen. So it's a kind of toy task, but it gives a very good uh, illustration of this issue of contextual bias. So let's say we are, we are concerned with this problem of distinguishing land birds and water birds. And uh, what happens in practice is that land birds very often appear on land background and water birds often appear in some water background. 
But our CNN doesn't know any about this. What it knows is it's given two classes, zero and one, and it has to learn to distinguish them. So what is the easiest thing for this model to do? Well, the easiest thing to do is to just learn what, what land versus water is. And that's because the model doesn't know what the task actually is, right? It just knows here is a bunch of images from class zero and class one. So what happens then if at test time, we have a land bird, which happens to be on water, we're gonna uh, regret. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna predict that this is uh, a water bird instead of a land bird. So that's contextual bias. Now, how could we solve this with the help of language specification? So here is the conventional ResNet trained on this task, uh, uh, which predicts some, some labels and it has a standard objective. And sort of internally, we could examine where that model is actually looking per se uh, <clears throat> on the image. And we might find out that there is lots of spurious attention because of this contextual bias issue. So it might be looking at the grass, at the trees, at the water and so on, excuse me. And uh, what we want to do now is as a human, it's very easy for us to say, hey, look at the bird basically. So the task is that we are looking at the birds here and we don't even need to go as specific as to kind of teach it, oh, it's about land birds versus water birds. Maybe it's enough to just say here, the the task is this is images of birds which we want to classify so that's exactly what we are doing we are taking clip in this case to encode the images and to encode the prompts in the form of a photo of a bird an image of a bird which will point models attention to the bird so this gives us clips attention which basically is grounding so we are grounding that prompt that specification onto the image and now we want to tell our resnet hey, you have to also look at that same region. So we're gonna introduce an attention loss, which will guide uh, ResNet's attention to the bird away from the, from the background. So it's a very simple uh, idea. And the experiments we conduct on several benchmarks, but I will just cover the water birds example. And uh, so it's a kind of synthetic task. It's a, a fully correlated data set. So we have always land birds on land and always water birds on water. And then at test time, it's a balanced set with you know four possible uh, splits. And we look at the accuracy uh, per each group and also for the worst of, of the four. So what we find now, uh, this method GALS uh, does the best across uh, a variety of baselines, including the vanilla ResNet, the prior work ABN, the up weighting, sort of trying to counter the distribution shift in various ways. The, the zero shot clip and also the clip with linear regression on top of it. So we see a good improvement over clip, which is a very strong baseline in this case. And also this highlights again, that clip is not sort of uh, that strong when it, when it comes to these fine grained distinctions of uh, water birds and land birds. Now we also see that we actually successfully uh, redirect the model's attention away from the context so vanilla CNN here is looking all over the place. And after our uh, sort of advice, it is now focusing on the bird. So the, to sum up, the language task specification here was used to basically to turn the model's attention away from bias. Uh, the second scenario that we're gonna look at is the uh, this task of zero shot domain extension. So first let me define what, what this is. This is a slightly non-standard uh, setting. So imagine in training, you have some training domain and then at test time, you might have some mix of seen and also some unseen new data, which is a very typical realistic setting. So you don't know what you're gonna encounter, but you wanna be able to be robust to this new unseen domain. So when we introduce language now, we, we might be able to, uh, to actually tell our system, well, in training, these are real images, but I also care about sketches. So we are telling our model potentially that this is the kind of data it might encounter without having any examples of that data. So the model might start imagining what the sketches may look like. So, so this is kind of where, where language comes in. Now, how do we approach this? Well, one could say, why don't we just perform some, some data augmentation at a pixel level, just generate a bunch of sketches, like in this case. And we tried using some uh, recent methods 
or now maybe semi-recent uh, because it, <laughs> this field is moving so fast. But basically what we found is that in these open-ended settings, oftentimes these models are very inefficient, very slow, or the quality that we are getting is not great. So instead of doing this pixel level augmentation, we wanna do augmentation at the embedding space. And in this case, we're gonna be using clip again and modify clip embeddings to match to our new unseen domain. So let's um, examine this closer. So this is a new uh, example. Now we're looking at the road signs. And so the training domain is sunny days, road signs, as you can see. And now we want to anticipate snowy road signs. So this unseen domain, we don't have again any images from here, is these road signs in the snow. What we're going to be now concerned with is this joint embedding space where we're going to perform our augmentation. So we are taking our samples of, of, of street signs in the training domain and we are augmenting them into the unseen domain. We want them essentially to be like these snowy images. So uh, that's, that's the objective. And we call this overall framework latent augmentation using domain descriptions, LADS for sure. So how do we get there? Um, here is a, sorry for changing examples. Here is an example again with Waterbird setting. So Puffin is gonna be the class label. Anna, Anna uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Uh, yeah, we had like Anna, a little glitch. We had a little glitch with the connection right there. Like, oh, sorry. Yeah, so could if you could like go over this. Previous slide. slide. Yeah, yeah, so there were yeah, a couple of, of words that we, we lost. On this one, uh, this yeah. slide? Yes, yes. Okay, let me let me recap. Yeah, last last one minute, I would say we could. There were a couple of things that were not clear. No, 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 no in, worries. In the audio, yeah. Thanks for uh, yeah. Thanks for stopping me. So again, here I'm talking about this this um, domain extension setting where the training domain has sunny road signs, and we want to extend, anticipate, you know, different weather environments, so different conditions like snow. And again, we don't have any images from the snow. All we know is that we want to anticipate snowy road signs. So in our joint embedding space, we are taking images from the training domain and we want to augment them into our new unseen domain. But again, this is just in the embedding space. So our goal is to basically transform them so that these embeddings resemble these snowy uh, signs. And so next, I'm going to talk about the most, the more concrete way of how we are getting this done. Uh, now the example uh, changed, <laughs> so we are now distinguishing different birds here again, and the and the domains are going to be photos versus paintings. So sorry about the the, the switches of examples, just going to keep you uh, alert. Um, so we are taking our example of this puffin, a photo of a puffin, and we embed that image. And now we're using clip for all these embeddings. And then on the text side, we're using these user supplied inputs, which are a photo of a bird versus a painting of a bird versus a puffin or sparrow distinction. So there's a typo. So what we want to do now is we, we are creating this augmented version for this image of a puffin. Now there is two criteria we want to meet when we sort of generate these embedded features. On the one hand, we want this to be in the unseen domain. So for, for this purpose, we introduce a domain alignment loss, which is going to say, we have indeed synthesized an embedding that, that lives in that painting space. So this is a painting, not a photo. Now, the second criterion, which is important also, is that we don't lose the class information. Because you may imagine that when we are transforming these embeddings, it becomes a painting, we might experience some, uh, some loss of class identity. So we don't want that to happen. We, st we still want to have a puffin and not a different bird. So for that, we use this class consistency loss, which is very much like, uh, like, like what Clip would do. And so the, the combination of both of these two losses is what gives us the complete objective that we have here. Now, we experiment in, in several problem statements. The first one is domain adaptation. So these are these re real versus uh, painting uh, of birds. And what we find, so there is the ID, the sort of in domain scenario, out of domain, which is going to be paintings, and extended, which, which is what we introduce, which is the combination, the mixture of both of them. 
what we find is that we are doing very well on the ID uh, setting. We are doing the best on the out of domain setting, uh, successfully outperforming strong uh, baselines based on clip. And we are doing the best on this extended domain, which is basically the mixture of both of them. So that's the story with the domain adaptation. We also look again into contextual bias, which we discussed previously. And here we have this water versus land uh, uh, bias. And so we, we compare to zero shot baselines, which don't do any training to, to fine tuning baselines. And we see a big improvement in both cases over these baselines. So again, this method is quite effective uh, in, in that uh, augmentation strategy that we are using. We also analyze what is that we are uh, actually creating because we can't see them at the pixel level. So we analyze these embeddings simply looking at the nearest neighbors. So all of these nearest neighbors fall sort of closely into, into our extended domain as we want. So we want the, uh, all of these to be paintings. But moreover, they, we oftentimes see that they still respect sort of the original uh, bird classes. So we see lots of similarity. Like for example, this is a painting of a hummingbird versus the photo of a hummingbird and so on. We have these very similar looking birds which are nearest neighbors to our original photos of birds. So that means we are doing sort of the right thing. We are preserving the class identity and we are transforming the domain. Um, so to sum up this part, we can do zero shot extension in a sense, zero shot that we don't have any images of that domain using just language specification, which describes the domain shift. And uh, with that, we are moving to the second part, which is going to be about visual transfer and no longer visual robustness. So um, here, like we said previously, large scale models are quite powerful, especially at high level concepts, but maybe not so good sometimes with fine grained ones. So they can't solve all of our problems right away out of the box. But there is lots of knowledge that we as humans have already accumulated, which we could simply tap into in many resources like maybe Wikipedia or Victionary and so on. Uh, first, sort of very briefly about this visual transfer uh, setting. So zero shot learning traditionally has been explored at a class level, right? So early works would say, I've trained on, on these classes. Now I want to generalize to these new unseen object classes. Now, more and more recently, we see this more task level transfer. So it's like, I want to generalize now to an, an entirely new data set, which is what uh, Clip has demonstrated quite effectively, right? So we know sort of how these uh, traditional methods operated. They would in integrate external knowledge sometimes using embeddings, using attributes, using knowledge bases, many different techniques there. So the open question is, what is the effective way of introducing this knowledge into this new generation of, of, of models which perform task level transfer? And um, let's examine an example here. So we are first time to a Japanese restaurant and we read the menu and there is no pictures and, you know, what is takoyaki? What is sashimi? Perhaps you don't know. So what we can do now, we can ask the waiter to explain. And then with that knowledge, now we could start understanding what these dishes are. So takoyaki, for example, is a bowl shaped dumpling made of butter uh, filled with uh, diced octopus and, and so on. So now we are not like sort of seeing these descriptions and like have no idea what these are. Now we, we are basing now on all the prior knowledge that we already have, what it, what it means to be bowl shaped, what dumpling is, that we could really understand and imagine what these dishes can be. So we are using our prior structured knowledge for that. And so the question is, how can we bring this similar capability now to our AI models, which perform task level transfer? All right, so this is going to be uh, the kind of deeper uh, dive into this approach, which we call K-Lite, Knowledge Augmented Language uh, Image Training and Evaluation. So many recent works which perform this task level transfer start off with the image and language aligned data sets. So for example, there could be an image and some text, which is you know taken from the web somewhere, which talks about sashimi. 
but it doesn't necessarily look like a definition of sashimi or it might even not mention sashimi in it. So we are like learning these representations in a very weak way using images and language. Now, what we are introducing is the knowledge aspect in a more structured way. So now we are saying, what we are trying to learn now is the concept of sashimi. That's the query. We're gonna to go to our knowledge base, which could be a variety of things, could be WordNet, could be dictionary or something else. And we are now introducing knowledge as part of the, le uh, of the learning process here. So here are some examples of what that could look like. It could be a kind of un, um, unrolled WordNet hierarchy, which explains what sashimi is, or a WordNet definition, or a dictionary definition. All of these could, uh, could be tried. We actually tried all of them, and I believe that the dictionary one works the best. It has this richest sort of uh, and most informative uh, description of these concepts. So now, similar to how these other methods do this prompt sort of based uh, transfer, we are simply integrating our knowledge as the third element into the, into the prompt alongside with the language descriptions. So it becomes a very natural, very simple way of introducing knowledge into this task transfer. So in, in training, sort of the model learns the, uh, from these definitions and an inference, it can also ha have access to definitions if they're available so that the transfer uh, is enabled into the zero shot case. And we are going to be experimenting here with the standard benchmark, which I, I believe originates from CLIP with 20 data sets um, with the zero shot transfer where the pre-training happens on, uh, on ImageNet 21K. So here is the summary of the results. There is more in the paper, but the, the TLDR is we, uh, so yeah, sorry, I forgot to say, the baseline is UniCL is a, uh, is a model from Microsoft. There's a kind of academic uh, version of Microsoft Florence uh, method. So here we see that we, we get a consistent boost with a variety of training uh, regimes and training, uh, uh, pre-training data sets. And moreover, we are actually more sample efficient. And if you think about this, it makes sense because we have not just these descriptions, which again, could be not super useful sometimes, but we have the knowledge as part of the training as well. So we have uh, only about half the number of samples gives us similar performance to, to the UNICL. And uh, if you want to kind of dive deeper into when does knowledge help, actually, we can explore these 20 tasks in terms of sort of how well they match to our knowledge uh, coverage or how, how well are the concepts overlapping with the knowledge. And so if we examine the ones which, which benefit the most from the knowledge, these, these two flowers and food, these tend to be fine-grained data sets, which kind of deal with these rare fine-grained concepts. And they also happen to have pretty good coverage on the, in, in the knowledge uh, base. And on the far right, the concepts, uh, sorry, the, the tasks which don't benefit from knowledge or even uh, suffer slightly happen to be tasks where perhaps the knowledge sources are not adequately aligned with the task, where the descriptions are more, uh, perhaps more ambiguous. So the quality of knowledge is low. There are some spurious words or also this sort of satellite setting is, is quite challenging as well. So that's sort of a, a deeper insight. So to sum up, we have uh, we can enhance our learning, our transfer learning, uh, using language as external knowledge with, with our uh, set of the art models. Um, so to sum up the whole presentation, learning from uh, language. In, in, so we examined uh, two scenarios, visual robustness and visual transfer. In the first case, we talked about how we use language specification of the task, which is very easy to obtain. Um, to guide CNNs away from contextual bias. And then we also discussed how similarly we could enable zero-shot domain extension. In the second case, we talked about how we could use language knowledge to build transferable and sort of better visual models. And these are the three works that I talked about and all of the wonderful collaborators, I think actually not all of them, maybe only a subset <laughs> of them, and with that, it's a bit shorter. I think I was aiming for more of a longer discussion. And so it's a bit of a shorter presentation than the others. Uh, and finally, <laughs> a moment of shameless advertisement, if, if I may. 
I wanted to share that I'm actually starting as a professor at TU Darmstadt in September, and I'm looking for uh, prospective students and postdocs, so please get in touch. we would be happy to talk, uh, I guess, virtually since I'm on quarantine right now. But that's, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. There is clapping happening here, uh, and uh, congrats on, on the new position also. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so questions from the audience? um online or here in person uh yes uh you you can maybe come here and ask uh, i think if you don't feel too embarrassed to come here and talk so i don't have to repeat the question yeah uh hi uh thank you so much for the nice presentation I do have two questions. So the first one is from the first part of your talk. When you say to so use um, clip maps, clip attention maps, mask maps to guide the model. Mm -hmm. so my question here is: so there's other works that have shown that clip actually does not localize by default. Like you really have to train it or fine tune it for localization, either in a supervised or a uh, self-supervised manner but just like out of the box it doesn't work so what did you use to guide to get these maps did you use which layers which attention maps is it a specific for every case or yeah so that would be yeah. the first question okay and maybe i just ask the second question quickly and then you can answer both and the second question is how do you actually introduce the knowledge in the second part of your talk for the k light uh, model? How do you introduce the knowledge? Do you just concatenate this external knowledge in the prompt or uh, and is it um, search independently for every question you ask to the model? Maybe I start with the second question. I think it's easier to go in that order. So yeah, the, the the query, basically the, the query and the language descriptions and the knowledge are being concatenated, like you said. And um, uh, one could just do this querying you know, step first for the different concepts of interest that we have. So we assume we know which classes we care about, right? So we could have those, uh, those definitions uh, queried and obtained ahead of time. And then, yeah, like you said, it, it can be simply concatenated. So it's very, very simple. For the, for the first question, um, so I agree that clip will not work every time. And, you know, it's kind of like, depending on how well clip is doing on your given task, you could kind of imagine how well it might work or not work in our particular framework. So we did see cases when we, we would try this, like more fine grained data sets in particular, and clip just didn't do well. <laughs> um, so I think one has to kind of keep that in mind, that if clip does not do it well on the task to start with, then probably localization as well is going to be poor. But all in all, in many, with many common classes, like just if you just say bird, it does quite well. So it's it's quite well. What we we did not guide clip or supervise clip. We used one of the existing techniques which which can expose uh, saliency in the model. We tried several ones. I believe in the paper we have a comparison of the different ones uh, and you can probably get a better understanding from that than I can right now recall and, and summarize sort of some of the uh, gradient propagation based ones and some of the um, grad camp style yeah and, and, and something else sorry don't don't recall right, right now so um the like the right for the right reasons type um so it's it's a kind of that yeah I know that people have concerns so you know what if clip itself is biased right what if clip itself is looking in the wrong place so I think those are all fair points that we cannot hundred percent rely on clip and I also don't want to advocate for clip in particular <laughs> I want to say that this is a more general way of thinking that with the large scale models which are quite strong like why not tap into that and for many cases they will give us better localization out of the box than we would get from a CNN, which overfits to some spurious uh, biases. But yes, there's a disclaimer that we have to be mindful of uh, our each individual scenario. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Uh, don't feel shy. Come here and ask a question. She can. She can hear you. Too bad I can't see the audience. It's really lonely. <laughs> I I send you. Some I see you. <laughs> uh, I send you some pictures at least. But yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, no, no, yeah, there, there are about like, I don't know, like twenty five people here and uh, like twenty more online, right? Um, any other questions? Yeah, well, maybe I'll I'll ask something, right? Uh, so, in terms of like you using knowledge knowledge bases, I mean, um, do you think we could leverage also some of the more traditional, you know, knowledge bases like people have been trying to build a concept net or other ontologies that are more formal? Do you do you see I mean, a path? Yeah, yeah. We, I I think one could definitely play with the with the source of knowledge here i think what we found what was what was crucial what i was trying to highlight towards the end is it all kind of boils down to how well your downstream task overlaps with your knowledge source so for some tasks maybe the knowledge source is perfect and it has great coverage but for some other task the same knowledge source does not have enough coverage so i think it's more about the coverage than you know per se about how structured or how i see formal it is and uh, and I think this this is a great sort of start to to this exploration of how else could we integrate knowledge and more formal representations into these uh, giant models and I think that's pretty much still an open question and I'm also very interested in, in seeing more work uh, in, in there sort of how do we incorporate more like rules right sort of something more rule-based uh, we have explored in the past um, an advisable scenario in a driving uh, domain where we would ask humans about some driving situations, like if you see this, do that, and then we integrate to that into the model. But what if I wanted to integrate an entire driving manual, right? If I want to just really make the model to understand all the driving rules, how would I integrate this kind of knowledge into the models? So I think that would be really cool to, to explore. I see. And following up on the previous question that yeah, you were that you were asked here, um, you know, like I also found that the, you know, using something like GradCam on on a clip model doesn't really give you very good like like object support in terms of like visual grounding and localization. Uh, was that not what you use? I mean, what other kind of techniques uh, do you use to extract? I'm trying to remember if there was an alternative, and I think there was, but I I think I'm just not not recalling right now what else we tried. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, have to, I have to send you to the paper. Anyways, yeah, like, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I was. Yeah, I, I, I personally would like to see that, you know, because uh, you know we actually have a paper similar to that. We should talk about this later, but <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> At this CVPR and and the but we didn't use clip. I mean, uh, we use uh, some other language model, yeah. uh, vision language model, and then we use GradCam. I mean, it seemed to work, but yeah. somehow clip gave worse support than some of the other vision language models that are trained. Like we try Albif. I the think Albif. we also. I think we also maybe some of the hacks we did was ensembling over multiple maps obtained with different prompts. Okay just to get slightly stronger, slightly okay, more yeah. viable output. But that, I don't know if that made a huge kind of ch change, right. yeah. But yeah, one has to play with it a bit. Any other questions from the audience here? Uh, if not, um, we can move on to the next uh, uh, speaker. Thank you again, Anna, Thanks for, for making the effort to still deliver the talk. Uh, I'm presuming the symptoms are mild or absent, <laughs> so I hope you recover soon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the conference. <laughs> yeah. So our next speaker, um, unfortunately, she won't be able to join us. Uh, Zeynep Akata from um, Universität Tübingen in Germany. And she sent us a recorded talk uh, so I'm going to play that here, uh, but at the same time, I want to remind you a little bit of the schedule. So after uh, Zeynep's talk, there will be a break for lunch, and then we will reconvene 
again later at 2.15 p.m. Uh, Professor Alan Ewell from Johns Hopkins will give an in-person talk here at 2.15 p.m. Uh, and then we will have two more talks, Ziwei Liu from Nyan Technological University and Ren Ranjay Krishna from University of Washington will also give a talk and it will close the session today. So we have three more talks. They start at 2.15 p.m. Uh, so I'm gonna just, let me download the video. I don't wanna stream it. Uh, so give me a couple of seconds. We'll be ready soon. You know, it's interesting, you know, what happens in these conferences. I was invited to give a talk at ECCV last year, and it was in Tel Aviv, and I couldn't go, and I had to do it online. And now that I'm here, a lot of people, I'm sure, who were at ECCV are giving remote talks. Let me just put it in this, on the screen here. Give me a second so I can also stream it for the audience on Zoom. Uh, where's the video? Here it is. All right. So I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give a talk in this uh, TVPR workshop. I'm going to talk about my, uh, our research on explainability in deep learning through communication. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Tübingen. I'm also affiliated at the Max Planck Institute for Informatics and for Intelligent Systems. I will be talking about um, a part of only a part of our research on explainability and uh, the part that um, involves communication. And um, I will also talk, uh, maybe I change, I give you an outline of my talk first. And um, I will mention how explanation and learning are related. And then um, um, there are many different ways of doing explanations, of course, but in our and um, in, in this uh, uh excuse me, somebody in the chat is saying that if I can share the audio directly via Zoom instead of the instead of the microphone. So I'm gonna try to do that one more time. Ah, uh, where is the video? Do you in the video here. Our box. Oh, here it is. And oh yeah, share sound. Optimized for video clip. Sharing again. All right. It should work better. Please, the participants online, please let me know if this is better now. Talk. I would be talking about explanations that are broad, simple, contrastive, and abstract. And these are achievable through very easily through conversations. Then um, I will argue that explanations should be tailored to the communication partner because uh, our communication partners could have different understandings of the, of the world. So we need to tailor our uh, communication channels for them. And then uh, I will summarize and talk about future research possibilities. Okay, so uh, let's talk about how explanation and learning are related. I think um, the best way of explaining this concept is um, by an, an um, example. 
And here I borrow the example of Tanya Lombroso from her Trends in Cognitive Science article from 2016. Um, she says there are two different types of aliens. One of them is called GLORB and the other one is DRENT. And as you can see, their um, um, heads are different, their body shapes are different, their color distributions may, may be different. And um, based on these differences, we are going to create a classifier that is going to classify them, uh, the globes versus trends, uh, as best as possible, as highest with as highest accuracy as possible. We might group them according to the uh, shape of the head and say that all the square head headed aliens are called globes, and this will be a, a classifier with seventy five percent of accuracy, which may seem quite high, uh, but of course this classifier makes a classification decision based on the wrong reasons, which could be a, quite pro problematic when it comes to generalization capabilities of this classifier. So we go back to our learning problem again, and we try to look at other properties that could be discriminative. For instance, as we can see, the shapes of the feet are quite different. And if we group the aliens based on pointy feet into the same group, then um, uh, all the globes would be uh, point, um, grouped into the same cluster and the classifier will be very accurate, but also the classifier would be making the decision based on the um, right reasons. We are looking for explanations of this sort. As uh, Tanya, uh, de defines them, these explanations need to be broad, simple, and contrastive. They need to uh, justify a broad range of observations. They need to be simple, and they need to provide a um, concise description for the communication partner. So here comes the uh, importance of the communication partner. And then they need to be contrastive. They need to differentiate two alternative decisions. We need to be able to argue why a class does not belong to another one, why an image does not belong to another class, for instance. So based on that, we could, um, in fact, use language use um, for, um, for such communication, for creating such um, simple explanations. And for that, we had created this data set uh, using the images of birds and flowers data sets. Uh, we asked Amazon Mechanical Turk users for uh, annotating our images, and we asked them to mention at least three different properties and at least 10 words for the per image. We annotated every image with 10 sentences, and in fact, this data set has been used many, many, um, in many different ways for generative, uh, for uh, image generation as well. Um, so, but what is the difference between an explanation and a description in this context? We would like to de uh, define these concepts based on class relevance and image relevance. So, um, a description, let's look at two, uh, two different uh, images first that come from two different bird classes. The first one is Western Grebe, the second one is Lysan albatross, and uh, the description says this is a large bird with a white neck and a black back in the water for the first class. And for the second class, it also talks about the water because these two birds are water birds. They are of, uh, oftentimes found in the water, but this is not necessarily the reason for classifying these images. I even if they don't appear in, uh, in a water background, they should be classified correctly. So a des description is not an explanation. A definition talks about the Western grip with all of the discriminative properties, and these properties may not be visible in the image. For example, um, uh, the belly of the bird is not visible. And then the, for the Lysan albatross, again, uh, the belly is not possible, is not visible, or maybe the feet are discriminative properties that is also not visible. So in terms of class relevance, if it, definition is very, um, uh, high, but in terms of image relevance, it's very low. We are looking for visual explanations that are both image and class relevant, which means the 
sentence needs to talk about the class itself. So it needs to talk about the class specific properties that are visible in the image. This is very important. How now I would like to talk about how we generate these broad, simple, contrastive and abstract explanations. Let's say the, uh, the task is as follows. There is a user who might have partial observation about the environment. And then um, the user asks questions like, what type of bird is this? And um, uh, the computer, the model needs to look at the image and classify it. It's a cardinal. And then it needs to justify the classification decision because this is a red bird <clears throat> with a red beak and a black face. In fact, <clears throat> to improve the image relevance of the uh, explanation, it needs to point point to the evidence for this. Red bird needs to have a bounding box surrounded by it, and so on. I also mentioned that explanations are contrastive, so the model needs to say why not. Uh, the the user might ask why not a fly, uh, vermilion flycatcher, and then the model needs to think about how a vermilion flycatcher looks like. What are the properties, the distinguishing properties that are not visible in our original image? Like black wings are not visible in the, uh, the cardinal image. So it talks about the black wings when it needs to justify why it is not a vermilion flycatcher. In this um, article, we achieved that by uh, taking an, a model that um, looks at the image, extract an image feature and also makes a the classification decision and then a language model takes these image features and class decisions classification decisions and um, makes use of it while generating the next word so it is a, a class and image feature conditioned language model then we generate these sentences and these sentences then get um, uh, split into attributes, uh, into noun phrases, using a part of speech tagger, an attribute chunker. And then an explanation grounder that uh, has been trained on a different data set, because this data set doesn't contain bounding boxes, uh, needs to uh, find matching bounding boxes for every noun phrase. For multiple sentences, we do the same thing. And then we have a, a phrase critic model that ranks these sentences based on how well every noun phrase and bounding box um, match is scored. So the, for the, uh, it looks at the cumulative score of the sentence and says this sentence is more suitable for that image. Doing that, doing um, improve, uh, using bounding boxes or the the visual evidence of the um, of the mentioned phrases improves the uh, generated explanations in the sense that uh, for instance for this red winged blackbird it um, talks about red spot on its wing bars because this has a very high score in terms of um, bounding box and phrase ma matching and mentioning this gives a high score for the sentence. So it becomes more um, um, accurate, the sentences, forcing this um, grounding property. Um, this has been shown also in um, uh, human studies. Then I mentioned that the explanations are contrastive. So um, we show this image, we ask um, what this image belongs to which class this image belongs to and um, and why not another class and we de define this other class based on um, looking at image features or image similarities between this image and all the other classes in the um, um, data set and we find that this image is one of the closest images to the, our original image and the class of this image is red-faced cormorant and we decide on the long flat bill the counterfactual property the contrastive property based on how well um, the class discriminative properties of this alternative bird get scored when they pro uh, when they are projected onto that image onto the original image it seems long flat bill property has one of the lowest scoring 
uh, bounding boxes for this image. So we choose that as the counterfactual phrase and say because it doesn't have black, uh, a long flat bill. Then um, I would like to talk about how we generate abstract um, properties, abstractions of, um, of these explanations. Um, and in this work, we again make use of a, a language as the communication channel. And we say two models will be communicating. One of them has an idea of um, which classes this image might belong to. And the second model looks at the image and can answer all of the questions about this image, but it is not allowed to answer all of the questions. It is allowed to answer only the question that it is asked. So the task of this agent is to come up with the right questions. And the task of this agent is uh, to reveal the answer of that question only. Then uh, is it, so the first question is, is it furry? The answer is yes. That eliminates two of the classes. Then this uh, remaining classes defines the next question. And also as a byproduct, we have a decision tree. We construct a decision tree because um, now based on this property, all the other classes can be ignored. The next question is, does it have whiskers? The model says no. And then um, this already determines the classification uh, result. It's a dog because this is the only remaining class in this case. So this way, uh, in this work, we are trying to generate simple, broad, contrastive explanations that are also uh, abstract representations of the object. And while doing that, we want to um, improve the transparency of the decision-making process. We have two agents communicating with each other, the recurrent decision tree agent that has an external memory and uses LSTM units to keep track of the gameplay. And then um, we have an MLP that defines, that determines the next question to ask. That's the question that maximizes the classification score. Then the attribute-based learner agent takes an image, extracts features from them, and based on these features, it can classify the image um, based on all of the attributes, whether, whether this attribute is present on it or not. But um, it won't be able to reveal the answers of all of the other questions, but only the question that it has been asked. That determines the, uh, in some cases, the next question. In this case, the final, the final decision, because that eliminates the remaining one class. In this work, we were trying to uh, make use of these simple representations or abstractions um, as an information bottleneck for the classification decision. Still, the classifier is actually a, a black box deep learning model, but uh, because we use this information bottleneck, we can make the, um, the actual decision-making process a bit more transparent. In which cases would this be useful? Um, for example, we have two images. We don't know if they belong to the same class. We start asking questions. What well, does it have white underparts and so on? Uh, up to the point of black wings, these two images belong to the same bucket. They fall into the same bucket. And in the black wings property, they split. We see that uh, the first image gets classified as a blue kingfisher, which is wrong. But um, the reason seems to be that the black wings property is not correctly detected. And this is actually justified because the bird is flying and the black wings are not visible. Another um, interesting observation we had was when we looked at uh, two different images that belong to the same class, one of them is a female bird, the other one is a male bird that has black head. And the classifier thinks that the black head, the black crown, is a class discriminative property for this class, which is wrong. In all the black 
uh, in all the male spe male uh, birds of this species, it is correct, but for the female bird, it is not. It, this it seems in, at this point in uh, time, the classifier has learned to classify these objects, uh, probably correctly many many times, but for the wrong reasons. And this we can uh, point in this way. When it comes to object abstraction, um, we may not have access to a predefined vocabulary or we may not have uh, access to attributes like I described before. So in these cases, our aim is to come up with such a, come up with a vocabulary that uh, is universal. Um, for this, uh, as a, a simple proof of concept, we used um, human sketch or uh, sketches of that are made by humans. As you can see, all three of these sketches, they correspond to the same class, but they are drawn very differently. And because of this reason, oftentimes these get mis misclassified by classifiers. So what we would like to do is to use a, a visual vocabulary that is composed of um, simple primitives, seven primitives in this case, and then recreate these sketches using only these primitives, and then eliminate the primitives that are not necessary for recognizing this object. And then um, we can use this in communication, like in a game like Pictionary. One of the agents starts drawing the uh, concept and the second one tries to guess it correctly. It, the first one stops drawing new primitives once the second one is able to guess it correctly. So very briefly how this works, we have uh, sketches and the parts of these sketches are um, separable. So we take every part separately and uh, we also take all, all our drawing primitives. We determine seven primitives. We feed that into a stroke encoder that extracts features for us for all the primitives and for the sketch part. Then um, we try to match every uh, drawing primitive after transforming them into uh, this part of the sketch. And this uh, we learn uh, fine transformations here. We transform the primitives. The next step is to take these transformed primitives render them in a coordinate grid, render also the sketch part in the same co coordinate grid where we can compute distances very easily. As another step, we have a compatibility function that measures the compatibility between non-transformed uh, uh, primitives and the sketch parts. Our loss function is composed of these two um, items, these two parts. One of them um, takes the distance transforms, the other one takes the compatibility function. We optimize these jointly. Some um, qualitative results. These are all human sketches. You may be able to uh, recognize them already. Now with 10% uh, budget, this is the abstraction that our method comes up with. For example, abstracts this uh, shape into a rectangle. With more uh, budget, it adds more and more details. Some of the classes may already be uh, recognizable. And then with more budget, of course, more details get added, which makes the uh, drawing more complex. In some cases, this is not necessary. As a conclusion, learning abstract representations of objects can constrain the system for improved interpretability. So we can use these uh, abstract representations as information bottlenecks for, for improved inter interpretability. It's an effective means for evaluating the conceptual understanding of the model. So um, we can use these uh, abstract representations to uh, to see if the model really understands which object they are looking at and for the, whether to 
it does that for the right reasons. And um, this can help comparing different objects and assess similarity. In the very beginning, I talked about contrasted explanations and this abstract representations helps with that. Next, I would like to talk about how explanations are, are tailored for the communication partner. Here, um, I want to uh, use this simple uh, game that two agents play with each other. The first one um, picks one of these images. They are presented always the same images. One of them picks the image, describes the image to the second one, and the second one, based on the description, should pick the correct image. Of course, if the uh, second communication partner sees the world in the exact same way as the first one, then this, um, and if the first one is able to describe the image correctly, then this is a trivial task. But the second one has some form of disability. In this case, it is colorblind. So if the description is about colors uniformly randomly, this model is going to fail in picking the correct image. And this will get communicated to the first, first agent. And over time, by playing this game with each other many, many times, the first one realizes that the second one cannot see colors. So it updates um, its descriptions. Although the most discriminative property still could be the colors, it doesn't mention the colors, but mentions shapes in this case. This helps the second agent to pick the same, the correct image. Um, so we again have a speaker and a listener agent. The listener agent in this example is colorblind. It could be other disabilities. We tried many in the paper. Um, so we extract image features from them, both of them. And these, these parts is the same for both of the agents. And then we predict attributes in both cases. And here it might, these two agents might be performing differently. And then um, we contrast these predicted attributes and say, for example, red beak is the uh, property that gives the highest score. It, uh, in the beginning of the game, this score gets communicated to the, uh, to the second agent. And the second agent, uh, although it also can predict these properties correctly, there is some noise um, in the process and um, it cannot reveal what it has predicted for these properties. And if red big property is asked, then this leads to a minus one reward that gets communicated to the speaker the speaker updates its belief about the listener and that determines the next question. In this um, example, I show a gameplay that has already progressed. So the cone beak property gets communicated, although it's not the most discriminative property. And that leads to a positive reward that gets communicated to the speaker and the speaker understands that it started communicating correctly with the communication partner. So um, if we look at the, some results, the most discriminative property is brown back. In this example, the chosen property is brown back in this example for these two images. And this leads to the wrong decision for the communication partner. It picks this one, which is incorrect. In more games, the discriminative property is still color related property, but the chosen one is um, patterns or shapes related property that leads to the correct decision. In the game 100, the um, co conversation seems to have converged, although the most discriminative properties are always with uh, related to colors, the chosen property is always uh, patterns or shape related properties that leads to the correct decision. I would also like to talk about our um, most recent work that makes use of these broad, simple, contrastive uh, descriptions 
but these descriptions now come from a large language model. So we ask the uh, model to impersonate a four-year-old in this case to describe the black footed albatross class. And the large language model says it's a big bird, it lives on the water. We do that for um, many different classes, for all the classes in our data set. And we each time get a different uh, description depending on the class and depending on the per personality. We pair these sentences up with, with images and we uh, take a vision language model, we train it together and uh, to predict the class label based on the similarity of the sentence and the image. At inference time, we feed these um, test images to the trained uh, vision language model. This vision language model gives us the prediction, class prediction. In some cases, it is correct. In some cases, it is not. And uh, we measure accuracy. We have um, looked at three different variants of vision language models, two different clips and the open clip for um, five different personalities, two-year-old, four-year-old, seven-year-old, 13-year-old, and 20-year-old. As, and as we can see, with increasing age, the um, accuracy increases. We also looked at two different um large language models to give us the descriptions for um five different uh, i i show here the five different characters and uh, as we can see the the descriptions of chat gpt is better than vicuna the the difference between the characters is also higher in this case but uh, one advantage of using vicuna is that it is free and um, we can also uh, get more information from the model than just the sentence itself. Some um, qualitative results. For a two-year-old, we asked it uh, to describe a class from, a CUB, from the CUB dataset, Field Sparrow, and from the Stanford CARS dataset. These are example images for you to uh, verify whether the generated um, description is, is relevant. So the, a two-year-old says, for this image, it's a bird that chirps and flies in the sky. It has feathers and little wings. I like to watch it. It sounds quite a bit like a four, how a two-year-old talks. Then a four-year-old says, a birdie that's brown and kind of small it likes to hop hop on the ground and tweets a pretty song it has a funny name but it's really cute maybe we can see one on a walk in the park with mommy i find these um, descriptions very interesting because um, these are um, these come very close to how uh, what kind of properties these characters a four-year-old for example finds interesting and talks about then a seven-year-old already starts talking about the surrounding like fields forests and grasslands it gives more um, um more it we see that the vocabulary improves increases in terms of diversity um and then it talks about not, not only the visual properties, but also sound, for example, which may be very in, important for this, um, uh, for distinguishing these uh, birds from other birds. And uh, the, these observations carry on in uh, for the Stanford CARS dataset as well. With a 13 year old, now the sentences get more and more uh, complex, complicated. And with a 20 year old, both the sentences get longer. And also, it talks about other properties, like, for example, um, a 20 year old says, Field Sparrow uh, lives in open woodlands across much of eastern North America. And uh, this is, in fact, correct. 
Um, so evaluating large language models and vision language models in terms of impersonation for um, uh, for young people is very interesting. It is, uh, but it is still a proof proof of concept that we we only show that this uh, per impersonation is um, is possible. Now we also wanted to um, run other experiments where we try to verify if. Um, for example, an ornithologist that talks about birds would perform better than a car mechanic that talks about birds. And uh, we see that in uh, in both cases, this holds. And for ChatGPT, this um, the difference is higher. In terms of Stanford cars, an ornithologist performs worse than a car mechanic in um, much worse in, in both cases for both for Vicuna and ChatGPT. And this is very interesting, it may be intuitive. I would like to show more results on BIRDS dataset, uh, but we have the complete results in the paper. Uh, we also evaluated if these language models have biases. We, when we asked the large language model to impersonate a man, or a woman and describe birds. We saw that the uh, woman character describes birds with, with better accuracy. Whereas the man character described cars with more accuracy. We saw that large language model that is asked to impersonate a black person describes birds with less accuracy with lower accuracy than a white person, which is also interesting. That shows some uh, some biases that we can extract from the model. As a conclusion, considering the user's perspective is important to establish a good communication channel with the machines. I think uh, inherently, uh, as we are going to be the users of these uh, machines, it is important that we um expect them to talk to us the way we talk to each other the way we explain in different terms uh, the concepts to each other also considering the user's perspective can help us understand the model's behaviors better and it allows us to improve in context learning abilities of large language models Now I would like to talk about summer, uh, a summary and some future research possibilities. I, uh, I mentioned that explanation and learning are related in the very beginning when I com uh, co compared two different alien species with using language. Then um, I discussed that learning with basic simple contrastive elements of understanding is important. We did explanation via visual and textual abstraction. Then um, I showed that developing explainable deep models is important for user acceptance. So the understanding the mental model of the user is um, necessary to be able to communicate, in fact, with, with the user. Now in the future, in which ways could these uh, models help us? In, for example, medical scenarios, if I'm if the user is a uh, is the patient, she might ask, am I healthy? The model should be able to say, uh, look at the image, look at these regions in the image, the green regions show enlarged veins, so there's a possibility that this indicates diabetes. Of course, communicating possibilities is a uh, research field of its own, and it is certainly not easy to uh, communicate uncertainty, but this is very important in uh, communication, especially in medical scenarios. Then the user could be a general practitioner who might uh, ask more questions, more detailed questions like what is the diagnosis? And the model should be able to say the patient has a superficial traumatic corneal abrasion. This, um, the vocabulary changes and gets adapted to the user. Then the ophthalmologist might wonder what causes it, and then the model needs to be able to say 
because of increased tearing and lack of epithelium in the cornea. All these um, properties can be verifiable by the experts, of course, should be verifiable. Then the user might be a young person who is wondering what is, a gra what is gravity, and this could be used in educational purposes. And the model then needs to understand that it is talking to a child and uh, needs to talk to the child in the way, for example, the teacher of the child talks to the teacher, so yeah, talks to the child. Then maybe um, I go to a restaurant, I try an interesting dish, and I take a picture of it and I wonder what, what is the ingredients and how can I make this uh, dish? Then uh, maybe this becomes relevant in terms of ecology, um, like to determine loss of vegetation due to global warming or something, then uh, I can take a picture of the plants that seem to be damaged and ask the model to tell me what is wrong with it and what can I do for remedying that. Uh, at this point, I have come to the end of my talk. I would like to thank you for your attention. All right. Well, she's not she's not live, but we can clap still. <laughs> um, anyway, so I'll um, you know, Professor Alan Yule, he will be in person at 2.15 again. So we're taking a recess for lunch. And then there will be Renjai Krishna, Siwa Liu, uh, who will also be giving talks in person. So in the talk, in the afternoon, all the talks will be in person. All right, thank you. Thank you. Anything that uh, Apple technical support tells you because I had a problem with my iPhone, it turned into an incredible problem with my iPhone due to Apple technical support. So I am being recorded. Good. I hope Apple hears that. Um, okay, so I'm talking about big language models from the perspective analysis by synthesis. And I guess I'll say more about what that is later, because I'm not sure it is a standard term in technology. Uh, so I have some introductory comments on it. Then I'll, I've got three parts, which I'm not sure I'll get to based on how much I can get to in my previous talks today. Uh, attacking text guide and diffusion models, combining them with computer graphics. And then um, another thing about modularity. So I went... If I'm talking about large language models and vision, I'm basically calling these diffusion models because they're the ones that I've been exposed to most. There are many other versions of them. I'm by no means an expert. We have been working in certain aspects. So this is where uh, so, uh, I'm going to talk about. So diffusion models seem to be human and can create really amazing images. And there seems to be many really exciting ways of exploiting them for computer vision problems. So I'm Lots of interesting works, things from Oxford, from some other places, which I think are really imaginative. Um, so they're able to create images. This, I frankly, I don't care about so much, except with caveats, uh, because I'm computer vision. I think we ought to be interpreting images, but I'm saying lots of people seem to be finding clever ways to use, take advantage of this. So now my perspective is analysis by synthesis, a very old idea in computer vision. I think a very, you know, quite a long way out of fashion, I think, uh, here, even despite a lot of interest in, so in generative models of images. If people think of generative models of images, people usually think of a style GANs or a diffusion model or something like that. And, but that's not what I think of them as. Okay, what I want for a generative model of an image is something to give me a probability of the image given W, where W is not just a set of latent variables or even some text encoded in some sort of high level embedded feature space. It is a description of the world that you're looking at. The sort of description that a computer graphics model 
would be using if you are using it to render it. All the objects, where they are in the image, the 3D structure and things like that. So this, for me, as a very long-term believer analysis by synthesis, is what I'd like to have. If you have that, then the big idea of analysis by synthesis is you can solve vision inversely by taking the probability of generating the image, some prior probability about the state of the world, applying Bayes' theorem, and getting the probability of the world given the image. This has been talked about for about 40 years or 50 years, or you know, even longer than I've been working in vision. Conceptually, it's really nice. Technically, it's incredibly difficult um, for reasons uh, you know, which may be apparent. First, you have to get really good generative models of this, of the image given the W, given the state of the world. It may be possible to do this using combinations of the computer graphics expertise and together with all these big data things and diffusion models. That's, for me, quite exciting. Even if you do that, then to do the inverse is a really huge problem. Naively, you have to take an image and you have to search over all possible world states that could have generated it. And, you know, nobody's got time to do that. So that's another issue. I'm not going to really talk much about that here. I'm more, you know, I'm going to focus a bit on more are these models, to what extent can these models make probability of images given world states, not just given text prompts? Okay, I have to do this, and then how do I get to the next thing? I press that, but uh, just let me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So here are my initial thoughts. I mean, what is that complex and hard to understand? Uh, you know, so me as you know, maybe as as an ex physicist, I don't like models I can't understand. Um, Partly because if they make mistakes, then it's very hard to know what mistakes they make. It's very hard to correct them. Okay, I want model, you know. Um, so my analysis by synthesis says, okay, we could, you know, we could, or at least it's attractive to solve uh, vision by inverting the models to estimate the world states. But if I take the current diffusion models, they're conditioned. You know, well, they're not exactly conditioned on this, but they maybe are effectively conditioned on text prompts. That's okay. That's the starting point, but that's a long way away from the types of full descriptions you'd like to have about an image. It doesn't tell you the object boundaries or anything like that. So that's the limitation of them. A cognitive science perspective on this that may or may not matter for you is that I generally believe that the only, well, I think the only vision system that actually can work well is our own human vision systems, our own human system systems can do amazing things, um, but we learn them during a five, six, seven, eight year development process as small children, where we not only look at images, we touch them, we see them in video streams, we get told names by our parents, we interact with them, we drop things, we touch them, we taste them, and that's far more information than you're getting with a take of diffusion model. You're certainly you're getting millions and millions or billions and billions of images by now. I don't know. And you're also getting text descriptions, but that's far less information that a, than a, a child gets, I would say. So I sort of feel like, okay, they can't do everything because uh, you know they're not given enough information about the world in order to do this. That may or may not be completely wrong. Possibly having huge amounts of data sets and then put a computer power means you don't need to deal with that sort of issue and what i'm intentionally talking about here is sort of world building building a model of the world this is what infants children would do this is what we do we have concepts of objects around in the world and we move around in them we know properties about them etc and if anyone has heard josh tenenbaum talks on the subject i'm completely on the side of tenenbaum um well certainly about how humans do it and probably how ai ought to do it to really make process so is vision language enough by itself? And I would say key elements include representation, compositionality, abstraction, et cetera, are missing in the models now. Um, okay, so the next thing is I do this and then do that. Okay, so part one is uh, very recent work by my group 
And I'll just mention that to say that if you have a diffusion model, or actually the same thing applies to style GANs, we did it for style GANs first, is if it's a really good generative model, um, it should be able to, you know, whatever, whatever latent variables and things you put in, it also generate a good image and it also generate the image you want. If you have a computer graphics model and says, I want to generate an image of a cat with a dog, it's going to generate an image with a cat and a dog all the time. Maybe it's not going to be a very nicely rendered image or something at the moment, but it will give you what you want. Okay, so these models are different, however. You can generate images using prompts, and there will be latent variables involved as well. And so the idea is, can you attack these models so that when you ask it to generate an image of a cat with a dog, it generates, it does something completely different due to making changes, due to attacking either the sort of the latent variables in the model or the, or, or the sort of text embeddings of the model. Attacking the text embeddings, not so much that you're sort of changing it from a cat and a dog to a horse and a camel, but you're changing it to a cat and a dog, uh, you know, with a cookie. <laughs> some small change like that, for example. And the answer is you can. Now, how do you detect these things? You, it's hard to detect them directly because, you know, what is the metric for saying a successful attack? The metric at the moment is really human judgment. You look at the image, there ought to be a cat and a dog, there aren't. Now that is a metric, but it's not one that you can train the deep network on. So the strategy was to come up with a surrogate method metric. And the surrogate method was how well could current deep networks classify, you know, perform these images? Could it detect a cat in the image and a dog in the image, you know, if that's what you ask for? Okay, now you know that sort of, in a way, is attacking surrogate models. And so certainly classification algorithms can make mistakes, as we all know. And certainly for this process, you have to make the, clara, the classification algorithm strong. You have to make them robust. You have to make them domain dependent in various ways. So they're very, fairly strong classification models. And then can you attack those by changing latent variables or by changing the, um, you know, or by changing the embeddings slightly? That doesn't mean that itself, if you've done an attack like that, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily attacked the diffusion model generated process itself. It may just be a successful attack on the classifiers, but then you can get humans to look at it. So this is a way of making attacks on the surrogate. Some of them will just be the fact that, you know, these are problems with the surrogate, the classifiers, but some of it will be, okay, you're generally making images that are not doing what the deep network wants to do. I think with the numbers involved, oh, hold on. The cursor went to the other window. It went to the other window. Oh. Okay, we should be good. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so with the way we did it by, you know, making these classifiers of things robust in various ways of the, uh, you know, of the images that get through as successful attacks, 80% of them are failures of the generative model, and 20% are failures of the classifiers, which is not so interesting. But, you know, this is, uh, you know, this, that's quite a lot. Um, otherwise, um, hang on. Can I just move on? What do I do next? Okay. So here is a bit of the background. So here I go into nice slides prepared by my students rather than ugly slides prepared by myself. Uh, but here's, you know, here, you know, there's sort of, you know, what I'm saying isn't entirely new as nothing ever is. Uh, you know, there have been certain ways of doing attacks uh, before, or well, not quite attacks, I'd say, but finding failure modes of algorithms before. So you can give these images certain types of gibberish and the algorithms will output something that's not consistent. Okay. In some ways, this is possibly okay, maybe a good thing, you know, this is trying to generate these things. Nobody knows what this is because it doesn't exist, but it could well be a name of a bird, you know, it's possible, uh, you know, eating this, I think that doesn't exist either, but, you know, it's possible. And so you could argue that these, that sort of failure may actually be a good property of the diffusion metrics, that the embedding model 
sees these words and thinks that they are a bird or something like that. Yeah. But you can also have other examples where you do this and you say it produces these things plus, you know, a black duck or something, and it just doesn't do the black duck at all. Okay. Other methods over here, so from, I think, the Harvard group, is you, you try and generate with a pump, the teacup, and the cylinder, and you find a lot of the examples are not, you know, they could have teapots, but they don't have them on the cylinders. But for this sort of work, it's not sort of, you know, you're not doing this automatically. You are just prompting it, seeing what comes out, and then asking humans to look at it. And so what we were trying, what we're doing is um, is is uh, further that you want to do the um, want to do this by automatically uh, generating the images, finding the bad cases you think, and then checking them. Right. So this is perhaps more effective way of studying it. Ah, uh, damn. Um, damn. There's no way to do it with this. Sorry, I'm just. Sorry, at my age, I'm just so okay. familiar with doing things just a in a certain way with old-fashioned, simple ways. Is of that clicks. where you want to go? Yeah. Okay, so... Well, actually, I'd like to go backwards there. Can I just click on this? Will that do it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, here was sort of a tax. This is to attack on the text input itself. Now, text is words here. You can't attack it, so there was a clever trick that Pihau came up with, which is sort of somehow gated, graded, guided so essentially you attack the text by going into the embedded feature space and attacking it and then if you do that you can uh generate photo of cat the one on the left and the dog okay this is the success thing where it works and this is the failure case and you can get the algorithm to do this very easily uh automatically by adjusting the feature vectors in the in the space here you want to have photo of a cat's paws a nice sort of relaxing image here. This is what you ought to be getting and you get some of the time, but you can also get these types of things uh, uh, and so on like this. You can do a photo of a cat type will help children in Nigeria. Well, this is a photo of a cat, whether it helps children in Nigeria or not, you don't really know, but it's certainly plausible. This one is in fact looks like a child in Nigeria typing, but has nothing to do with a photo of a cat, for example. Um, you can go into the latent space um, of diffusion models, and so you can get it to generate an image that's very distorted. Okay, this is a cat. You want to generate a cat? You just play around with the latent variables a little, um, you know, by you know, similar to the way you attack adversary attacks on image classification, and you get it to generate stuff like that. Okay. So perturbations of the latent space will start producing stuff that's really, um, you know, quite unrealistic. And again, if you think about it, a computer graphics model would never do anything like this. In previous work, my group did some attacks on images generated by computer graphics model, but it never crossed our mind that this might actually be causing mistakes in the computer graphics models, because it obviously it wasn't. You know, the mistakes were all due to the, you know, were all simply the classifiers based on the models. So, a computer graphics model, no way that it could do that. But these models can do it if you look for the latent, latent variables. Uh, okay. Well, then, you know, that's just saying you can change the latent variables a bit and they generate something that's simply not. You know, a distort, very a distorted image of a cat that's so distorted you don't know it's a cat. But then you can extend it to generating images which are completely unrelated to the text prompts, more or less. I don't think this has got well, maybe not completely unrelated. But this doesn't really have much to do with cats. I think except you know, cats like rugs, and maybe that looks a little like an animal that looks a little bit like a cat. But certainly, these things are not, uh, you know. Enough. Correct. So these types of attacks, and I think there are four, but for reasons of time, I might move over them. Um, you know, okay, you randomly sample the latent variables, find small attacks on the text embeddings, 
which don't affect the main context. So a photo of a car, and maybe you put something extra, a photo of a car, which is sort of like it's blue or something. And then, you know, you're gonna output something like this. So what this to say is that in conjunction, you know, with all the other work, with the previous studies, and I guess people know that you can, by putting in certain fonts, you can get out things that don't look like what you want at all, is that by these methods, you know, you can, uh, you know, you can do this sort of automatically most of the time, 80% of the time, and produce mistakes in them. What does this mean? Well, it means that these things are not well as reliable as computer graphics models, certainly. And why are they not as reliable? Well, we don't know. And that's the problem with some of these, you know, deep networks. They've got you know, some, they somehow got within them a lot of knowledge about the world, which is really amazing. But where is it? We don't know. Very hard to find out where it is. Okay. And so while they're really good at doing these things, they're going to keep on having problems, I think, unless they can be given, um, you know, given that sort of knowledge. Yeah, style GANs, you can do this for style GANs. In fact, we started with style GANs and we thought, hey, nobody's going to care about style GANs these days. Now we've got diffusion models. So <laughs> diffusion models are things we ought to be attacking, right? Uh, so it will work with style GANs as well. Okay. So the summary, right? Um, yeah, this is what we can do. This is sort of a small unpublished uh, you know, way of saying, right, these models have some limitations in them, perhaps tracked the fact we don't know what exactly what they're doing, we don't know what the latent variables are doing, we don't know exactly what the embedding variables will do, and this is a problem. Um, okay, so second part of the talk, again, this is unpublished, um, partly because uh, at least in my lab, people got excited. I'm not sure exactly when people got excited in the fusion of models to start working on them. I guess they, I mean, I guess I know when they got excited enough to come up to me and say, hey, these are really interesting things. And I tell them, okay, no, they're a lot of nonsense. Come and give me a reason why I should pay attention to them. <laughs> you know, right. So that type of discussion. So we've been getting into these rather more recently. So one idea here was, can we improve the diffusion models by giving them what we call 3D geometry control? So again, the core idea here, and the, you know, uh, the idea here is that computer graphics has the ability to generate models. The models are controlled. You know, if a computer graphic generate, you know, you can generate the object from several different viewpoints. You know where the boundary is. You know where the parts are. That's what you have from computer graphics. Now, um, but the models are not as realistic as real images, that's a problem. So can you try and combine them together with the, um, with the with the fusion models to give best of both worlds or something like that, right? And so you can take the, you know, you can try the data which you can use to generate data which are annotations which are hard to get otherwise. So, um, you know, data, computer vision is driven by data sets, right? You know, Fei Fei Li gets Caltech 101 and she gets ImageNet, you know, right? Fei Fei produces lots of wonderful data sets, for example, and other people produce Kitty and many other things like that. And those have big impact on the community and people work on them. So this is all good, but it also encourages people to write, run algorithms on data sets which exist. And that means that we are sort of in a straitjacket in some extent that we only work on data, you know, on problems. We can only publish things on problems which there is a big data set that exists and people take it seriously. So that restricts the set of things that you do in computer vision. This is very different from the good old days when I started when there weren't any data sets and right, you could just write a paper on anything. And if you showed a few nice pictures, people would publish it. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not saying we should go back to those days, but I do think that there's a, you know, that we now we've, we may be moving too far in the direction of wanting to evaluate everything on particular measures. So for example, I'm interested in say, taking objects, images, two-dimensional images and estimating the three-dimensional shape of objects. I mean, other people are too, it's a very useful thing. Automatic car driving companies would like to have this, 
you don't want to detect another car, you want to say what it 3D poses, etc. Okay, but how can we do this? There are not many data sets with that sort of annotated data available. There are some, there's, there's some data set from Stanford, Pascal 3D, 3D uh, Plus, which does that, there are other data sets that we are creating and other people are creating, but it means that research in that area is just slow down because, you know, do you want to work in an area where you have to create the data set and create the algorithm? I mean, you can, but I mean, <laughs> you know what reviewers are going to say about that, or lots of them. Um, okay, so with these sorts of methods, it seems that you can you could use this type of method to generate data with ground truth annotation. This is not really real. This is not real data exactly, but it's not synthetic data accurately. So you might just sort of call it sort of real synthetic data or something like that. And so with this type of approach, there's a possibility to, to, to do that. So annotating 3D geometries of objects is important, but time consuming and challenging. This is what the Stanford people did six or so years ago, and other people do it. You find key points, you do mod mod matching, it's, it's, it's possible. Um, it's not done much. And so number of limited data sets on it, people like cars, et cetera. Um, but you don't just want to do it for cars. Um, so otherwise you can use uh, the synthetic data. So you could use data from uh, computer graphics. So some of their data is very nice, but it's not as rich and it's not as diverse and realistic necessarily as the data in, uh, in you know, the real data that you have here. Okay. It's... Don't blame the computer graphics people. It's not their role to make data sets that are suitable for computer vision researchers, but um, that's a reality. So you can then try to generate images using high quality mesh models, for example. Are you keeping track of time? How am I? Wow, you're, you're still good. You're still good. Okay. Half an hour. Half an hour. Well, you have no 15 more minutes. 15 more minutes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Half an hour seems unlikely. And no, you I don't think people <laughs> people want to sit here. Yeah, no. Okay. no, you are at half an hour. That's okay. Half an hour. Okay. So I go through this. Okay. So you can get high quality computer graphics things. These are expensive. You have certain annotations. But, but, you know, there's really some difficulty of getting these together to do synthetic scenes. I guess if you're Zuckerberg and you have lots of money, you can spend billions of dollars and pay people money to do these things, which I believe they're doing. I don't have no proof, but just hear, the, hear things. <laughs> right. But generally, that's way beyond what we can do as computer vision researchers. So, you know, that's possibly nice. Okay, then we can take game engines. There are some very nice game engines around. You can link into these game engines. You can get data from them. They've got ground truth available. But, you know, this is what the game designers want. It's not, it's, it's rich, it's attractive, but it's uh, limited types of objects. So often, you know, cars on scenes, et cetera. Um, so then what we want to do is, okay, let's see, can we take the uh, computer graphics models, which can generate certain types of images, and then can we make the, them a lot more realistic, exploiting the diffusion, temp, diffusion models? Okay. And so this is the pros. This is what we'd be selling from a shop at the when we completed it. Three three D annotation from synthetic data. Uh, you'd only have to annotate the computer graphics models that you need to do to do that. That's a bit of work, but that's a lot easier than annotating thousands of images, etc. Right, lots of big data. Okay, so. How do we do this? Well, okay, the basic thing is. Um, we we uh, exploit a method that was, I think, Stanford, right? You sort of, uh, you know, there's the, the method where you can render an image based on text, but then you can also put it in so it's, you can throw in an image as well, et cetera. I'm forgetting what the hell is the name of this thing. Uh, control net, control net, sorry. Yeah, complete blank on controller. So you can do that. Okay, so the simple idea is, okay, well, why not? Do control net where the images are generated by a 3D computer graphics model. 
it's a pretty obvious idea, and probably we are guessing that probably other people have thought of it. Maybe there are thousands of papers about this at the moment. Anyway, we don't know. Uh, but in any case, we, this is a worthwhile thing to do. So you generate from these models, they make, you know, from these computer graphics things, the stuff is not very realistic, uh, but you get the edge maps, you can put it in there, you can synthesize it, you can do add in prompts, you can do another more complicated tricks, which you need to look at the paper to see. And you can get data which is pretty um, uh, realistic looking, but with 3D annotations without so much work. Okay. 3D consistent for our knowledge, prompt engineering, stuff like that. Okay. Um, so you can do now start doing forms of controllable data generation using these methods. And, you know, then how good is this data that you've got? So at the moment, we've evaluated in two ways. There's another way, but we haven't written it up yet. The other way is to say, okay, this is 3D data. You could data with 3D ground truth. You can see how well do people estimate, how well can algorithms estimate the 3D pose of objects. Uh, yeah. And if you train on the synthetic data generated here and you test on the limited number of data sets where you can, where you have the 3D pose of objects. This stuff, this stuff works pretty well. It transfers directly, pretty much directly over. I guess it, it I think we've also done, should have done the opposite where we actually go back uh, to see it. And also if you're a computer vision researcher and competitive on benchmarks, certainly I think if you've trained on the synthetic data uh, and trained on some real data, you'll do even better. So, yeah. But so the idea here is like, can we can we sort of exploit the big data stuff of the diffusion nets with the knowledge from the computer graphics models and get data that's realistic enough so that it transfers directly without doing anything else onto the real data where we may not have a lot of where we may not have enough of a lot of annotations because they're too difficult to get. In which case, we could start evaluating algorithms, training algorithms, and then evaluating algorithms on these types of synthetic real data sets which will give us enormous amounts of annotation at a very low price and a lot of variability. Okay, so that's part and part two. So there's a few more experiments on that and yeah, everything else. So this is something we've tried. As we said, it seems an obvious idea, so we wouldn't be surprised if other papers up on that, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a useful idea. If this works out, I think it will be beneficial and generate lots of data sets. So, so now the last talk isn't really about the big models, but modularity, the importance of modularity was mentioned in the talk. So I wanted to put in a plug-in for one of my students who happens to be somewhere in the audience now, um, but I won't embarrass her by pointing to her. So um, a point again about from the analysis per synthesis perspective, but also the idea that really you want algorithms that are understandable and explainable so that you can find the failure modes. And for vision language, if you wanted systems that would do vision language tasks like for UQA, then I'm arguing you would like to have understandable models. Okay, this is against the spirit of a lot of the work done at UQA because a lot of the work done is done on big data sets that Feifei or somebody has come up with with the idea that you train on part of it, you test on the other part. And I think it's becoming pretty clear now, you can get algorithms that can do wonderfully well, trained on one data set and tested on other images, which are similar, they'll do wonderful things, but they will not generalize, they will not be robust to other types of data. So here's an example of PVPR 2022, oh, 2021, sorry, where VQA system is asked, what's the color of the woman's dress? The algorithm says orange, that's correct. You change the tennis ball here into a football or soccer ball. And now the DQA thing says the dress is uh, you know, white. Why? We don't know. This is a deep network. That's part of the point. We have no idea why that happens. This is not a good thing to happen. It would be nice to have objects, you know, to be, have VQA systems or vision systems in general that do not make bizarre mistakes like that. And I think doing this by modularity is good. So here's standard end-to-end -end model vision language. You have lots of features thrown in from everything. You train everything end-to-end. -end. It works wonderfully. 
on data from the same source because that's what it's trained to do, but it's it's not robust to distribution shifts or anything like that. You can have dual modular methods originally coming from uh, Andreas and uh, Trevor Dowell and people like that, and then the MIT people went very still way. You take the image models, you, you know, you, you have the text, the text calls certain vision models, modules which do certain things, like detect if there's a cat in the image and is the cat green or blue or something like that, you know, very interpretable and understandable. Uh, a paradox is that the neural modular methods do very well on synthetic data, and you can even investigate their interior workings and see that they're actually doing the right thing at each stage. They're doing the latent variables are saying that they're actually correct every part of the way. On the other hand, uh, if you run them on complex real images, they don't do as well as these. Okay, so there are ways to address that, um, which I'm actually not going to talk about. Um, uh, they can be improved. So in Lee et al. Calibrating concepts, ICP 2021 showed you can make the, you know, the neuro, these neural modular methods a lot better. Not quite as good as the top level ones, but, you know, so they're sort of at least on a reasonably bound. But then to address the modularity more, okay, what's the, you know, what is the problems of vision? And the problems of vision, well, I think one of the problems of vision is we test our models on data that are very similar to data we've been trained on. And that causes lack of robustness to the world, but lack of generalization. And if I talk to ex-students of mine who are in AI companies, which who are trying to make real world systems, I'll say that's a big issue for them. And then we agree it's a paradox that academic researchers who ought to be solving that, facing that problem are not. Too many people are just sort of trying to test, you know, giving the same test train paradigm we've been using for 10 years. It's been good. We've got a lot of progress from it, but we ought to be retiring it and moving on. You know, like if the company is doing it and we're not doing it, you know, what are we doing? Right. So, okay. So, yeah, interpretable things like that. If they work less, the gap can be decreased. So, okay. So now, um, oh, hang on. That's the wrong direction. So, okay. Now, okay. So here was created. This was in this conference. Yeah, in this conference. Okay, so you can see this more in this conference, uh, and I'll really skip over it because of the details, is that you can make a synthetic data set which is not as real as the real synthetic stuff I said before, because frankly, when we made this data set, we didn't think of diffusion models, and if we did it now, we'd make it better, and probably we, we will do that over the summer. And so you can make data sets that were better than the original synthetic data that people were working on, which was um, uh, yeah, clever, uh, another nice data set from Pepe, which was good, but then that got saturated, right, so you can make super clever. And as I say, you can probably make super, super clever by throwing the diffusion stuff at it, right. And then from this data set, you can test things like ability to generalize from one domain to another, because you've got control over the data, you can train the algorithms on some data, data, you know, one distribution of the set of objects and things like that. You can test them on another set of data, which has, comes from a different distribution because you're creating the, this data set. You are the master or the mistress of this universe. And, you know, you can make wonderful things like that. Okay. So if you do that, um, and here are the types of changes done, but I will rather gloss over that because of reasons of time. You can change that and then you can say, okay, you can adjust it. Will algorithms work well? You can take standard state-of-the-art models. Um, some of them will work a bit better than the others, but they will not generalize well. Why? Well, so, you know, uh, people, reviewers asked us that and basically, we, you know, I said the honest answer is we have no idea why these models don't generalize because they're deep nets, we don't understand what they're doing. If they're modular networks, if they don't work, we at least know what they're doing and why they're not doing it, which helps. So then having created this super clever data set, you can show lots of models that are wonderful on outside data sets do not work because they are not 
generalizing to data they have not seen before. You can go back to the neural modular networks and then you can add one, you know, so initially, at least I thought, okay, the neural modular networks are gonna be very good at these things. And it turns out that they are not good at generalizing except for one situation, which is a situation where the language uh, in the questions is sort of unnecessarily complex. It's got a lot of extra details that you don't care about. They're good at that because they get rid of it. So the neural modular networks originally didn't work <laughs> much better than the others, which we thought was a bit strange. So then finally, I guess we realized that the, that the way to do this was to train the modular networks separately. There's in a network for vision language, there's a vision module, the vision part, there's a language part. If you train them together, you are sort of fitting them more to the data set. If you train them separately, if you change the language part separately, and you train the vision part separately and just combine them together, that works a lot better. That generalizes. There's more technical things here, which you can see in the in the big page here, but it's uh, you know, it, it's taking certain neural modular networks that existed and went from MIT and modifying it in some way, not mainly, and then you could work like that. So the answer here was not just modularity, but perhaps modularity of training and testing. Because otherwise, as a vision researcher who's worked in language, you know, in, in vision language models, frankly, the vision let the language models down. You know, you'd have wonderful language models, and then you'd have a lot of basic uh, bottom-up uh, image net features, and they were not very good descriptions of what was going on. So when you're training the models jointly together, that sort of meant that the language had to compensate from the fact it was getting pretty uninformative information from the images and these image features. And so that meant it fit the data set it was trained on very well, but it didn't generalize to a data set that was different, essentially. At least that's my high level understanding. My students who do the work may say, tell you privately, no, Alan's, you know, oversimplifying, there are other things going on there, but I think high level, this makes sense. So this meant that when could get modularity methods to work pretty well in these cases, it was more details, but there's, there is a full paper on that that Zoe and Lee can talk about in the thing here. And so here, yeah, MIT model modified, putting in probabilities, trained on vision, trained on language separately put together was actually very good, even if you tested it on the IID setting, but it was even, you know, far more robust to the um, to these out of distribution situations, which are important. So, okay, summary, I'm on deadline, sorry. Summary, I think, you know, the last part hasn't been directly related to the big language models, um, but anyway, for myself, I think the big language models really, are, this is really, they're really interesting things. They're not, from my view, they're not sufficient in themselves, but they can be really useful when taken in conjunction with other methods. And, you know, that's so new that they've opened up a whole rich area of research that we haven't even begun to explore. There were limitations from my analysis by synthesis perspective because they are not conditioned enough on the state of the world. That means, among other things, you can attack them and we produced a sort of a novel method there which can find errors in them. Then to try and make them better, you can improve them by sort of giving them more structured models in a way, trying to combine the strength of computer graphics representations with all this huge amounts of big data that, you know, all these big companies have kindly uh, found with us and I guess shared with it. So I think you need more structured models. The models here have sort of modularity naturally, but I think in general, modularity is good anyway for anything involving vision language. I think its values are not haven't been so clear because the way the algorithms have been tested on data where you've been similar to your training. And so this is like, okay, you're teaching for the, you know, students are studying for the test. They do well in this test, but they don't understand the real concepts. And if we test models more complicatedly by testing them out of distribution and things like that, which we can do with certain computer graphics models, as I've been describing, and if one turns them into synthetic real like this, you can do them with even more realistic type of things. I think that will lead to better, uh, better uh, vision algorithms, etc. So that's it. Sorry. Okay, so we're going to take some questions from the audience. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you.
somebody who has a question, please take the mic. So uh, I couldn't stay into the room until the last part of the talk, but uh, just picking up on that modularity um, subtopic, I wanted to ask you what do you think about recent work that has tried to take these pre trained, separately pre trained language models and vision models, put them together, and actually keep them frozen and just train a mapping between the two? Because on the one hand, that's much more computationally efficient, but on the other, well, that certainly got the modular training, I guess, which is good. What I'm not sure about is whether they're the right models to be training anyway. So here there's modularity in the vision language, but I think the critical thing was that the, the setup was so that the, you know, the, lang the vision parts were interpretable and could be modified. And actually, even on this case, I think, and this is hopefully in a, well, I know, follow-up work you can say okay if we take out the vision models we used here we place them by better vision models we can do even better so it was modifying so it's really not just the training but it's sort of taking advantage of the types of models that you have i know there's a tendency of people to do big data foundational models and things like that etc and i have to say i'm not a big fan of that uh at least you know interesting to see how far we go but i think you want to have the structure of the models, even if you're talking of things like transformers, so they are interpretable and so that you can see what their failure modes are. And that was an earlier talk I gave, I don't know, an hour or so ago. At least you can show, you can get them robust to occlusion without doing very much to them, without them knowing what occlusion is. But that is taking the architectures, modifying them in certain ways to do it. So I think you need to do that as well as training the things separately. But yeah. Right. Any more questions? Uh, Any more uh, very critical questions? Yes. Okay. Uh, otherwise, we'll move to the next section because you know we are in the schedule. But uh, yeah, please ask another question. People in the online audience, maybe. Let me check. Which you asked me a really tough question. All right, I don't. I don't see questions. Okay, online, so maybe I can ask a final question. Final question. Myself. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, like, do you think, uh, you know, there if if you know, like, the diffusion models are trained with open data on the web to generate the kind of results that they generate, that by incorporating those results into a, a machine learning model in a more direct way, we wouldn't be in principle, be able to get the same kind of improvements, right? You see what I'm saying? Like, you know, do we need them as a post-processing module that enhances the synthetic data? Uh, like, I'm not quite sure I'm understanding. On, on one level, I'm saying, yeah, I want to use this to get better generative I mean, models, which can right. make huge data sets so we can use. Like, you have a model trained on synthetic data, and you have a Together with all the data, the diffusion model was trained, right? Yeah. Jointly, right? Shouldn't this model, in principle, be able to accomplish the same goal as first train a diffusion model on the data on the web, then use that model to transform your synthetic data into more data, and then train another model, right? Like, what do we need this necessarily this pipeline? Well, I don't know if it's I'm not sure it should really be a pipeline, but I think we need the structured representations that are in the computer graphics synthetic models. I think they have to be got in there somewhere. And I don't think, you know, there were interesting studies on transformer networks. I think Chris Manning did some work on it. You train a, a model on language and it seems that syn syntax sort of partly drops out of it. You know, the fascinating studies like that. It's possibly within these networks that certain of the syntactic structure representations parts and things are in there somewhere and we could find them and i think you with that question i think you'd have to have some methods that could do that otherwise i would say well let's just put them in in some way by doing some form of marriage between them uh and yeah. so why not do that yeah i think some of these things are very hard for these current models the, the current random models to learn like just to come up with this idea of like generative graphics on his own and like knowing 
what they have to do like it, it, yeah i mean it's possible they can but again at my age i've been in many case, situations where something's got a lot of promise it's worked so far and then you say hey but can it do such and such and they say oh yeah next year and then you're still waiting 10 years later yeah. so i mean possible you know i would be surprised i am surprised often <laughs> if somebody does it great i'd be you know and it's provable great I, I i think that would be that would i would eat my words or whatever the expression is but i don't think it's the right direction to go i think there are easier more obvious ways to go and again if i think in terms of human you know, how humans do it which obviously we don't know but you know if i think of what josh tenemann tells me about what humans do it <laughs> i think it's unlikely that that's a, a good strategy to do it you know, you need embodied, you know, you need the systems to interact with the world, move around in the world, do all sorts of things. Right. Yeah. All right. Thank but you anyway. very much. Okay. Thank you. And then our next speaker, Zui Lu from Nanyang Technological University, right? Uh, yeah, you can use it yeah, definitely. You have connector or do you need this one? You need this one? I need this one. Okay. Go ahead. It will, soon, it will make my work easier. Uh, just uh, do you have the Zoom session? No. Julian uh, must have sent you an email. Could you check your email quickly? I'm doing that stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, right like down there, there's like the flux. I will send, yeah. I just I just send you another one. Yeah, Gmail. Yeah, could you yeah. Let me let me look for it again, okay? Okay, I'll, I send you a new one. Could you check? Let me admit you into the room. All right. And you should be able to share. And then, uh, yeah, we're going to do this. Yeah. Maybe I should. No, no. Okay. Yeah, I already lowered the volume there. Okay. So the other thing is you're gonna sure. present this, right? Yeah. And then you're gonna enable. enable. All right. And then you're gonna make sure you share your slides also. This is the slide, right? Yeah. And then you're ready to go. Yeah, that's great. Uh, we can minimize yeah, this. Minimize this one. Yeah, yeah. So you're good. Yeah. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think it's fun. Okay. Uh, I can turn it off. Yeah. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. So it's my great honor to be here, and thanks, uh, Vincent, for inviting me. 
So today my talk title would be Towards Building Practical AI Systems. So I'm Wei, I'm from uh, uh, NTU, Singapore. So I think uh, many of you may have already seen the kind of the release of the Apple Vision Pro, right? So we can imagine if you have this uh, AR set, so what do you do? You want to like need some building some very smart like this AR systems. So here is kind of prototype to find a student, right? So this is a campaign, real campaign back in NTU Singapore, right? So like we want to have this like multi-model chatbot, like how so many people can you find the seats? Then this kind of very smart glass will find a seat for you. It will also try to recognize your like classmates. Right. Then there are several empty seats in the canteen, but at one of the table of your friends. Do you want to join them? It can also give suggestions like give way to an approaching person. Right. If we want to do this kind of multi-modality chatbot, this smart system, so what do we need? So this kind of theme of my talk today, that is the building blocks of this very practical multi-modality AI systems. So the first thing uh, we have built is called this uh, scene graph. That is uh, AI systems with the scene graph. So we have a series of work on 2D images, on 2D videos, and also on the 4D things, this uh, 3D videos. Of course, if we want to do this uh, AI system, we should go beyond this object recognition, right? So everyone work on recognition, detection, but we also want to emphasize on the importance of the relation the complementarities uh, between objects, scenes, and everything around them, right? So, like, what is in the image? So, it's kind of the recognition program, right? Two person, two bench, three and movement. And what happened in the image? So, that should be go beyond this uh, recognition. So, how can we recognize? So, given this image, maybe we want to generate some description like this one, right? So, it's more like image captioning or something like more sophisticated than that. So like a woman and a man that is touch, touching and looking at each other. So the woman is sitting on the bench on the left and the man is sitting on the right bench. So they are in front of many trees, right? So we want to generate this very fine grained uh, description of this image. And actually we can use the thin graph to do it, right? We can use a very fine grained thin graph. Like two persons, the bench, are also the relations between all the person persons object objects and object things. So actually in this program, we go beyond this object recognition. So you can see this in graph, right? So we add some common sense. So common sense is very important for the like practical AI systems. So what are men and women doing? And also what's the relation between them? So that is uh, what SyncGraph trying to do. So what we propose is ask actually a very special form of SyncGraph. It's called a panoplic scene graph. So it's a generalized form of the, like the traditional scene graph. So we're given an image with complex things. We want to output the scene graph as well as a panoplic segments. We want to do the segmentation as well as the relations between all the segments, right? So that's a very fine grained uh, kind of understanding the spatial resonance of the image. So compared to this existing scene graph, we Adding accurate surroundings, because you actually know where the person is. You have the same vision. You also know how the relation happens, because you can like take the units of two segments. You also have this proper class of realities, right? You have different class in the hierarchy, and we are also able to involve background. Perfect graph using bounding box, and bounding box only makes things, not stuff, right? You can't like, capture the relation between things and the background from the staff. So here we have like the three different properties. And of course, with the new data test, we train a model that is able to recognize, predict a PSD is panoramic scene graph. So we have like uh, over 49k images. We have like uh, over 100 object classes with uh, like uh, 56 relation, that is a predicate classes. So here gives some uh, approaches to do this. So building upon these data sets, we have proposed two different methods. The first is the uh, old fashioned two stage methods, right? You can first generate the segments, right? You have some feature map, then you're doing the relation prediction. So it's two stage, fast, simple, easy to use. And it's also what like the professor that Alan you just talked about is a modular design, right? You have different modules, 
because the horde is quite a method, but it heavily rely on the inhibitors. So the small objects, if it's not detected, we can't use it in the following relation reasoning. So that's why we have also proposed this uh, more more than look like one state method. You use transformer the first variant, you just use this uh, triplet queries and also images using like the transformer encoder to like fit in all the information. So it's a uh, very good focus on vision, direct training, but it's uh, need one time to learn. Like it's the converse times long and it's conflict with the penalty set because no segmentation design is inside. So that's why we have also produced this one. It's called the PSG formers. So the object queries are tokens. So the relation queries are also tokens. So everything are tokenized just like the large language models. So you can train them from end to end. So it's a kind of support, a very explicit re relation model, and also this curve matches. But there's one disadvantage is that it's a kind of large models, right? So you need a large GPU to fit these models in for the training. So this is work actually is published in ECCB 2022. So uh, this is actually my uh, students. So the first author is trying to uh, test the model. So it's kind of uh, quite good person in front of like horse or like the different relations who is wearing this fancy bag in the photos can answer this question. And where is the man with fancy bag standing next to that person, right? So you have all these relation reasonings for the things. So my students is over there. So if you have any questions, we can also like discuss with him. So after we dealing with this PSG is still not enough, right? So we only have that image. If we have this very smart AR glass, you have dealing with this temporal things or this dynamic things. So how can we incorporate the videos into the framework of this PSG? It cannot be seen graph. So that's why we have come up with this uh, PVSG. It's called Panopic Scene Graph Generations. So from this one, you can see the get a flavor. We got in some long video. We want to output a panel segmentation of the video as well as all the relations across different frames. So that's why it's called dynamic, right? So different frames, you have different relations. So relations will evolve across time. So it's actually a dynamic scene graph instead of a static scene graph. So you have this different time Frames, right, showing like uh, standing in ground, then forwarding another one, then another one, right? So you have the different relations that will occur and disappear across time for different objects, different persons, different backgrounds. So there's a very comprehensive understanding of this dynamic work of the videos. So here is actually our PBSG datasets. We have also building in this uh, datasets uh, across like 400 videos. It's uh, all long videos and it's uh, multiple perspectives. We include both third person views and first person views. It's egocentric, right? So sometimes you need this third person, sometimes you need also this uh, egocentric. So also we support different like scenes, different settings like boards, like ceremonies, housework, kitchen, parenting, petting, or different things, right? So we have uh, very dense annotations, also has this common sense QA, this question answering. Uh, on this data set. So here it shows uh, one of the examples. So it's a very like complex things that the team is trying to receiving, giving, and unwrapping gifts on holidays, right? You can see this kid is like interacting with the gift, also interacting with his mom, also moving in spatial, right? So this all captured in this PVST, this kind of data set. It can also answer like QA questions in a dense way. Like why did the little boy give the gift to the woman, right? You have to do some reasoning. So our vision community has to move beyond this recognition, detection segmentation to this common sense reasoning as well as this relation recognition. So we have also this kind of ecocentric things. So it's very, very interesting like to do these applications in robotics. Right. Sometimes the robotics and the navigation will use this uh, ecocentric views to get a sense of the surroundings. And so that can be the subsequent planning and actions. Of course, uh, we have building our baseline method. So it's not still so good. So people can still like build on our method to improve, right? So we are also using like a uh, triplet 
but we found that the bottleneck is on the tracking. So the tracking is still the hardest thing in this DSG. So if you're interested, you are actually more than welcome to go to the poster sessions. It's on Thursday mornings. So it's uh, on the West building, uh, ABC 210. And finally, uh, I will talk very briefly about the final, the last extensions of the theory that is a PVSG 4D, right? So the PV PVSG only operates on the 2D videos. You only get what 2D things get. You don't have like get the depth or get this 3D like occlusion, something like that. So we are also building this uh, PFG 4D. So that is the ultimate form of this AI system in a 4D world. So we can take input of this RGBD sequence or the point cloud sequence, and then try to do all the reasonings, not just in 2D, 3D, but also in this 4D world. It's very dynamic reasonings. So we also have both like first person and third person views. So you can see the first one, we have like the person, row, table, beans, barrier, and the actions, relations, looking, talking, holding, working, very diverse data. And also for the first person views, like the locker, board, ground, or the pickup, grab, is very related to the uh, first person, a lot of these robotic equations. So I will skip this part. And we actually have built a uh, real world applications on real robots. We have trained a model as on our PSG4 data set. Then we try to put it into this because it's a very cute little robot on this one. And we try to do some visual dialogue. So I am a service robot in the past 30 seconds. What I captured is something is there anything I could serve. Then you could talk to it, right? You can talk to it. You can do like clean up or like make some reminders to some of the things. So it is a real world applications are built. So it shows the potentials. Okay. So after we building from this PSG, PVSG to PSG 4D, we already have a very comprehensive understanding of this visual world. However, if you want to do all this like human alignment to indeed interactively uh, kind of converse with these robots, what we need to do is going from language models to language systems, or going from multi-model like models to these multi-model systems. So you can see the trend from industrial is from GPT-2, GPT-3, GPT-3.5 to chat GPT. And from this academia open source from BERT, LAMA to Vicuna, and finally to the open systems. So from each step, add some additional capacities, right? So first one is zero shock learning. So you can actually operate in the real world without the training. Then you've got something like in-connect learning. You get a few more examples. You can learn new skills. And finally, you've got this instruction following and human alignment. So that you can like very frequently like converse with our humans without any obstacles, right? So we, if we like take the trend, from this large language model to this large multi-modality models, right? Vision language model. What we see is a similar trend. That is from OpenAI is building Clip, then DeepMind is building Flamingo. And from this open source communities, we have OpenClip and also OpenFlamingo. So OpenClip is zero-shot learning, right? Clip is very good zero-shot learners. And for the OpenFlamingo, it's adding something like the in-context learning. So what will be next? If we follow the trend in the large language model, what we need next is actually something like instruction following and also the human alignment, right? So that's why we build another like large model called Otter. So Otter is a large modality model built by our lab. So before we talk about this Otter, we will first give you a very quick overview of the Flamingo. That is a current state of the art, a large multi-modality models. So to give some like the images and also the languages. So it's actually learned on the interface of images and languages, right? So it's taken some large language model frozen layers, like this LM block, LM block frozen. It's only learned some cross attention, must cross attention here. So it's a building uh, block. So for this one, I may just skip. So this kind of perceiver architecture, we find that it's very powerful, very universal. It can operate on image textiles. So it's a dimensionalities. It can also operate on this video textiles. It can even like operate on this multi-model message set data. That is, you have multiple images, multiple text, right? So it can extend it to videos, 
to 3D, to multiple images, and everything could be on. So this perceiver architecture is pretty uh, impressive. So it can support zero-shot learning, in-context learning, video and study. So that's also shown by the Flamingo. So unfortunately, Flamingo is not open source, right? So it's developed by the DeepMind. So we have uh, tried out some of these Flamingo applications using the open source version that is Open Flamingo. It did quite good, this smart image visual dialogue. So for example, this one, what is the common sense about these images? They are all flamingos. What is the difference between these images, right? So it's, it's pretty subtle, so what difference? So the first one is cartoon, the second one is a real flamingo, the third one is a 3D model. So however, flamingo, indeed, this is a very good large smart metal model, but it does not equal to this smart model systems because you can see this one, it does not follow your human instructions. So open Flamingo is only trained to complement uh, the next reasonable sentence, just like large language model, just like GPT, it tries to predict the next word. It didn't ensure or guarantee any human like instruction following. So that's why we tries to build another data set that is enable this instruction following. So open Flamingo or Flamingo is training on this MMC4. So MMC4 is something like this one. You have sentence, you have image, you have sentence, you have image. So the training objective is to masking out something that tries to predict your next sentence or your next image or something like that, right? But it didn't have this instruction following scenarios. So that's why we are building this uh, mimicking. So from MMC4, you can get Open Flamingo. So Open Flamingo is very good zero shot learners, some like capacity of income learning. So we built another thing, very large scale data set called Mimicate. It's called Volume Model in Cut Instruction Tuning. We can get our author. So here we just show you some of the capacities from author. So it's kind of enable instruction following, stronger in cut learning capabilities, fine grained understanding. It can support very subtle difference between images and also visual reasoning and even planning. So I think I will just skip this part. So it's uh, similar to the Flamingo. So our data sets consists of like the perception part, the reason part, and also planning part, right? So for the details, we can check our papers. So maybe I will also skip this one. Our current one is also support this uh, multi-linguistic. We support eight different languages and also support like multi-model in context. So for the generation process is actually uh, very important. You have to be very careful. So uh, for this part, I think due to time, I may also want to just skip this one, right? So for this uh, data generation process, you actually have to carefully design the system message and also the in-context samples. So if you don't design this too, your models will kind of didn't converge quite well or didn't like have the ability to follow human alignment. And we also collect different source data and add the corresponding annotations. That is the instruction and responses. So here is actually our data engines to do all this, uh, create the high quality instruction response tells and doing the filtering and finally doing the translation to eight different languages. So for this one, it's kind of, uh, talk video, right? So our queries, we have to doing all these time steps so that our models can also reasoning across time, right? So sentence like we see a hallway with wooden, a wooden floor or a dog in socks, work slowly out into the floor as a lady feels them, right? So then we also transform it into the GPT response. There's a form of a GPT response like question answer, question answering, right? So we have to convert all this fine green information into this multi hop conversation, the, fo the form of multi hop for conversations. So here is some of the examples, like what factors contribute to the impressive performance of the dog of the image. So we have different of the in-context examples. So in-context examples, just a sample to show to the model so that the model can learn the abilities in just two or three images. So like what purpose does this uh, large teddy bear just the center serve in these settings? So you have the pitch, like the large, like the teddy bear just the center serve the purpose of attracting and turning only shoppers. 
we can also spot the difference between these two. So we believe that actually a very important aspect of the vision language models actually lies the spot difference. So once it learns the spot difference between two images, it actually tries to recognize all the tiny parts and also try to recognize different relations of the images. So it's kind of uh, enables the model to learn more fine-grained representations. And this one is more subtle, right? So what are the new vehicles that appear in the second image? So it's quite hard, even for humans, right? So there are two new vehicles in the second image, the silver hatchback and the white center uh, on the road. We can also support like dance captioning, the TV captions, right? So TV like enables the reasonings. How does the female character respond to the male character while he's talking to her? So here it gives some response. As well as this uh, visual storytelling, right? We have multiple images. So how did the set students uh, advocate for immigration reform policies during the ceremony? So we have to do a very detailed response to this one, right? So you can see it's a quite detailed response. So students who participated in the national dream graduation ceremony. So there's a dream here, right? So you have to also do some OCR to recognize the text inside the images to by fully addressing question a tell and rallying together to show the support for the dream act. So you, you will see the response that actually fully kind of tries to describe all the images to every details, to every details. And like the indoor event planning, like can you suggest any recreation pursuits that can be enjoyed within this room? So it's created using a 3D data set. You have this 3D room. So how can you do with this 3D room? Can you give some suggestions? So it's very important for like AR, VR, and also robotics. So like the rooms, it could be have enough space to set up a home grooming station. But you might need to rearrange some furniture to create more space. Right, so this kind of task need a spatial reasoning, need a 3D spatial reasoning of the room. So you can see that our like this instruction following this data sets has covering a wide range of different tasks of your like the daily life. Finally, it's the eco sense, ecocentric visual understanding. Right, so it is safe to work on the floor while the woman is cleaning. So based on what I see, it's best to avoid working on the floor because something. Right, so it has the reasoning abilities. You have to not just say the answers, but also your logic flows. It's like the chain of thoughts inside all this instruction and following and, and this uh, response is plans. Of course, we have seen this kind of author also have the abilities beyond this uh, kind of just describe something like this uh, OCR. So what's written in this image is kind of Pepsi, is Pepsi okay? And what's written on this image is Subway, is fresh. So without training on the OCR, it implicitly learned to spot the text inside the images. Okay, so after talking about all of these uh, very interesting, like the, <laughs> like the videos, so here we also create another one that's called the fun QA, that is a surprising video extending. So now, like many of the QA data sets, especially the video created set, is already saturated. Is in this academia, right? So sometimes you only need like the one of the single frame and using some competition of vision model, language model can do quite well. So how, however we find that for these uh, fun videos. So a human will find is quite like some humors inside it. So the machines is very hard to do it. So that's why we create this fun QA as another benchmark for these vision language models. You can find this one is one of the examples in our data sets. So task is actually try to locate the amusing part of the video, right? So humans, we can easily know like which part is, uh, is, is the amusing part, right? But for this uh, machines, it's quite hard. You can jump to, and it also have to give a detailed count of the video's funny moments. So why this video is fun? Right. So the person next to them is unable to open the bottle of tomato sauce. And in the attempt to open it, they accidentally fill in the bottle, causing the tomato sauce to spill over a man's body and face. And why is the video as a whole is a comedic, right? So you can see it has all the logic flows behind this kind of the fun videos. So you have to recognize all of them. 
And also cap price very brief. So here's another fine videos. So I think this data set is just about this, uh, all about this uh, very fine videos. So also pinpoint the humorous segments of the videos, elaborates the building movement, that is try to let our machines to learn so why some videos are quite fun, right? So we kind of categorize into three different groups. The first is uh, called like humor QA, another is called creative QA, third is called match QA. So we try to support four different tasks. The first is a counterintuitive time step localization task. The, the second is a counterintuitive reason task. The third is a kind of dense captioning or detailed description task. The fourth is the higher level task. So for each of the QA, we have a lot of like the videos to support the task. So by training our previous introduced this author model on this fun QA data set, you can see that it can, can do quite well, right? So describe this chromatic thing in the video. It can do quite well. However, can you explain why the e-content is humorous? So it fails. That shows that current state-of-the-art vision language model still can't do good on this kind of fun video and study or try to understand the deeper, deeper meanings of the video, right? So I think that's another uh, very important directions for our communities to go. So here shows some of the results for the different other models like this uh, video chat GPT, the video chat or the app plan for our author. You can see that the precision is still quite low, even for this uh, detailed like the QA task. So author scans significantly improve after training on the QA training set, but still quite challenging. That calls for more, more efforts from the communities to try to do like this deeper video uh, understanding or dynamic understanding. So finally, our large model, this uh, author, you, it has some direct demos. You can try it out. We have uh, video demos. You can input some images. You can do some like conversations, chat with it. It also has uh, image versions, right? You can upload some image. You can try to interact with our author 7 billion uh, this, uh, model. So actually we have to have done some live demos. So this is today, these are all my friends, all my students. So they are participating in this uh, CPR. So like if we upload these videos to this author model, we can do some compositions. Like what can you see in the video? So the answers, the video features, a blurry background, a group of people working up an escalator. So one man in a blue shirt, is standing on the top of the escalators holding a cell phone, right? That's correct. Well, another man in glass is standing next to him. Another person in black shirt works up the escalator behind them. So are they happy? Yes, they appear to be happy as they are smelling. So it's kind of recognized emotions and enjoying their time together as more. But this one is not correct, right? So it's kind of recognized this convention center as more. So we can actually correct this chatbot. So okay, but they're not in the more, but in a convention center. So can you guess why they're happy, right? So it's kind of a reason task instead of just a recognition task. So they're happy to be at the convention center, which says that they may be attending or participating in an event taking place at the center. That's good. So it makes sense. What suggestions can you make to these guys as they are on the escalators? So I'm not, sure, uh, I'm not certain about these uh, specific suggestions that can be made, but it is always important to maintain a safe distance. But so working up or down on escalators to ensure safety, right? You can see that you can follow human instructions quite good. So that's, uh, you can try by yourself. So we have the interactive demos uh, online. So actually all our data sets, all our models are already like open source on GitHub, also on this hugging phase. So let's build author together. So, or you can your own like multi-model modality models through our effort of this uh, mimicking, this multi-model in, con in context instruction tuning. Uh, finally, I want to thank uh, my friends, so this author team, so they made all of these works uh, happen. Okay, thank you all. That's uh, the end of my talk. Or yeah, you can maybe stand here. Yeah. Good, that's it. Thanks for the help.
how do we have a little bit kind of open ended system that like really gets a lot of non history? Yeah. How do you have a little yeah, so your question is like, how do we kind of uh, build a system that can take these long stories, right? Yes, uh, you have a reviewer and you get a long story that takes a lot of things that was removed of the reviewer. Um, how do you have a look at that? Do you need to build a system that takes a lot of things that was removed of the reviewer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I think it's a very good question. So the first, uh, I think the first point is actually the current like academia, I didn't like uh, doing this uh, long form or long like story like videos quite good. So current models, they have a kind of limits on your input tokens. So like for, even for like GPT like models, they can't take these long tokens inside, right? So uh, we have two improvements. The first is that uh, we have modified model bits so that we can like take longer like inputs. I think the second one is more important that is on the data side. So from the PSG, like the PVSG or the PSG 40 to this mimic it, we have curated very high quality videos. And all the videos are very dense videos that is inside 10 or 20 seconds. It already have very complex interactions, the stories inside it. You can learn from this data so it can excel at this task. Um, my question yeah. is more about the evaluation. What evaluation framework are you using? And so you saw the numbers about like 200. Mm -hmm. Do you have more quality in terms of how it's performing? You mean like quant quantitative things? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we have like the quantitative things. So for the fun QA, so it's just the very like long videos involving some of the stories, like the fun part or something like that. So we have uh, designed some metrics inside it. So we have indicated that current large model models is not good enough, right? So even though we can like fine tuning on these long videos, we can fine tune on them, but still the gap is still large. So our like the community still needs efforts to fill in the gaps. Sorry, but uh, mm -hmm. maybe this is yeah. But my question is more specifically: How can I evaluate this kind of long text generation system? Mm -hmm. Because in your standard video system, you have they ask the questions, you get it there. What is the color of the shirt? It's blue. Yeah. Then I know in the reference there is only blue or some color, so I can make this string match it. But in this case, you have a long text. Uh, how do you like evaluate that? Is it automatically evaluated by some you know, automatic generation system or is it human evaluation? Yeah, so there are actually two ways. The first way is what I have explained. We have some metric, so we have some annotations, like uh, what is inside, what is the time frame durations from frame 20 to frame 40. We have these very objective things inside. We also have another like evaluation. It's more subjective. We, it's something like the arena using large language models, you can compare two models. You give the same inputs, then you try to check with them. Then you have some human evaluators to, to choose which one's better, A or B. Then we aggregate so like some of the responses, we got the subject test. So we have two like different aspects of evaluation. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah. You're saying we focus too much on recognition and detection and community. We need to focus more on relationships and reasoning. Um, now we've got these really big language models which can do reasoning for short text. Yeah. To what extent can we solve this problem by just doing pure recognition and detection and then feeding those to a language model that can do the reasoning for us? So, for example, the convention center example you gave, once we've told the model that we write a convention center, then all the following reasoning can be just the text only. So convention centers involve you know, presenting or security testing or the random person experience. To what extent is the business community focused in relation with the business community? Yeah, I think it's a very interesting question. So I think uh, also there are some works that are trying to just using large language models and try to fit in all these visual signals, like the bounding box, like a segment, tries to convert them into the form, like the large language models can understand. Then use the large language model to do the reasoning, to the understanding. I think that's, that's definitely one way. I think a lot of people tries to leverage the power of large language models. So another way is more from this end-to-end -end point of view. So our visual world is inherently multimodality. We have like the visual inputs, we have the 3D depths, we have the audios, we sometimes even have the touch, right? So how can we fuse all these modalities together so that our, our like the ultimate model can learn the connections 
also can extract relations reasoning behind them. That's more like from my perspective, it's more attractive. I think the third reason is like that the current large language model will be bounded by the existing like available text on the internet. So I remember that's one paper said that our like text data will be used up within two or three years, according to the current speed. So how about all the text, all the languages, all the books on earth have been used up to train a large language model? So how can we get additional knowledge? So I think we can get additional knowledge just from this smart multi sensor data. That's more like from the natural, like this visual inputs. So that's my understanding. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the remote. And uh, I have a question about the front tray. Yeah. So, um, I was wondering that the, uh, the front tray is like proposed from new data set or some you know, like just like for privacy people? Yeah, so it's actually a work we have already done, but it's haven't published yet. So we have actually building a data set as well as several new tasks, like try to locate the fun parts to explain the fun part or something like that. So we actually find it very hard for current model to do well. So that's why we also want to do it. Uh, another, uh, another reason is that we find that uh, when we're building the author model, the mimic it. So we find that it lacks this chain of thoughts. So for like large language model, it can pre-train on the code, on GitHub code. So it can learn to do this lesson step by step. But for the vision language model, or for these multi model models, so if we just learn from like image text files, it didn't involve this multi-hop reasonings. So that's, what, that's why I want to like include this function. Yeah. So uh, we have submitted to another venue, actually. Yeah, so it's not really yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the question is like, how do you abstract this kind of structure of human data frame? Um, so do you just have humans annotate it, or do you have some automatic way to visualize the data frame? Yeah, it's actually a semi-automatic way because if you want to hire a lot of entities to do it, it will be not scalable, right? Yeah, right. So we actually, uh, I think I have skipped that part in the slides. We have some design system templates. Then we actually query the GPT-4 to get some of the answers. And then we have our human annotators to do the filtering, to filter out this uh, kind of unreasonable like responses and doing some refinements. So this is more like a semi-automatic pipeline. Yeah. Uh, sorry, second question. So in the first part of your talk, uh, you mentioned about building a mouse uh, graph. Yeah. So what do you think uh, the, the role of thin graph is going to play in your first part or in your, your second part of your work? Yeah. Could you that in this? Right, right. So actually the thin graph for the second part is more like how to build the data sets. So sometimes for uh, image, if you want to build in some dense descriptions, you have been follow some of the rules. So actually we follow the rules of the thin graph how to describe all the entities and all the relations between the entities so that we have a more comprehensive views of the things. Of course, the thing graph itself is a task, but for the second part, it's more like generating the data. Yeah. So that's how, that's part of the process of doing it. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Well, I have a question about more that is what I'm wondering if a baby or all you yeah, so I think our author already supports 3D. So we already support 3D input. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So I think we have uh, briefly talked about the architectures. It's called Perceiver. So this is some structured data that 3D textual and structured Yeah, right, right. We have class some 3D data with instructions and different modalities of data, dimensions, right? So you can just do this uh, NTHWC. You have to do the proper arrangement. Like right? for 3D, you have to insert another dimensions there. And for audio, sometimes you have to modify the, these kind of dimensions. So actually for the different dimensions of data, we use the same data for. 
And for images, video, 3D, we use the same form to train. We didn't train separate models. We're using one single model. So it's kind of connected by the language. Yeah, like the same thing. It has the videos, have the 3D, but they have the same language descriptions. But that's the text connecting these two. Yeah. We have also actually tried to leverage some existing models like the image bind by Meta AI, right? So I have also leveraged that, but we find that maybe using this holistic model is, is better. Yeah. All right, thank you. This yeah. is the last question. All right, thank you. Sorry. Thanks again. Thank you. And finally, we have uh, Ranjai. Yeah, I think it worked. Close that, that thing over there. Oh, this? Yeah, just close it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is the last talk. Hopefully, you guys are still awake. Uh, thank you for thank you for being here. My name is Ranjay Krishna. I'm a professor at the University of Washington. And I'm here to tell you about all the things that are not working after all the talks that have told us about all the cool things that we're building and how everything is working really well. Okay, so to get started, um, let's sort of go back a little bit. So, so far, computer vision, hold on, let me make sure my slides are actually changing. Oh no, they're not changing. Um, yeah, that's okay. Uh, it looks like I have to physically click. Hmm. Okay, so, so far, computer vision has gone really good at detecting objects. This is something we know very well. And, you know, a lot of this has been driven by our understanding of uh, the ImageNet data set. But, of course, as you know, our world is more than just a collection of objects. There's a whole host of things that are going on. And most of the situations that we encounter are completely new. Uh, we often repurpose items for new use cases. We find ourselves in predicaments we've never seen before. Uh, we see people doing things that we've never seen. Uh, even animals sort of uh, surprise us with, with their fashion sense and with uh, their sort of unexpected agency. So these new situations that we have in the world are very commonplace and we can interpret and reason over them very, very easily. Uh, and the reason we can do this is because we have this ability of composing what we already understand about the world into these new situations. However, despite a decade of amazing advancements in computer vision, uh, a lot of the deep learning technology that we have today is it still struggles to understand and comprehend these new situations that are so commonplace and so easy for us to understand. I mean, even uh, a lot of the large sort of parameter models that OpenAI has been releasing, uh, they also still struggle to sort of generate or even understand a lot of these new situations. So what do we need? So the reason we... Human cognition is really able to do this is because of the way we sort of represent things in the real world. We have this sort of inductive ability to develop this uh, compositional understanding of the world, and we use our past experiences to sort of understand and decompose things that we see, and then later on put those things together, enabling us to do a whole host of new tasks. 
So what we need in computer vision is something that goes beyond just objects. And there's been a lot of work over the last six or seven years in trying to move us towards going beyond just objects. So today I'm going to tell you about a, a line of work that you know we uh, have been really pushing. Uh, and that line of work is related to compositionality and compositionality specifically related to scene graphs. Now, the reason scene graphs is really exciting is because it is grounded in cognitive science. And I sort of want to take at least about five minutes today to give you a proper cognitive science grounding of why we use scene graphs for a lot of these use cases. Uh, even though there's been a lot of talks already today that use scene graphs, I think it's useful to go back and understand why that representation is actually the representation we use. Um, and then we'll talk about how this representation will allow our agents to sort of train uh, and understand these individual concepts. And then later when we sort of deploy them out in the real world, actually be able to compose those things uh, and recognize new situations that they might have never seen before, uh, just by composing these individual things that they have seen in the past. So uh, the roadmap for today's talk is going to be an introduction or a reintroduction for some of you uh, for what scene graphs really are. So we're gonna start off with this. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, so it's gonna be really quick. Uh, and then we're going to talk about how we can use scene graphs to understand things in video and how a lot of things in video understanding are completely broken. And then later on, we're going to talk about uh, foundation models and in, in relation to compositionality. And again, talk about how we can use scene graphs to understand compositionality of foundation models, again, showing that things are actually broken. And then finally, we'll talk about other use cases of scene graphs. Uh, specifically looking at evaluating image generation, which is something that we're having trouble with. We don't have good metrics to actually understand how to evaluate a one generative model versus another. We'll talk about how the same ideas behind compositionality can be used to do that as well. Okay, so let's get started. So the predominant paradigm today for training a lot of computer vision models is First of all, you pre-train some representations and then you use those latent representations for some sort of downstream task later on. And this has worked really, really well, but unfortunately, these representations still struggle quite a bit when adjusting to these new uh, applications. And the reason for that is because a lot of our vision models are really, really data hungry. And what a lot of my work has been showing over the last couple of years is that if you have the right representation, specifically with the scene graph representation being one example of that representation, you can generalize to novel compositions much more easier. And this allows you to sort of train models with very few training examples, which is exciting because it means that if you pre-train with the right representation, you can enable a whole host of downstream applications much, much quicker. Okay, so that sort of gives us uh, 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 an entry into the very first part of the talk, which is what is that right representation and specifically why scene graph is the right representation for this. So to contextualize this, let's talk about object representations first. So let's say that you only have object detectors and you only use objects to understand images. Well, when you look at these two images and you take away the pixels and only look at the objects, this is what it looks like. But as you know, there is a lot more going on in that image aside from just there being two people in that image. In one case, you've got somebody yelling at somebody and uh, someone's angry. And in the other case, there's somebody actually listening and paying attention to the other person. So it's often more than just the objects that sort of contextualize and bring meaning to what's actually being expressed within that image. And if you just use object representations for a lot of your tasks, if you just use models pre-trained on ImageNet, you are missing out on a whole host of things. So we need better representations if you want to enable any kind of thing related with computer vision. So um, to build that kind of representation, we sort of looked back and we looked really far back into the 80s to try to understand how people have been representing uh, images from a cognitive science grounding. And one person who's really driven a lot of my own research and inspired a lot of my work is Irving Biederman. And Biederman spent a majority of the 1980s really trying to understand how people understand and represent um, uh, visual stimuli. And one thing that he used to study this is this idea behind um, violation of uh, expectations. And he found that when you show images to people that violate some sort of expectation, like in the first image, you see that the person is transparent, it takes people longer to process what's in the image. Meaning that there's some sort of property about the object that actually is vital for us to understand what that object even is. And in the second case, you see a fire hydrant on top of a, uh, a, a, a sort of US mailbox that also slows down our ability to process that image. 
And this again shows that there's a violation of relationships because a fire hydrant should not be on top of this mailbox. And these sort of violations, either in the space of attributes or in the space of relationships, is really what prevents people from actually processing things fast enough. Meaning that there's some sort of interplay happening between not just the objects being recognized individually, but as a scene, we are holistically representing things that are going on, understanding their attributes as well as their relationships. Now, Biederman wasn't the only person who sort of studied these kinds of things. Jeremy Wolf studied this in the context of vision sciences, um, and he did experiments where he tried to understand how people remembered images that they were shown. And he found over and over again that the kind of mistakes that people often made were mistakes that occurred when they mistook relationships. Uh, it's the relationships between those objects that prevented people from actually remembering or misremembering different kinds of things. Uh, and so given this sort of cognitive grounding is what finally led us to develop the scene graph representation. Uh, this is work done in 2017. So unfortunately, it's already been six years since then. Um, the scene graph representation, of course, encodes the objects because objects are vital to understanding what's in an image. But aside from just those individual objects, um, that we also encode those attributes associated with each of those individual objects, and then also the pairwise relationships between them. Now, of course, we limit ourselves to pairwise relationships, but relationships don't necessarily have to be pairwise. The, the scene graph representation is, of course, a naive representation of uh, everything that we sort of encode, but it is more than just objects. And with this representation in place, we, uh, at that point in 2017, developed the visual genome data set, uh, which was uh, the first large scale data set for uh, scene graphs, uh, allowing us to sort of capture what everything that's in an image in a very, very dense fashion. So as soon as we sort of put out that data set, the first task that we sort of formalized was this task of scene graph detection. And that task, it takes in an image as input and then produces this scene graph representation as an output where the objects have uh, localized in bounding boxes and you've got individual attributes and relationships between them that are being predicted by the models. And the very first model that we sort of proposed was one that was also inspired by Biederman. It's this model that decomposes objects and relationships and you predict them individually. So you have a separate branch that predicts objects and a separate branch that predicts uh, relationships. And then we showed that you can sort of put those things together and are able to now produce these sort of graphical representations uh, by sort of mixing and matching these different objects and relationships. Um, and then this was pretty exciting at that time back in uh, 2016, 2017, because it allowed us to take examples of people riding horses and people wearing hats and uh, allowed us to sort of make predictions when we see a horse wearing a hat. Uh, and then similarly, we were able to take pictures of uh, people sitting on uh, chairs and also fire hydrants on, on the field. And now we can sort of predict when a person is sitting on a fire hydrant. So these sort of novel situations that we begin to encounter are, that are very commonplace, we can now detect them because we can identify those individual concepts and sort of structure and put those things together. And back then this was pretty exciting because we were able to sort of push up our ability to densely understand what's in an image, but we were also sort of sad because this very, very naive model didn't work very well. Uh, oftentimes it made predictions that were very contradictory. For example, in this image, um, it thinks that both the people are throwing the Frisbee but we know from common sense that two people can't be throwing the Frisbee at the same time. Uh, and so this was one of those common sort of problems that we encountered because every single relationship was being predicted individually and dependent of every other relationship, it was very difficult for these models to make predictions that were holistically coherent. So to improve upon this, we took this original decomposition that we had and we did a bunch of things. We added in some LSTMs, we added in some graph neural networks, and we published a few papers that sort of tried to sort of create this sort of holistic understanding of how to combine these individual things together. And those typically work um, um, you know, at a very, very high level through these updates. Uh, we updated the object representations by looking at the uh, relationships, and then we updated the relationship representations by looking at the objects. And then if you do this enough times iteratively, you can sort of uh, build graphs that are more coherent. And now your model can predict that there's only one person throwing the Frisbee and the other person is not doing it. So again, a little excitement because uh, we have seen improvements because of these sort of uh, things that we put on top of our model. And aside from this, uh, the community really built on top of scene graph representations over the last six years. And today um, there are message passing methods, there are attention-based methods with transformers, there are tons of autoencoder methods uh, and um, you know, encoding uh, external knowledge, all kinds of things to make scene graph models work really, really well. 
Okay, so there's a ton of work actually happening across the board in trying to make these models work and better. So that's really exciting. And what's even more exciting is that the one thing that stayed constant across all of these hundreds of papers that have come out is the original decomposition. That decomposition that was inspired by Biederman, where we sort of decompose this prediction into both objects and relationships individually. That's the one thing that has stayed common. The things that people are really improving on is how do you put these things together in a smart way? Okay, so that is our primer for where things are with scene graphs and how we can so, sort of go about using them for doing better sort of analysis of what's in an image. So now that we have that in place, let's talk about how we can sort of extend these ideas into video. Okay, so that's going to be the second part of today's talk. So how do we sort of go about understanding video uh, from and, and sort of applying these graphical representations to bring in those benefits that I sort of talked about? So the first sort of task that we looked at was this task of action recognition. Now, action recognition in videos tries to identify the actions that people are sort of performing in a video. And it tends to be a very, very data hungry kind of application. You need a lot of data to be able to learn good representations and then sort of detect those actions later on. And again, the predominant way that people have been doing this is by either learning some sort of representation in uh, using ImageNet features or some sort of uh, self-supervised learning in video space. But if you have a right representation, in this case, maybe you can represent every single frame in your video as a scene graph. Well, this really simplifies your problem because now you can identify the action waking up in bed as a change in relationship between the person and the bed, where originally the person was lying on the bed, but now is sitting on the bed. It really simplifies the entire task because you've sort of decomposed the problem completely. In fact, I haven't seen work really do this yet, but uh, as one of the previous questions asked, if you have this graphical representation, you can just feed this entire thing into an LLM today and it'll tell you what the action is. So it's really exciting that you can sort of have the right representations, feed those into things uh, that we're building uh, that can reason, and now your reasoning models are just very good at doing a lot of computer vision tasks. So um, we can show that with very few examples, as few as five examples, you can train these downstream models to recognize different kinds of actions. And the reason, again, that you can do this is because you've got this really neat representation in the middle that can identify and define a lot of the actions that you might be performing in those videos. Now, another application that we looked at was this application of video question answering. And this is work uh, from about two years ago, uh, where we were trying to figure out how well are the models that we're building actually able to understand and answer questions about the videos that we're looking at? And of course, this is an important task because we have a lot of video uh, data online and there are tons of applications where you might wanna be able to test whether models actually understand what's in those videos and question answering lends itself as a very general purpose mechanism through which you can probe and understand video understanding models. So we were pretty, uh, interested in identifying whether the improvements that people kept reporting over and over again were actually real improvements. Uh, and in data sets um, that people had produced until that point, TGIF, MS, uh, MSRV, VT, all of those data sets kept showing improvements year after year, uh, showing that the, even saying that the models are sort of saturating on these data sets. So we wanted to see why those models were improving and what exactly about those models were getting was getting better. Was it because we were able to understand objects? Was it because we were able to understand relationships? Was it the attributes? Was it this compositional reasoning of all of these individual things? We wanted to sort of probe and figure out how to test for it. And the nice thing is scene graphs lend themselves really nicely to be able to do these kinds of probing evaluations. To do that, we introduced this benchmark called AGQA, which is uh, uh, this, this question answering benchmark that was built on top of Action Genome, which is a data set of spatiotemporal scene graphs that we released. Uh, and that data set contains somewhere around 192 million pairs of question answering uh, data. And all of those questions were generated uh, from scene graphs. So the data set, original data set that, that we uh, created had uh, videos with some sort of scene graphs associated and annotated with them. And what we were trying to do is take that data and generate a large scale question answering probing data set to actually help us identify what it is about these models that were that was improving. Was it the objects, the relationships, the actions or compositional understanding? So the way we went about doing this is we took the data set, we had a video, we had some original data uh, scene graphs from it. We augmented it so that every single frame now had a scene graph associated uh, with it. And the way we did that was traditional tracking based algorithms 
where we took the annotated frames and we took the objects that were annotated and propagated those labels across the board. Next, we so we yeah, yeah, so we have these things. We took those actions, we decomposed them into objects, and then we also had the relationships on top of it. So we sort of understood how those relationships were changing over time. And then we sort of propagated that across every single label. Once we had that, we built a bunch of custom question templates. And the question templates sort of look like this. This is an example of the kind of question templates that we had. Uh, in this case, the question is asking, did they relation object time action? And I'll give you an example of what that looks like when you actually fill it in. But of course, these templates by themselves are not very useful. So for every single template, we had an entire program that we could roll out that would fill in those questions from a given scene graph. And we defined a bunch of functions that were compositional functions that allowed us to operate uh, on top of the uh, spatiotemporal scene graphs that we had and generate these questions. So an example uh, of, of questions that we could generate is something like this. The question now is, did they watch a phone before lying down? Again, this is the same sort of template that we had. We replaced the relationship with watching. We replaced the object with a phone. We replaced the temporal component with the word before. And then we replaced the, the action with lying down. Okay, so we can compose a whole host of different questions using this format. And again, the only thing that we're really doing is we're just executing that entire program that we handcrafted. And we handcrafted somewhere around 28 different kinds of templates with individual programs associated with them. And you can compose these programs together to create infinitely larger and larger and more complicated questions. Okay, and then of course, because you know exactly what the graph is, you know what the program is, you can execute it and you also have the answer associated with it. Okay, so we can create a whole host of questions and we can now start probing a lot of the models with those questions. But of course, in order to probe them, we wanted to make sure that we got rid of any sort of balance issues in our data set. And so the last step of this entire process is balancing this benchmark to make sure that we don't have any biases where all the answers are always yes, or all the answers are always two. So um, we, we had a balancing step that was just an adversarial refinement kind of work, um, which I'm not going to go over. Uh, but at the end of the day, you ended up with a data set that was uh, about 86% uh, accurate when evaluated with MTurk workers. Um, and most of the errors that came in were errors that were existing in the, the scene graphs that we collected, and some that were just sort of mismatches in ontology based on how people thought objects should look like versus how the videos actually, uh, how the videos actually represented those objects. So now that we had a probing data set, how well do models actually do? What did they actually improve on over those years? Was it the objects? Was it the relationships? Was it the attributes? What was it? Well, turns out it was none of them. Turns out it was just data set bias all along. All of those improvements that we're seeing across all of these video question answering models, they're not real. Uh, if you take the best performing model and you train it on this data set that's balanced, it performs about 47% accurate. And whereas human accuracy, again, on this data set is somewhere around 86%. What's perhaps even worse is if you take uh, that same model and you just delete the input video, it performs about the same. So that's really, really sad, right? So it means that we're not even looking at the videos. We're just looking at the questions and we're just sort of, uh, we're just sort of dealing with the biases in these questions and then just answering them. Okay, so that's not great. That's not great because it looks like we've been doing NLP and thinking we've been doing computer vision. It's not a good sign. Okay, so why are quite, uh, these models getting better over time? We divided all of these things up into different kinds of probes. We looked at superlative types of questions, uh, like what did they uh, pick up first? Was it the dish or the pic uh, picture? We looked at duration types of questions, like... Um, which activity was longer, we looked at action recognition. So we really sort of probed in and looked at individual kinds of capabilities that these models could be improving on, hoping that maybe something was improving. No, nothing was improving. All of them were across the board, just about random chance. So not great, not great for computer vision, but good for researchers because we have a lot of work to do. Okay, so um, the other thing that we were able to test for is because we had this nice sort of decomposition of all the types of questions that we might ask, we could sort of test for novel compositions again, just like we've been building with scene graphs before. So uh, we can sort of see if people, if these models can generalize to compositions that include uh, a temporal component of before and action standing up, uh, if they've seen um, before and standing up in different contexts during training time. 
So we were able to do these kinds of uh, applications. And again, things are really, really sort of grim overall. Uh, the best models perform only about 23% accurate on these open answer questions. And for binary questions where the random chance is about 50%, these models, the best models perform only about 52%. So we have a 2% gain that we've gotten over the last, I don't know how many years. Okay, and then what's even worse perhaps is that if you increase the compositionality of the, the questions, so if you make them more and more complex, things perform even worse. What looked like a 60% accuracy is more like a 40% accuracy as the compositions improve. So of course, things are pretty bad uh, from the get-go, but as you increase the compositionality of these uh, questions that you're asking, making them harder, these models perform even worse. So a lot of room for improvement, uh, but um, you know, it, it doesn't seem like we've made a lot of progress in actually understanding videos yet. One of the things that we wanted to see was, even though these models are performing so poorly, are they at least internally consistent? So are they at least consistent when they're wrong? And so to do that, last year we uh, uh, published this paper at CVPR here, where we took all of those individual compositional questions that we had, and we divided them up into sub-questions. And the idea is really simple. At the top, you have a question that's asking, is a person contacting a dish before smiling at something? Well, to be able to answer yes or no, or to be able to answer yes to this question, you, there should be a person in the image. If you're asking the model, is there a person and is the person smiling? If it says the person is smiling, but then says the, there is no person, it's inconsistent. And so we're able to check for inconsistencies in the model be, model's behavior. And turns out that all these models are also deeply inconsistent as well. So when you take this uh, decomposition of all of these individual questions, and test if the sub questions are at least consistent with its super question, they're not consistent. So again, these are black boxes. This is stuff that Alan talked about earlier at the workshop as well. We don't understand what's happening in a lot of these models, but we are building probing tools at least uh, to um, allow us to identify these kinds of errors and things are looking great. Okay, so those were sort of looking at uh, all of these models that people have been creating up until foundation models. And so let's now switch gears for a little bit and talk about foundation models, because, you know, at least things should be working now, at least now that we have these gigantic sort of efforts from all these big companies. Um, there are so many of these foundation models all across the board. Hopefully now with these models, with this gigantic amount of compute, with this huge amount of data set that we're collecting from the web, at least now maybe our models are getting better. And to answer that question, I want to sort of mainly talk about uh, a paper we have here at CBPR to, uh, this time, and it's a highlight paper. Um, in this paper, we're trying to identify an, uh, 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 whether uh, the vision language models that people are training, specifically the contrastive version of vision language models that people are training, all the clip variants that you see coming out almost every other week, are those models compositional? Are we at least getting better at recognizing all of these individual things uh, in our images. So videos are too hard, but at least for these image models, are we getting better at those? And the way these models are usually evaluated is through retrieval. And the way retrieval works is you're given a query image and you're asked to retrieve the correct caption for that uh, query image. So in this case, you should be able to identify or the model should be able to identify that this caption that's correct is a yellow vase on top of a black television. And again, all of the benchmarks that are out there would tell you that yes, models are actually really good at this because these models are getting really, really high performances on MS Coco, on Flickr, getting really good scores on ImageNet. But is it actually understanding the individual components of these captions? Specifically, what we wanted to know is, does it understand when it picks this, that there is a vase, that there is a television in this image? Does it understand that the vase is yellow and that the television is black? Does it understand the relationship on top of as a relationship between the vase and the television? And again, all of this sort of compositional understanding, we can sort of do using the same scene graph representation that we've been using for all these other use cases. The problem with a lot of these benchmarks, unfortunately, even though again, we're seeing a lot of these improvements is that all of the negatives, they're really, really easy. And they're easy uh, because they're not meant for this task. They're not meant to evaluate and diagnose whether models are actually understanding vision and language. So you're trying to pick out the right caption, yellow vase on top of a television against another caption that talks about a panda sitting in a tree. It really should be able to do this because it's really easy to identify that there's no panda in this image. 
That doesn't mean that the model is actually compositional, that it actually understands all the individual parts in this image. Now, to be able to answer these kinds of questions, there have been a couple of benchmarks that people have released. Um, so window ground being one of the big ones that people have really heard of. Um, there's a bunch of these that are out there now, but a lot of them are really, really small. And what we wanted to do in our paper, in the crate paper that I want to highlight right now, is try to really figure out if by stress testing all of these different clip models, whether they're actually compositional or not. And uh, this is led by my amazing uh, PhD student, incoming PhD student, Jishan, who I think is maybe here. I can't tell. But, uh, oh, right there. Yeah. Hey. Um, and uh, a whole host of other students from multiple universities. Uh, so it's very exciting. Uh, I, I think it's their first CPPR paper as well. So very, very exciting. Um, okay. So what Crepe does is it tries to measure compositionality along two separate angles. The first angle is systematicity. And the second one is productivity. So let's talk about both of these in uh, a very brief recount. So the first one, it really measures our ability to understand these novel compositions. So if we've seen um, if we've seen captions that contain vase and other things that contain the color pink, we should be able to put these things together and a model should be able to identify a pink vase. That's the general idea behind the first uh, dimension. And then the second dimension is trying to understand whether models understand things as you increase the compositionality of the captions that you're trying to retrieve. So uh, here, complexity or, uh, is how we define productivity, where complexity defines the number of individual atoms that are in your caption, where atoms, again, are defined by the number of scene graph elements in, uh, in the caption. So as you can see, for 10, there's a lot of different things going on. So it's a much harder sort of caption to understand versus the first one is a lot easier to recognize. And generally, um, to be able to do this kind of task, you need hard negatives. You need negatives that actually stress test whether your models understand uh, compositionally all the different components in your image. And again, the, the sort of negatives that are out there today, they're just not going to cut it. So we needed to generate a data set that actually contained hard negatives for us to be able to stress test whether these models understand what's happening or not. And this is what those hard negatives look like. So uh, the, the ground truth is a yellow vase on top of a television. And one of the hard negatives is you swap the color of the one of the objects. So you swap the yellow to a red, and now it shouldn't be able to pick that. It shouldn't pick that because that vase is not yellow. Similarly, you can swap out the television for a table. You, uh, you can do other kinds of transformations as well. You can swap out the relationship. Basically, different kinds of swaps or negations or deletions or additions allow you to create hard compositional negatives. And we defined a host of these different kinds of compositional swaps uh, that you can do to automatically generate these kinds of hard negatives. And again, the way we sort of go about doing it is we take the visual genome data set, uh, we take these individual scene graphs, we take the objects, the attributes, and the relationships, and we put them together in, uh, in, in many different ways using a bunch of rule-based templates to generate these hard negatives. And we generated both our systematicity as well as our productivity uh, data sets using this mechanism. So this is what the systematicity data set looks like. It's got a set of unseen compounds, so things, compositions that it's never seen. It's got seen compounds, which is a, a group of uh, data where it's seen everything. And then it's got unseen atoms where it contains objects or attributes that it's never seen before. And of course, in the unseen atoms, it should perform the worst. But at the very least, it should perform well on the see unseen compounds because it has seen them individually. So it should be able to compose them together. That's the hope of systematicity. And then the productivity data set, we have multiple different complexity levels ranging from four to, I think, 10 or 12, um, where we sort of compose these captions uh, with more and more complex compositions. And overall, we ended up releasing about uh, four different benchmarks, uh, one for um, uh, three for systematicity and one for productivity. And these are really large benchmarks, right? So we've got hundreds of thousands of image text pairs in each one, and they're designed specifically for models that are trained on conceptual captions, on models that are trained on YFCC, or models that are even trained on Lion 400 million. So for all of these different models, we should now be able to test whether they actually have understood uh, some amount of compositionality or not. 
And of course, you know, we didn't just automatically generate this data set. We made sure that it was accurate. We did human evaluations to make sure that humans can answer these questions and pick out the correct captions accurately. And humans perform on average somewhere around 87, 88% uh on on this data set so pretty high uh for humans and now that we have this entire thing we can evaluate all of these big sort of vision language foundation models we can evaluate all of our favorite clip models we can evaluate cyclip flava alpha Al Al um and, and a whole host of other ones as well and we can evaluate them across different architectures of resnets versus transformers different sizes of them uh, we can even evaluate uh, the ones that are trained on uh, CC 12 million, YFCC, and Lion, allowing us to understand, you know, even if the smaller models aren't doing well, are the larger ones doing well? And also allowing us to answer if the data set it's trained on is small, but it increases to Lion size, are things getting better? So it allows us to answer all of these kinds of questions now. So uh, the, 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 the metric that we're going to use to evaluate all of this is just retrieval at one. So we're just deciding whether the model is able to pick out the correct caption out of all the hard negatives that are out there. And um, unfortunately, you know, I'm the bearer of bad news today. So the main two key takeaways are that none of them exhibit compositionality, or if they do, it's very little. Um, and unfortunately, it doesn't seem like increasing training data set size or model size changes things. And that's a bad sign. Right? So everyone's really pushing for larger and larger models, larger and larger data sets. It doesn't seem like those two might be the answers to making these models more compositional. Okay, so let's show you some results. So this is what the systematicity uh, result looks like. We've got seen compounds on the x-axis, the performance. Uh, again, these are recall at one numbers. And on the y-axis, we've got the unseen compounds. If your models were compositional, uh, as your models perform better on scene, they should perform equally well on unseen. And so models should ideally be going up in that sort of uh, straight dotted line, uh, the grayed out line over there. And humans are at the top right corner right there. Uh, but unfortunately, it seems like that's not the case. Uh, in fact, it's, um, uh, it's, 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 it's pretty far off. We measured uh, correlation and the correlations are pretty weak. Um, it doesn't seem like the models are getting better on these unseen compositions. So as they get better on uh, larger and larger data sets, they get better on the seen composition. So the things that they've seen, they can recognize those really well. But any sort of compositions that they haven't seen, it doesn't seem like they're doing well on those equally as much. And this is more pronounced for the Lion data sets, uh, where it seems like with larger and larger training data and larger and larger model sizes, they perform much, much better on the seen compositions things that they've seen before, but not on the unseen, and there's a larger drop in performance. And things are even worse for productivity. You know, the moment you increase complexity, uh, the dotted line here represents random chance. It's at random chance, right? So all of these models, your clip models, your alpha, uh, flava, all of them, uh, regardless of what they're trained on, CC 12 million, YFCC 15 million, lie on 400 million, they're all around random chance. Uh, and this is true for uh, OpenAI Clip as well. The one thing to mention though, the OpenAI Clip does seem to do really well on one type of swaps, which is the negation swaps. Uh, that's the one sort of uh, instance where we saw compositional behavior actually emerging, but for every other kind of swap, we didn't see anything. They're almost near random chance. And then again, like I said, um, as you increase data set size here, we were uh, plotting uh, in different colors, the models trained on CC versus YFCC or Lion. Uh, and it, it doesn't seem like uh, things are improving as much. Uh, and then again, uh, the same thing here happens when you measure productivity as well. Things are near random chance overall. Okay, and um, model size, as you change them and you make them larger, things aren't improving. So anyway, we have uh, a poster here and you guys should come chat with us. Uh, this is going to be, I don't know what day it is, Wednesday, Wednesday morning. So we're gonna have a poster Wednesday morning. Come chat with us today after this talk, come chat with us at the poster session. Uh, there's a whole host of questions that we wanna be able to answer. Uh, and we could use your help and collaboration to be able to answer these questions. There's a lot of work to be done and it's exciting. 
Um, but at the same time, things aren't looking as uh, positively as we thought it would. Uh, now, of course, you might be asking image to text uh, retrieval is just one type of retrieval. Uh, what about the other type of retrieval? Well, to answer that question, we also have a new data set called COLA that's on archive as of a month ago, where um, we use the same sort of mechanism, but we sort of reverse the task itself. We're now given an input query caption. We actually retrieve the appropriate correct image. Uh, and the way these sort of things are designed, again, is very similar, where all the individual parts, all, all the atoms are the same in your hard negatives, but they're swapped. They're swapped so that if your model doesn't understand compositional compositionality, it will not be able to pick those out accurately. And again, the whole thing is designed uh, and built using visual genome. Uh, but we did uh, something else with this paper. We also tried to understand mechanisms through which we could make these models more compositional because we already knew things were not uh, looking so good. Um, and so we tried a bunch of different strategies to actually make models compositional. One of the things we tried is the most basic thing, which is prompt tuning, which is very much in vogue today. Uh, that doesn't turn out to work very well. We also tried fine tuning the representations on this specific data set. That also doesn't turn out to do very well. Uh, here are some results of things. Uh, so if you try to retrieve um, um, large black umbrellas, it doesn't really do it. It doesn't really understand round white Frisbees either. It understands that there's Frisbees and there's like, um, uh, round things, but it doesn't put them together always. Uh, but the one thing that we tried that did seem to work was this adaption mechanism where you actually fine tune an entire encoder decoder on top of the representations coming out of both clips, image, and language encoder. And when you do that, it turns out that you do get some amount of alignment that does happen. Um, so here we're just taking the representations coming out of the individual image patches. We're taking the individual objects coming out of uh, the text uh, query, and we're sort of learning a encoder decoder that is completely tra uh, transformer based, and that seems to do relatively well. We do see some improvements there, and so there is hope that there are compositional representations maybe within uh, these models, but they're somehow just not being uh, represented within. The, the sort of representations that are coming out of clip that you need to do something else on top to disentangle them. So, uh, you know, hope is not lost. There is some sort of um, some sort of uh, progress that you could make. And when you do that sort of uh, adaptation, we're using these transformers, these models now begin understanding things like black umbrellas and white frisbees. And there's a whole host of other kinds of results in the paper across multiple sort of data sets that I won't go into today, but you can check that out. It's on archive. But I want to talk to you about one last thing that we did uh, in this space, and that is looking at, um, that hasn't come out yet, it will in a week, uh, so exciting stuff. Um, since we put out Crave and Cola, there's been a whole host of other benchmarks that have come out that are, have similar kind of flavor. Of course, we had Winter Ground before, but ARO and VL Checklist also came out around the same time. And um, so it's, it seems like the community is recognizing that there is a need for these kinds of benchmarks uh, that allow us to probe and test for compositionality in these large models. And we wanted to see if things are different across these different uh, benchmarks. But in the process of trying to understand what's different amongst these different benchmarks, we came across a pretty difficult uh, thing to swallow. We found that all of these benchmarks actually have a bias that renders them all kind of useless. Uh, and that is the existence of a bunch of nonsensical bias and non-fluency in the hard negatives that are produced. So for example, in the process of producing hard negatives, all of these benchmarks produce hard negatives, uh, they end up producing things that are just nonsensical. For example, they have uh, captions like a hair wearing a necklace. I don't know what that means. Uh, or non-fluent things like a shelf with books in something. That doesn't really mean anything. So it, it, it's easy for models that are good at language to actually figure out these sort of bugs and do well on top of them. And we use two separate models that have just come out a month ago. One of them is this Vera model that understands common sense in language. And if you measure Vera score against the positive and the negative uh, hard negatives, we find that there is a big distributional shift between the two and that there's a big positive uh, score difference for these Vera models, meaning that these language only models are really good at picking out the correct caption, even if our vision language models are not. And what's sort of sad is that again, 
these blind models, if you just take away the images from these benchmarks, they tend to outperform all the vision language models. So uh, that's what this paper is going to show in a week from now. Uh, it shows that all these blind models using just large language models and common sense and grammar can actually end up beating all of the vision language models that we have so far. So all the orange bars that you see, those are models that are blind. All the blue bars are the ones that are not, and the blue bars are lower. Okay, so we have a solution. Don't worry. We have a new paper uh, called Sugar Crate, and Sugar Crate is fixing this issue. It uses GPT to make sure that all the hard negatives are actually uh, fluent and they're actually things that make sense, that common sense is there. Uh, sugar crepe, uh, it stands for synthetic yet unbiased generation and adversarially refined crepe. So we build on top of crepe and we make sure that we add some sugar on top of it. Uh, and if you look at the distributional differences between the positive and negatives now, uh, it's zero, meaning that there isn't really a bias in the language. Uh, meaning that the improvements that you now see, if reported well, um, would actually be real improvements on these images, uh, on these benchmarks, and not sort of uh, models that are just hacking away at uh, biases that exist. Um, we took a bunch of model uh, methods um, that people have proposed that are data-centric methods that try to build more compositional models, and we evaluated it on sugar crepe, and all the improvements disappear. Uh, so there are methods out there today that use and generate hard negatives during the training process. It turns out that while they improve things on existing benchmarks that were hackable, they do not work once you get rid of those hacks. So again, we're back to square one. We don't actually have models that are compositional. And um, there's a whole amount of other comprehensive things that we're going to talk about, but I won't go over them today. But I do want to leave you with something hopeful because I don't want to sort of just give you bad news today, right? So just, uh, we don't have models that are compositional, but maybe we can use this compositionality stuff for something fun. And this is the last thing I'll talk about. I'm almost out of time, uh, but I'll only take about two more minutes. And that's using these sort of compositions that we have been developing so far for something else, something a little bit more hopeful. And that's actually fixing or potentially providing a solution for evaluating generative models. So today we have a lot of generative models, uh, especially things like stable diffusion and DALI. And we've had a hard time evaluating them. We've had a hard time evaluating them because they generate images and it's really hard to know if one image is in fact better than another image. So here are some examples of images that Stable Diffusion generates for the text, a photo of three dogs. There are not three dogs usually. Sometimes there's even a child in there. Okay, so that's not good. And we don't have any methods to actually evaluate that that's bad. Uh, here's some other ones. Uh, it's uh, The text input here is refrigerator with multiple breakfast objects on top of it. Um, and well, stable diffusion just likes to put things into the fridge, but doesn't actually have things on top of it, right? But it'd be nice if we actually evaluated them accurately. So let me tell you how we're currently evaluating them in computer vision. We're evaluating them with clip scores. And as you saw from my previous version, uh, previous part of this talk, clip is not compositional. So if we're using CLIP to evaluate these generative models and people are putting out new and new generative AI models and we're evaluating with them with this, are they actually getting better? We don't know, right? So we need something better. We need something better uh, to actually evaluate them. Now, people have also proposed using captions where you take the generated image, you uh, turn it into a caption and you evaluate using traditional methods in an LP like blue scores or CIDR or Meteor, but those again, don't do very well. But we have a solution, and this is the hopeful thing that I wanted to leave you with. We have this uh, method called TIFA. Uh, and what TIFA does is it takes text inputs, uh, it sends it to a generative model that generates an image, but then it takes that text input, sends it to GPT, uh, which generates a bunch of questions that you should be able to answer from that text input. And then we use another GPT to actually answer those questions, okay? And what we do next is we take the generated image, we take those generated questions and we answer them with a VQA model. And then we just compare and make sure things are consistent, All right? So now we have a mechanism through which we can take text inputs and make sure that the generated image is actually faithful to the question, uh, to the input text that's being uh, asked to generate. So TIFA is, uh, it's got a lot of qualities that I like, it's automatic. Uh, it's fine-grained because it's got a bunch of individual questions that it's going to ask about every single text input. 
It's interpretable because you can read the questions and understand where the generation went wrong. It's more accurate than these non-compositional metrics that we have. Uh, it's also completely customizable. You can choose what kinds of questions you want to keep around. And also it's completely modularized and you can swap out GPT for new GPTs. You can swap out VQAs for new VQAs and you'll just have a better and better TIFA metric over time. We have a TIFA V1 that's out there today and it has a whole host of different kinds of questions it asks of generative models. It asks about objects, about counting, about attributes and relationships and all the good stuff we care about in the compositional world and evaluates all these methods. And what's really great is that it aligns very well with human judgment of what is better. Uh, it, it doubles, in fact, the Spearman correlation with human judgment compared to CLIP score. And here are some results. Things are moving in the right direction. As you see, after the Dali moment, things have really sort of risen up. Um, you have uh, the best model, according to our metrics so far, is uh, stable diffusion 2.1. This, of course, was uh, evaluated by a month and a half ago. So maybe things have changed since then, uh, but this is uh, what it looks like. And we can also identify things that stable diffusion is not good at. It turns out it's not good at shapes. It's not good at counting. It's not good at spatial relationships. And again, this is not surprising because it's also using clip to train. And if clip isn't compositional, then of course stable diffusion isn't compositional either. But now we have concrete metrics that allow us to measure that and tell you that it's not good at that stuff. Um, and then that's sort of the end of my talk today. Uh, some bad news and hopefully some good and lots of work to do. Thank you. Yeah, question. Yeah, well, go ahead. That better than clip for evaluating compositionality of some generative imagery. Um, then you would probably just take that model and use it to make the next generative model. Then what would you have to evaluate it on that? It would depend particular model at that point. Uh, perhaps, perhaps. Yeah, you you could sort of well, we're not using clip to evaluate with TIFA at all. We're just using a large language model. Uh, but yes, the VQA model, of course, is maybe limited by uh, the, the image encoder that you're using. So that is a big problem. Yeah, um, it's still going to be a problem, but hopefully we'll be able to identify some things. It seems like we are being able to identify problems with it still. Um, but you're right. It is a circular issue that might get worse. And, and many VQA models are based on clip too. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Do you think there's any sort of middle ground between like a fixed dimensional vector representation of something like a scene graph where you know it's still small enough to where we can we can use sampling techniques, but you know maybe issues that we just can't take all that computation out of the system. Yeah. Uh so Ankit's actually working on something along those lines. Uh, we are sort of exploring discretized representations that can be trained end to end and trying to make them more compositional using ideas again from cognitive science. Um, but again, it's work in progress, and we'll let you know when we have results. Yeah. So I'm curious, um, as we uh, scale up the data to train our language models, uh, the language models seem to have some conditionality because now everyone loves to be the board. But yeah. why can the VM language models have, uh, have such conditionality as we scale the base? What's the difference between those two companies? That's a good question, um, and I don't honestly know. Uh, it, it feels like, um, well, the first question is, are these language models actually compositional? It seems like at least so far they're doing really well, but it's hard to tell because they might've just seen all of that data in the internet and we just haven't evaluated them on the unseen parts yet. So it's hard to say just because we don't have access to the, the training data that it was trained with. So while it might appear like it's compositional, it might not be. Um, but again, it seems like, again, to your point, um, if you if your training data is large enough and you see the entire world, perhaps that's all you need and you can get away with most applications. But regardless, I think you're always going to encounter situations where things will fail. And we have seen cases online, at least, that these LLMs do fail when you do probe enough. So it does seem like there are cases that do exist where they don't generalize well. So my hunch is that we're, we're just, the scene set is too large and it's hard to identify the unseen sets and our language models are actually not compositional. So you talked a lot about how to evaluate these models based on uh, like compositional uh, question generation. 
I and I think that the, the generation process is pretty accurate and you can get 86% accuracy. So why not just run this across in this data set, get uh, all these answers and then train the model? It's gonna be 86% accurate. Good, good question. Yeah, um, if you do it, you should publish a paper on it and let me know how it goes. Yeah, it's a, it's a possible direction, yeah. I have a question, okay. Yeah. So thank you for the nice talk. Uh, going in a similar direction, um, how did, you, how did you define in your paper this seen and unseen mm. composition because this model was trying to rely on uh, Julian and yeah, yeah. Yeah. We parsed, uh, or I guess Jishan parsed Lion. All of Lion. And we calculated uh, all the scene objects, attributes, and relationships in them. And then we did the same thing with conceptual captions. We did the same thing with YFCC. And then we were able to identify the scene and unseen cases. So the one model that we can do this for is, of course, all the open AI models where we don't have the training data available. So again, we don't know where those results are, uh, exactly where they fall. But the, for the other ones, we at least do. Yeah, hey. I Noisiness of the data that you create from the web. I think that it's a lot. Mm. Um, the visual language because back that visual language model does not have individual. Yeah. Because like you, you know, in that you know, there's a lot of chance that you know, your and in this case, only a small amount of that is matched in the image. Yeah. And it is strange to be aligned together. Right. But when you're passing, like in some kind of written data here. Mm -hmm. We care about all the parts in those things. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. There's a paper out uh, in January this year by Filip Radenovic uh, from Meta, where he they do some amount of filtering and then training some clip models on top of that, and they do perform a little bit better. Um, so it does seem like you're right. The noise does hurt. Um, it's not clear if it makes models compositional, but the noise does hurt models. Yeah. So, uh, so regarding the senior representation, it seems that uh, when you and then you're limited to the kind of vocabulary that you use during that representation. Yeah. But if you have a uh, like continuous vector, then you can import all sorts of things that uh, you might not be able to use yeah. during the screen cut. So, okay, again, back to the same question. Mm. How, how does one, like, is it the, is it the best representation? Yeah, you know that's that's a really good question, and it's it's uh you know it, it's one of those identity crisis kind of questions for me, because you know what is the right representation? Obviously, I'm very aware that scene graphs are a very naive representation of the visual processing that we do. Uh, it's one that uh, we were hoping would push things beyond just objects, and it did. Uh, but today, of course, there's a lot more than just, just attributes and relationships. So there is a need for representations that are more sort of um, inclusive of all the possible things we might encode. And it's really hard to know exactly what that looks like. Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I don't think it's a scene graph representation. I don't think it's continuous representations. We are playing around with these discretized representations at the moment, but that might not be the right approach either. Because uh, a lot of things that we talk about it often isn't discrete. You can't necessarily sort of combine them into one sort of label. So it's unclear to me what the right representation is. Uh, the thing that's sort of bothersome is that these continuous representations are not actually, uh, they're not easily interpretable, they're not manipulatable, uh, they're not controllable, which makes them sort of less exciting for me personally. Um, but I don't know. Oh, yeah. Uh, did you also evaluate what is from symbolic reasoning on top of the feature? Oh, that's a great question. No, we haven't. But uh, yeah, come chat with me. Let's let's do it. Yeah. I was thinking that okay, there is a lot of flip flops around this user coding. So what do you tell us about building models? And hmm. did you tell us anything about building models and why you're not doing them or how do you that? I'm not sure. It, it, it feels like there's many different directions to really go in terms of how to make these models better. Uh, of course, there's we've shown that at least the current versions of the data-centric approaches where you generate hard negatives don't seem to be working. Maybe we just haven't pushed it enough. Uh, maybe we can generate or use synthetic data that we generate to train these models. That could be another direction. Maybe it's something within the representation space itself where we can sort of figure out optimizations that allow for compositionality to emerge. It's hard to tell. Uh, the thing that sort of um, 
at least makes me happy is that um, at least in cognitive science, uh, this is work from Simon Kirby, uh, people are good at building compositional signals and compositional languages. Um, and they can come up with entirely new compositional languages when put into experimental setups. Uh, so it does seem like something that is possible for to, to emerge. Um, we just don't have the right sort of mechanisms and objectives that have been put in place to make that happen yet. Uh, distillation is another direction that I think does have quite a lot of uh, possibility in improvement. And the reason I say that is because in cognitive science, one of the sort of um, pressures that seem to help is needing to teach someone else a language. That causes language to become compositional. Uh, and distillation, you can think of as a process of one model needing to teach another model uh, during the optimization process. Uh, that could be a direction through which through enough distillation steps, through enough sort of pressures to have to continuously teach other models, maybe that could be a way to formalize uh, and build pressures to make things more compositional. So that those could be, yeah, ones to explore, yeah. So yeah, to just to sort of summarize, there's data-centric approaches, there are representation approaches, there's modeling approaches. Um, uh, there's a whole host of things that you could possibly do. We don't know what's the right direction to go. Uh, and so in, in my group, we're exploring quite a few of them. Yeah. Hmm. So it that's a good question too. Uh, things are fine at two; they drop off very quickly at three. But it just might be the bias in the data sets. Most things occur in two in Coco and a bunch of these data sets that are out there. So it's hard to say if it's something to do with um, uh, the model itself or just the data sets they were trained with. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, uh, I think uh, for TIFA, for generative models, we mainly evaluated spatial relationships and those failed. Uh, it did well with semantic, but at the same time, there's only about only one semantic relationship per caption in our in our test set. So that might be why, um, but that's also a good area to explore. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop here, but th yeah, thank you. This is a, a lot of questions and I really appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. Could you make me a host again? Yeah, sure. Here. Yeah, just make me host. Uh, participants, right? Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. I'll meet you. I'll, I've already told her that you're running late, but okay. she's English. Okay. okay. All right. Excellent. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today.